Go ahead. Uh, earlier today, the president said that uh, fighting terrorism would be the main focus now of the administration. I'm curious, what does that do now in the pipeline to other priorities, education and so on? I think if you talk to the American people, you will hear from them directly and from their hearts that our nation has no higher priority than the security of our people. Make no mistake. American soil has been attacked, and I think the American people fully understand and appreciate what the President said. It is a reflection of what the American people are thinking and are feeling, and the President shares those thoughts. The severity of the problem, but is his own thinking, how does he now sort of program or sequence some of these other items on his agenda? Well, the domestic agenda will, will continue. The President will continue to work with Congress. I think that the, the pace of action uh, will be determined by the Congress, and of course the administration will be remain engaged with the Congress on all these issues. Um, in fact, there, there is a meeting that will begin shortly, if it hasn't begun already, that uh, and I will need to go to with congressional leaders and the President. So, does the President believe, as, as a general rule, that Congress ought to, you know, in the interest of unity, ought to set some of these controversial issues aside and, and do them maybe next year specifically? Keith, I think what you're going to see is Democrats and Republicans alike uniting on all kinds of areas. I, I can't guess with specificity what the domestic future will look like, but based on the meeting that the President had with the congressional leaders yesterday, I, I think it's fair to say that there is a, there is a different domestic mood. Presidential spokesman Ari Fleischer saying, in essence, that the administration is forming its response plans to Tuesday's attacks. But if you listen between the lines, not really seeing a lot specifically about what those plans might be. Not answering too many questions mm -hmm. specifically, no. This wraps up our CBS 2 News special report at noon. We hope you'll stay with us throughout the day for live updates on the attacks on America. We've sent you back now to CBS News and Dan Rather. You're watching CBS 2 News Attack on America. The last time I heard my husband was on the radio at 10 o'clock and he was looking for electricians or something and if he was getting out there would be only one reason why he went back in and that was to help other people because that's the type of person he was. Elena Gron, we wish you the best. Thank you, Thank you so, Thank you so much. much. Really Thank appreciate you. it. Dan, just two of the thousands of stories here as uh, I told you earlier there are people coming up to us saying would you please say on television that I will even offer a reward if anyone finds my loved one. A lot of frustration, a lot of devastation. We'll stay down here and bring you more as the afternoon goes on. Dan? Russ Mitchell, thanks. I want to show you some pictures now. We just got these in of some of the firemen actually being rescued this morning, live after two days in the debris. let the pictures speak for themselves. Incredible. And after that, after they got at least five firemen, possibly as many as seven, rescued alive out of the debris, some of the workers went back to work, shouting in unison, USA, USA. We go now to Thalia Shuris, who is one of the many people looking for missing relatives. Thalia? Uh, Dan, I can tell you that I'm about 30 blocks away from Russ Mitchell's location. And here, even at Fifth Avenue and 59th Street, we have met people who are looking for their loved ones. Just a few moments ago, I spoke to a woman who is looking for her husband. He worked on the 86th floor of the World Trade Center. We were able to direct her down to the family center. Beside me is Bernadette Ramos. Uh, we bumped into her as well here on Fifth Avenue in her efforts to help uh, friends and family find some of the relatives. Bernadette, thanks for staying with us uh, all afternoon. Can you uh, tell us about your efforts and, and who you're looking for? We're looking for John Cruz, that's C-R-U-Z, and he's my cousin's fiance, an employee of Cantor Fitzgerald. He was wearing his Rutgers University ring on his right hand. If you have any information, please call 914-375-3937. And you're also looking for someone else. You're an employee of IBM and you're helping a friend. Yes, uh, another colleague whose son, Michael Finnegan, 
also an employee of Cantor Fitzgerald from the Baskin Ridge area in New Jersey. The family asks to contact them with any information at 908-766-0729. And, and earlier you and I, well you and I have been talking for a, a great deal of time this afternoon, and you have told me that you have hope. Yes, we're praying for a miracle. Um, I guess as we've been standing here, we've been hearing about several recoveries yet of some of the rescue workers. And I guess we're hoping, hoping a lot and praying a lot. And it's a nice time to uh, pray, get together, and hope for a miracle. Well, Bernadette, we pray and hope along with you. Thank you very much. Thank you for, for, for your joining. time. Okay. Thanks. Dan, I also want to tell you what I can about New York City, because one of the looming questions about New York is how this city is going to recover. Its pulse has started to, to quicken. It's not back to what it was, uh, but I, I can show you a few things. The famous New York City carriage is just over my shoulder. I talked to uh, one of the drivers this morning. He said he was here with only three others. Some have come back still. He expects to get maybe four of the normal, normal ten rides that he might get. A lot of people have come back to work. The stores have opened, and I can tell you that traffic is beginning to, to quicken as well. So, Dan, that's the situation right from the heart of Manhattan. Quickening, but not quite there yet. Lots of sadness. Value assurance. Thanks. Let's go to Jim Stewart, one of our digging investigative reporters in Washington, brings up to date on the investigation of who did this terrible deed. Jim, what's the latest? All right, Dan, can you hold this one second, please? You back, Jim Stewart. I'll call you back. What you have is a reporter at work. I'm, somebody I'm has, sorry, Somebody Dan. returning a phone call. <laughs> it's a good sorry. source. Go back to that, and we'll, we'll take it back in here. Uh, well, no, sir. I had, uh, I've been forwarding phones all over our newsroom, and as you can imagine, it's difficult to get them all returned when you want them. I wish I had some progress to report to you, Dan, but uh, all I've got at the moment is activity to report. Some of it we've been seeing in our, in our other parts of our broadcast. People being picked up, apparently being put in custody uh, at Newark Airport and at other locations. I cannot tell you that these people are being charged as accomplices in the crime. Dan, here's really, I think, the, the, the headline since we last talked. And that is that the, the effort appears to be aimed at, at locating accomplices or associates of the hijacked pilots who may have received pilot training with them. You may recall all of the people who were involved in these hijackings, the pilots themselves, were trained here in the United States in two schools that we know of in Florida. The, the assumption is that okay. some people also received training with them. The shorthand of that is that there may be other terrorist pilots out there with, uh, with training who are still in the United States. That is the fear, that is what's driving part of this investigation because they know who was on the plane and they just can't find all of their friends. Dan. Jim Stewart in Washington. Joining us now at our CBS News anchor desk and world headquarters in New York is Robert Hartwig of the Insurance Information Institute and is chief economist uh, for the Insurance in Information Institute. Uh, first of all, thanks for being with us. Secondly, give me some idea of the scope of this loss in dollar terms. Well, this is the largest man-made disaster in the history of the United States by far. Uh, the previous record, believe it or not, was the L.A. riots, which cost insurance companies $775 million. This is a multi-billion dollar event that is approaching or could eventually exceed the cost associated with Hurricane Andrew in 1992, which cost about $15 billion. You think this may exceed that, or at the very least it'll come close to it? Yes, it could. That, those are the indications at the current point in time. Anywhere in the world has there ever been a, a single event or a compact series of events that cost the insurance industry that much money? Uh, no, there is not, but the insurance industry has never been larger or never in better financial condition to handle such a disaster. Uh, there are many insurance companies involved on the insurance policies here, some of the largest insurance companies, not just in the United States, but through the entire world. Well, you anticipated my next question. When right. you have these kinds of losses, what are the chances of going to sink some major insurance companies? Uh, the chances are very remote. Uh, in fact, non-existent uh, that any major insurance companies would, would become insolvent as a result of this. And that you is say zero? Zero, yes. And the reason for that is, is because of the number of insurance companies and the size of the insurance companies that are involved. We're talking about some of the world's 
largest corporations uh, with some of the world's largest assets invested uh, around the globe. Mega insurers in Germany, London, Switzerland, France, and here in the United States as well. Ed Bradley. Does this mean that we're going to see at least business insurance rates go up in the future because if they're going to spend 15 to 20 billion dollars to uh, compensate people for losses, how do they get that money back? Right. Well, what we'll actually be looking at is whether or not we're going to be in a period ahead where activity such as this is likely to become more commonplace. That is the driver of insurance rates. Not so much what happened in the past, but what's likely to happen in the future. Are we likely to sustain losses like this if ahead? If I can follow up on that, I'll make sure I understand uh, to get a direct answer to Ed's question. Right. Uh, you sustain a number of insurance companies, some of the largest in the right. world. Fifteen billion dollars plus. Are you saying that there's no direct correlation between that loss per se and insurance rates? It's the long-range look-ahead outlook. Right. The long-range outlook is more direct. It will factor directly into the price that we charge for business insurance customers. Uh, there will be an impact, however, because there will be a drainage on some of the industry's assets, and the industry maintains certain asset and capital levels. Do you have some companies who are not covered for uh, terrorist acts? Uh, we still don't know the full extent of that yet. It appears uh, currently at least uh, American insurers on these policies, there are no exclusions for terrorist acts. Well, the American insurers, but with some of the overseas insurers, German, right. Japanese, or we, uh, From what we know, most European insurers are putting together loss exposure estimates of their own, so I have no evidence of that at this point. If I may, and I welcome the opportunity to take advantage of your expertise in general. There's been talk these last few days, everyone, including ourselves, wants to keep the focus on victims, their families, right. and the human element here. But uh, there has been talk that this could tip the United States economy uh, into a recession. It's my understanding that right. Standard Poor's today made an estimate saying, look, in effect, maybe we've gone into a recession anyway, but with this we have to stand by and go into a recession. What's your best estimate of that? My best estimate is that there will be a short-term economic downturn as a result of this. Uh, but what we saw in the wake of Hurricane Andrew, in the wake of Northridge, is actually spectacular economic growth. What you will see, in effect, is a Marshall Plan for Manhattan go into effect very shortly. Uh, you will see billions of insurance dollars, billions of federal government dollars, billions of dollars from the state and from the city of New York, as well as from, the pri from private investors, be poured into what amounts to a relatively small geographic area. After Andrew, we actually saw the growth rate of the local economy triple within a short period of time after that during the rebuilding process. This is process. fascinating to me that Florida was hit, and southern Florida, was, south Florida absolutely devastated yes. uh, by Hurricane Andrew and everybody said they're going to be a long, long time coming back. What you're telling me is yes, it dipped down, but it came roaring back. That's right. The economy of Florida, in fact, is one of the strongest in the entire United States. Growth both in terms of population and home construction and new business formation in Florida is maybe second or third in the nation. But I want to hold a point here about New York City. That right. You are in the short range for both New York City and the U.S. economy, let's say at least mildly pessimistic, but in the medium long range, very optimistic? Right. There are certain structural problems in the U.S. economy and the global economy today. Uh, this uh, particular event will have no impact on that. But the local economy in particular, longer run, and beginning actually probably by the first quarter of next year, we'll see a significant inflow of capital. But if business rates go up in the future as a result of this, right. does that in any way impact the consumer? Uh, not the individual consumer. Uh, the average person who purchases home and auto insurance will see uh, no effect from this essentially. Uh, it does have some impact on uh, the, the price of insurance for uh, various business structures and insuring businesses in general, uh, but certainly not for the average consumer in America. Well, Mr. Hartwig, if you don't mind staying with us here, I, I recognize you came to talk about the insurance industry per se, right. but this story is so fast moving, these economic developments, if you don't mind staying with we us just a stay. bit here. Uh, what about this news? It doesn't come as any great surprise. It was anticipated a bit that the stock markets are not right. going to be open tomorrow. Right. This is unprecedented. Closed Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and now we know they're going to be closed Friday. Right. Even 
after Pearl Harbor, they only closed for two days. Now, we're, right. we're assured and reassured that they will be open on Monday. Right. What's the significance of this? I really think there's a logistical issue here in that uh, power is unavailable in that part of Manhattan where my own office is located and where I witnessed the disaster firsthand. Uh, there's a tremendous cleanup job and a logistical problem in terms of getting actual traders to the floor and being able to, to feed them uh, in those sorts of issues. So I think uh, that's part of the problem, but I think that uh, it's a good hiatus. Uh, it's a needed hiatus for the markets. We saw initially the reaction in Europe. We saw a market drop. Uh, but now we see the markets in Europe rebounding today. Hopefully we'll skip those gyrations and move back into a smooth trading pattern next week. That's the hope. Uh, but when the markets open Monday, what right. are the chances that there will be chaos on the markets because they've been closed for so long? I think the uh, chances are remote that we'll actually see chaos. And in fact, by waiting a few days, and this is the reason why uh, Mr. Grasso, chairman of the exchange, has waited several days, is we're waiting to see the full extent of the damage and what the outcome will be in terms of our response to our adversaries. And I think that will, that's forthcoming. America understands what's happening. We understand more clearly now the economic ramifications. Ed Bradley has some breaking developments. Uh, Dan, we've just been handed a, a bulletin that says that uh, the Arlington County Fire Captain says that they have a signal from the transponder in the black box of the plane that crashed into the Pentagon. And that would provide them some real evidence with uh, uh, information from the cockpit and wow. possibly also voice recordings from the this cockpit. This is not only big, this is huge. If they indeed have, have found a, are hearing a signal. Well, they're hearing the signal it. from it, so they're a step closer to, 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 to locating it. Uh, big news indeed, and we'll be dealing with that um, as we go through the top of the hour and um, our, our people will be checking into that uh, extensively and we will have more information about it but let's repeat that uh, this is bulletin material that they pick up uh, the sound the, from the Arlington County fire captain says that they have now received a signal uh, from the black box of the plane that crashed into the Pentagon and if they are uh, receiving the signal from the, the transponder of the black box, they are a step closer to being able to locate that black box. Absolutely. Earlier they said they thought their best chance was to get the black box out of the plane that had crashed in southwestern. Here in Oklahoma City in 1995, Ray Downey, one of my dear friends, apparently killed in the, the bombing there in New York, and his son as well. These were very giving people, courageous, heroic people that give their lives for others. A wonderful statement of American goodness, and I'm very proud to be an American today. And, and, and Governor Keating, what do you think Americans can do at the moment to perpetuate this sense of togetherness and citizenship that is so evident across the country today? Well, I think what President Bush proposed, tomorrow is a national day of mourning, but he also said everyone should go to their mosque or synagogue, their church, their parish, whatever the denomination or religion they might belong to, and go to church tomorrow at noon commit themselves to be a better citizen, a more spiritual citizen, a more moral person, you know, hug their kids, spend more time with their family, recognize the genius of America, the rule of law, representative government society, where we expect people to be their very best. We will never forgive nor forget evil done to us, and we didn't here in Oklahoma City. We got those responsible, but we try to make ourselves a better society as a result, and here we've never felt better about ourselves, ever than we do now after the rebuild, after the bombing. And so, so out of evil, good can come. It, it is true, I know, and I keep talking to you because we're about to lose the satellite and lose you, so let me take advantage of the last couple of minutes. We do know that Oklahoma City, in many ways, is a very different, much developed, much changed city since the bombing. Have you seen, in the wake of the bombing, and is there a lesson here for the rest of us, that the city and the character of the people has been, has been remade into something better, even? I think so. And I know that you think, oh, that guy's a politician. He's going to be a Chamber of Commerce representative for his people. But I watch polls. I can see how people think of themselves. Our kids are working harder. I think we're working better as a people together. Uh, I think the, the religions and the races and the cultures of our, of our community are together more than they've ever been. And we're rebuilding the state. We're building a dome on our capital. Ours is the only capital unfinished other than the Capitol in Washington that Lincoln finished in 1864. We're doing the same thing mm -hmm. here, all with private money, and we're celebrating that renaissance of our state. So good can come from evil. Well, Governor Keating, you are a politician, and I wouldn't expect you, and, <laughs> and, we, all, and we all know that. We all know what kind of leadership you exerted at the time of the Oklahoma City bombing. And I'm sorry you're not going to be able to stay with us, but I'm very grateful to hear you today.
Thank Governor you very Frank much, Keating, and, and everything else we hear about Oklahoma City, of course, is pretty clear indication that what the governor says about its development in the wake of the bombing is absolutely true. It is now four o'clock in the eastern United States as we, as we see uh, one of millions of Americans taking a moment to simply stop and stand and consider that we will, speaking on behalf of himself and others, we will not let them destroy the spirit of Governor Keating making it just uh, indelibly clear that that is the way they feel in the heartland of the country. Now I want to talk to Michael Beschloss, who is our resident historian. Michael, uh, who's in the Washington Bureau. Michael, the governor referred to a longing for an earlier time. In his case, he mentioned for the 1950s. Mm -hmm. Put this in some kind of historical context for this. The country has not been through anything quite like this before. No, we never have, and uh, obviously that's one thing to always remember whenever you use any kind of a historical analogy, even one like Pearl Harbor that we've heard over the last couple of days. But you know, Peter, I think the one thing that really occurs to me looking at it through history is look at, through, at all the traumas we've been through as a nation. A revolution, a civil war, a Great Depression, two world wars, a Cold War, all these things, and amazingly, we Americans are still largely the same kind of people that we were 200 years ago. Compassionate, united, with a great respect for civil liberties, and under a constitution that was written for a very different country, which was a union of a small number of agricultural states. And what do you think it is that continues to make it that way? Because I think you're absolutely right. I think it's woven into our genetic code as, American, prob as Americans probably two things. And that is when we go through a crisis, we don't fracture, we unite, we try to help one another. We saw so many of those stories up in New York the other day. And the other thing is that when we're called on to make a sacrifice, we're happy to do that too. I mean, Pearl Harbor, for instance, as you know, six months before that attack by the Japanese, America was brutally divided between those who thought we should not get into the war and those who thought that we should. Mm -hmm. Immediately after that attack, almost a half a million Americans gave their lives. I was just going to make that point, that, that, that during World War II, but particularly after Pearl Harbor, we saw intense patriotism uh, in the country. And you know, you raise the question, as horrible as it may be, as to whether or not the country does not need to go through crisis on occasion in order to regenerate itself. I think historically, you almost mm. hate to say it, but it's probably true. The periods that are tranquil, like the 1920s and the 1950s, they were very good for business, very good for all sorts of things, but in terms of Americans having that kind of feeling, probably less so. So oftentimes you do have to look to crisis. At the same time, though, you look at a period like the mid-1960s, there was no hot war, there was a cold war, but there wasn't an immediate crisis like this, yet Americans were willing to respond to the civil rights movement. So. Yeah. Oftentimes, I think you could see the best in us without this kind of a trauma. Michael, just pause for a second because we're seeing again something on television on the screen, which I think is very important if I know my flags at all, and I'm not sure. It, it, it looks very much like the Marine flag. Um, and, I, and we're in the general vicinity of the Pentagon. And in terms of the attack on the Pentagon today, uh, I don't believe, according to John McQuethy at the Pentagon, that the Marines actually suffered any casualties, nor did the Air Force. But there is a, is a group of guys, I assume from the military, all of them, because much of the rescue operation has been mounted by the military itself, along with the relief and fire departments from the immediate area. And I'm not sure where they're going. Yes, it is indeed the Marine Corps flag by its distinctive red, among other things. Uh, flags and battle flags, as we were talking earlier today with our guest, Mr. Potenzone in Totowa, New Jersey, who we have also left. He's had to go back and do business. But the battle flags of the various services in the country here, and in terms of history, Michael, confirm this for me, have just been essential to, um, to spirit and to esprit de corps. I think that's right. And you even look at those figures, Peter. You looked at the look on those faces. If anyone had a right to look down and not be free striding and feel morose, it would have been the people we just saw on screen because of what they've been through and what their colleagues have been through. In a way, it's very American. They had that optimistic look on their faces. In a way, you need to see.
situation like this sometimes to remember that. The shock to the American system, both individually and generally, was so enormous on this particular case that I wonder what you think, looking at it from an historical perspective, about recovery. It's going to take a very long time, and I think possibly because we've been living under something of an illusion. For the last 10 years, since the, the end of the Cold War, Americans sort of were led to believe that once the Cold War ended and there was no more Soviet Union, that we weren't really under the kind of a threat that we had lived uh, under not only for 45 years of the Cold War, but for five or six years of uh, World War II. And I think to some extent our leaders and our people were not as conscious as they should have been of the fact that something like this could happen. The result is now we're finding out with a vengeance and it's going to take some time, I think, probably to absorb that. The columnist George Will wrote uh, in his column today that we've had a decade-long holiday from history. Do you believe that? I do, and that's something that happens in history, too. You, you go back to the 1920s, Peter. That's a period in which we felt that World War I was over, it was not a success, it didn't rid Europe of the kind of conflicts that Woodrow Wilson predicted it would, so we Americans would just absorb ourselves in money making and mm -hmm. ignore the rest of the world, stay out of the League of Nations, and of course in the late 1930s the Imperial Japanese and Adolf Hitler showed us otherwise. I think you're defining a national character in an almost universal basis, but I have to tell you that one of the things we learned today, and I suppose it's inevitable, is that a lot of spammers are apparently taking advantage of these terrorist attacks. Uh, to solicit donations in the name of victims of the disasters on the webs, on the internet. And I, I offer that up as a warning to people. I don't think anybody's surprised that this happens. Um, but it certainly today, Michael, seems to be absolutely a minority example of what we've seen across the country as a whole. That's right. You know, there were black marketeers during World War II, but thank God they were not more than a very small number. What's your advice, finally, Michael? We often ask you for history. Give us your advice on what we in the country should pay attention to. Certainly the roots. You mentioned the revolution. You, mention, you mentioned the Civil War, two world wars, the Cold War. Uh, numerous historians, David McCullough in, among them, have pointed out in the last couple of days the magnitude of this in terms of conflict on native soil since the Civil War. And I, I've forgotten who it was yesterday, I apologize, but compared the casualties here today to the Battle of Antietam um, during the Civil War when 22,000 people were killed on a, you know, in one single battle. Is, is that the kind of reach we need to make into American history to understand what the nation is today? Well, Antietam was called the bloodiest day in American history, and as you say, that was 22,000. But I think the thing that we should always remember is how resilient we, we really are, even when it seems darkest before the dawn. But I think another thing is less reassuring, and that is that if this is to be a war, this is going to be a conflict of a kind that we have never seen before, and most of us don't understand. To use the Franklin Roosevelt comparison, one advantage he had was that when the Japanese attacked and, the, and Americans united, they understood the problem, and Roosevelt already had a policy in place. The problem for President Bush is going to be not only does he have to explain to us what this new challenge means, but also very quickly come up with a policy to deal with it. And finally, Michael, before we move on to other matters, very grateful for your presence. Remind us of how, of how important it was to President Roosevelt and every president subsequently to have the will of the American people behind them before they did anything. Absolutely. Always made sure that America was united. And even go to go up to the elder President Bush in 1991, we sometimes forget about the Gulf War, but as you know, when Saddam Hussein invaded Kuwait, many of us thought that especially after Vietnam, the chance that Americans in Congress would support the president to send half a million Americans around the globe to support a government that most Americans have never heard of, we would have been very doubtful about that. Michael, thank you very much. It's great to see you, and I hope thank we'll you. see you before the end of the day. Michael Beschloss and Governor Frank Keating from, from Oklahoma, that wonderful owner of a flag shop in Totowa, New Jersey. Uh, giving us some sense of the unity that is felt in, in the country today. The firefighters in New York, the saved or not saved, rescued or not rescued firefighters, Mayor Giuliani now confirms that the five firefighters who were rescued today uh, had not been trapped since Tuesday. Um, it is not clear when they were trapped, but they definitely were not trapped during the original collapse of the Trade Towers or any adjacent building, but five firefighters have 
There was that one story earlier on in, in, in which a number had fallen into a hole when they were looking for somebody else and managed to be rescued today. But the, uh, but the operation goes on uh, without a moment's hesitation in New York. And I believe, based on what we know today, and using the mayor's figures, that about 4,760 people are still listed as missing, which would, of course, mean that Antietam, the Battle of Antietam during the Civil War, continues to be the bloodiest day in American history. ABC's Dan Harris is with us. Dan, you spent part of the day in a firehouse. Oh, man, that must have been tough. It was tough, Peter. I was walking through midtown Manhattan when I got a call from one of your producers who said, can you uh, help us? We're doing a segment tonight on uh, how New Yorkers are pulling together. And I said, well, I'll, I'll certainly look around. And the moment I hung up the phone, I looked to my left, I saw this firehouse, and there was a spontaneous display of sympathy and condolence. There were flowers all over the place. Uh, the firefighters seemed very grateful. We talked to some of the well-wishers and the firefighters. I think we have some videotape to show you. Okay, great. Well, we live in this neighborhood, and we walk by these guys every day, and we always get a friendly hello. So um, I talked to them this morning. They said they lost 10, 10 men from their 50-person unit, which is a pretty big hit. So we just stopped in to bring them some flowers and cupcakes and send our regards. Yeah. Let them know what? Just let them know that they're on our minds and that, you know, we that they are friendly neighbors and, and that their neighbors are thinking of them in such a time. Appreciate their hard work and bravery. It makes us feel good. Um, I've been busy today running around here and every time I come back I see more people just want to express their condolences, um, bringing flowers, um, food, all sorts of things. Um, it makes you feel good how many people have just expressed uh, their concern. Um, How are you holding up? Well, we're very busy, so I think that's good. Um, we have a lot of guys come in this morning. The fellows are here, man, in the trucks. Uh, everybody else uh, went down to the scene to help out, and they'll be back tonight, and we'll go down. Uh, it's keeping us busy, but it's um, it's slowly sinking in. I think it'll be worse in a few days. That was East 51st Street in Midtown Manhattan, Peter. On this topic of New Yorkers pulling together, we also spent some time at a law firm today, Cleary Gottlieb, an international law firm that was in One Liberty Center, which is part of that World Trade Center complex, and their office was destroyed. They were setting up in a temporary office, scrambling to get everything set. They mentioned that some of their competitors had offered them office space. And we're hearing the same thing in the financial services field. Exactly. Exactly. Thanks very much, Dan. You know, Charlie Gibson's here with you. We're a little older than Dan, Charlie. <laughs> but you Sometimes know, I feel it. <laughs> I was thinking every time we mention, I mention the firefighters, I also want to, you know, mention the cops because the cops have have, have suffered and worked to, uh, so hard and have suffered their own loss. But the fire department is different because we all were kids. Aren't we? we always get our fathers when I was growing up take us into the firehouse, Dad. Maybe we can talk to them, let us slide down the pole. And so there's a long association. Maybe it's particularly with boys. I don't know, but. Uh, with the fire department that, that seems to bring them to the forefront of our thoughts today. Well, you know, I'm, I'm sort of uh, sorry to hear you say, to some extent, that those firefighters who were found today, the five who came out of the rubble, weren't lost for 50 hours because it so raised the spirits of all the people who were down there, the rescue workers, were so buoyed by what had happened uh, that they finally had found some people. Oh, who, and, it. and it gave them some hope that what they were doing was not just clearing rubble, not just uh, uh, emptying out this uh, uh, site of desecration, but that they were actually looking for people. And, and I, I hope that that does not bring despondency to that, to that site again. But Peter, you mentioned uh, the New York City Police Department. Uh, the numbers that the mayor supplied us this morning were that there are about 300 New York firefighters missing and about 60 police officers, New York PD and uh, Transit Authority police. Right, right, right. But even when you talk to the police, and I've talked to some mm -hmm. of the cops on the street in the last couple of days, they talk about the fire exactly. department. You know, they've lost 30 men, but they're talking about uh, the losses that are even greater uh, in the fire department. And, and the people who were coming down, fleeing the World Trade Center, as they ran down the stairs the for their lives, the other way. they were running into the yeah. firemen going the other way and, and saying, you know, we're, we're trying to make speed in our suit coats. These guys are wearing 50 pound packs and they're going up and we stopped to help them and then we thought no that's their job and we got to get out. Uh, we've talked to a couple of people who got out of the trade tower who said that in fact that was how they got the information as they were coming down hearing the walkie talkies of the fire department as they were going up. I yeah. know you've got several other observations but I just want to say first um, that in Arlington, Virginia, the fire captain there 
um, says they have signals from a transponder of the black box from the plane that crashed into the Pentagon. Uh, that's only one report. It comes to us from the Associated Press. And when John McCarthy went uh, to the Pentagon this morning with the Secretary of Defense, Don Rumsfeld, and they looked around the outside, it was the Secretary of Defense who said that the force of the onslaught had been so considerable that the forward part of the plane, the nose of the plane, had got so far in. So it may Almost be... Almost went all the way through the uh, Pentagon. We, we, you know, it's the second place. In Pennsylvania, where the plane is apparently broken up quite badly, we're trying to investigate this. Um, there's a pretty good chance of getting the black box and the cockpit flight recorder better in the Pentagon, of course, much more difficult in New York. You have some... The, the Pentagon situation, stuff. of course, though, the, the, the rescue people there at the Pentagon were saying earlier today that there's still such instability in that part of the Pentagon that's collapsed that they were worried about whether they could get into the people there and maybe they can't get into the black box. Either. Actually, John McCarthy's at the Pentagon at the moment and I just heard in my ear that John may have some more authoritative information than we do. Yes, Jack? Peter, they are saying that they are hearing the pinging of the black box. Uh, you may recall that uh, Defense Secretary Rumsfeld uh, told me earlier today on a tour we took that the nose of the aircraft is embedded in one of the inner rings of the Pentagon. Now uh, the people who are working away on the, on the rubble at the Pentagon are saying, yes, we are hearing pinging. So there is a prospect that they could find that black box and get a, a great deal of useful information. Uh, the problem, of course, is it is in one of the most unstable parts of the building, as Charlie just said. Okay, thanks, John, very much. Charlie, why don't you continue for a bit here? Well, Peter, what I have information on is is something that, that sort of pales in significance when you talk about black boxes and when you talk about uh, the numbers of people who were missing and firemen lost and all that. But it's, it's a decision, I think, that had a lot of symbolic value. We've all been waiting to find out whether the National Football League would play its games on Sunday. And as you mentioned uh, earlier on in the broadcast, uh, uh, that the National Football League has decided not to play uh, this weekend. Uh, the decision was announced by Greg Aiello, who is a spokesman, or was acting as a spokesman, for the commissioner of football, Paul Tagliabue, and here's the reasons that he stated as for the cancellation of the games this weekend. We in the National Football League have decided that our priorities for this weekend are to pause, breathe, and reflect. It is a time to tend to families and neighbors and all those wounded by these horrific acts of terrorism. We understand those individuals in sports who want to play this weekend. We also empathize with those who want to take the weekend off and resume their personal lives and professional careers next week. We strongly believe that the latter course of action is the right decision for the NFL. On, su on Sunday, September 23rd, the NFL, its players and coaches will return stronger than ever and resume our playing schedule. The decision on whether to reschedule this weekend's games or play a 15-game regular season schedule is under consideration and will be announced as soon as possible. Even though the games uh, canceled, uh, the teams did scrimmage today. This is the New York Giants scrimmaging on their practice facility, which is just outside the Meadowlands complex. The Philadelphia Eagles, uh, about 90 miles to the south, were practicing today, and a plane flew low over the practice field. Everybody stopped. This is Wellington Mara, the owner of the New York Giants, the venerable owner who has been such a, a force in the National Football League. He supported the suspension of games this weekend, as did almost all of the owners. You know, there's been something of a debate as to whether this was a good idea because some felt um, that, that it might be in some way disrespectful uh, to play the games. Others felt that the games might be a, a worthwhile diversion, a sort of manifestation uh, that life goes on. But it's interesting when you talk to the players, they didn't take either side in that debate. They just said they really didn't want to play, that their heart couldn't be in it. And um, that their thoughts are like everybody else's uh, with the families of the victims, with the rescue workers, uh, generally with the situation that's going on in this country in the past few days and what they saw on Tuesday. Uh, some cases in point, you're going to hear sound bites now from Jason Seahorn, the terrific cornerback for the New York Giants, and Michael Strahan, the great defensive lineman uh, for the Giants, Howard Cross, uh, the Giants' tight end, uh, Lomas Brown, an offensive lineman, and then Jeffrey Lurie, who's the owner of the Philadelphia Eagles, all of them agreeing with the commissioner's decision that the game shouldn't have been played. Take a listen. To a man, nobody was really concentrating on football. The conversations weren't about the Green Bay Packers, and they weren't about, you know, Brett Favre. They were about, did you see the, those two towers fall? Did you see that plane enter those things? For us, it's a little more difficult. We sit here, and we can see the fire still smoking right there. We come out every single day for the last eight years, and I've seen two towers standing there. They're not there. 
there's nobody thinking about football. Nobody's mind is on a game this Sunday. Um, for us to play, you know, it would be ridiculous. And we'd just be doing it to do it. And I don't think there's any sense in that. You wish you could have done something. I mean, you're right there. And um, you can't believe you're so close. You can't believe. You just can't to gather in disbelief of that. So, I mean, we all spend so much time in the city, and uh, I'm pretty sure most of us have been to, to the World Trade Centers, and um, and now you look and you see, and you, they're gone, and, and, and all the people that were in them, and the people on the planes, and I can't imagine the horror that people have gone through. I can't imagine the horror that the families who are looking for their loved ones are going through right now. And, and I think that's why, for us as players, this is so secondary. Football is so secondary right now. I think New York City and the country needs to be behind everybody um, with the effort of trying to, 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 to save as many people as possible and, and trying to get the city back on its feet. For myself personally, you think back and you, of, of things that you, you know, use reference all the time when I speak to kids how, how great our country is, how we never have moments where, where, where you see kids your age you know, throwing rocks at tanks or you know, we're not getting bombed and things like that. It, uh, that's a hard thing to you know to say now to kids. You know, it's, it's going to be a, it's a different outlook on life. I mean, it's, it changes changes the world a lot for us. We haven't seen the worst part. I mean, the worst part is when they start pulling victims out of the the debris and you know start putting names to these numbers of casualties. I mean, that's when it's going to get real sad. And you know, I'm I'm just glad the NFL did the right thing. I, I couldn't have thought of anything more appropriate than for us to just take this Sunday off and, and just mourn the loss of a lot of these people here. It, it makes no sense to have played our games on a Sunday when most of America is watching. Um, mourning comes before escape. And let's separate football from the rest of life. Life comes first. And uh, Sunday is a time for mourning and thoughtfulness and uh, uh, support for all, you know, of our loved ones and friends that uh, were affected by this tragedy and uh, uh, not a time to escape and watch television or attend football games, in my opinion. That Jeffrey Lurie, the owner of the Philadelphia Eagles and those players, with the New York Giants. The players generally adamant that it was not a good idea to play. Um, it, it, as I say, it wasn't a question of whether the games would be disrespectful or whether it would be a worthwhile diversion. The players just said their minds wouldn't be in it. Their minds are on what happened, as are the minds of all of the rest of us. Now, we've mentioned uh, NASCAR uh, has postponed its race this weekend. A lot of the college football games, the major conferences, have called off their games. The PGA Tour has canceled. Uh, its tournaments this weekend. The NHL has postponed uh, its pregame, uh, its uh, preseason games. And baseball, as you may know, and Peter mentioned a, a little bit uh, ago, uh, has canceled all of its games all the way through Sunday. Bud Selig, who is the uh, commissioner of baseball and the owner of the Milwaukee Brewers, uh, made that announcement and said the games would resume on Monday. Here's what the commissioner of baseball, Bud Selig, had to say. Everybody has, will have to do what, uh, you know, they feel comfortable doing. I think we'll have a very interesting last three weeks of the season. Uh, this has been historic and it's shocking difference in nature. But I think that, uh, I, you know, I think uh, hopefully we can provide uh, the country with a... With a uh, a wonderful form of entertainment. So baseball will resume on Monday, and for all of those of you who are wondering, well, does it mean that Barry Bonds has lost a week and won't be able to pursue the 70 home runs, and will Cal Ripken be able to play 3,000 games, all of that? Baseball is actually going to extend the season a week. It will play all the games, extending the season a week, and the postseason will start uh, a week late. There's an interesting point in all this, Peter. I think uh, all of the sports leagues are so sensitive to this issue of whether they should play or not. And it goes back to 1963. Uh, John F. Kennedy was assassinated exactly. on a Friday. And Pete Rozelle decided that the National Football League should go ahead, that it was important that uh, life go on. And, and I talked to him several times, and I remember having a discussion with him, and he went out of his way. I didn't even bring up the issue. And it was years later. And he said, you know, I made that decision to go ahead and play on Sunday, and he said, and I will regret that every day of my life. He's now passed away. But uh, that decision 
in his mind. He went over and over and over it and felt he had done the wrong thing. Now, this you bring one other to mind, I have to tell you, the decision made by Avery Brundage to go ahead with the Olympics in Munich, Munich. in 1972 after the Palestinian attack on the Israelis at, at Munich. And it was hugely controversial, but in the case of Roselle and in the case of Brundage, people were deeply resentful. But, but you have to think that in their own minds, what they were trying to do was to demonstrate to the country and the world some sense of normalcy. Yes, and, and I've often wondered about that. Uh, mm -hmm. I was going to get to the Brundage decision. I'm glad you mentioned it because you were there, and mm -hmm. it's, it's very fresh in your mind. Um, Brundage faced an issue where he had an, an international games, and That's it was right. a statement of international resolve, and also he had a games that if you canceled them, it was four years again before it would happen. But I thought at the time that he'd probably, I felt that he'd made the wrong decision, and I, and I felt the same way about about Roselle, although I must say when the commissioner raised it in my conversation, I didn't tell him, yeah, I thought he'd made the wrong decision. I'm going to tell you something even worse. I covered the Kennedy funeral. It was the first, it was the, first the Kennedy assassination was the first story I ever covered in, in, in the country. And I don't remember. <laughs> that's, that's even worse. Maybe that's just simply old age. Thanks, Charlie, very much indeed for bringing us up to date on that. Sure, um, here's, a que here's a question that everybody in the country wants to know. Well, not everybody, but a great many people. Is, it, is the country able to travel at the moment? And you, ha you heard the Secretary of Transportation, you've heard the Attorney General earlier today, I think you even heard the President very briefly talk about opening up the skies again so that people can begin to move. Uh, but it has not been easy to move. We'll talk to, we'll talk to Lisa Stark, our aviation analyst, in just a moment about the 40,000 flights per day that the country is accustomed to. But first we want to go to ABC's James Walker because he has come upon something which gives us an absolutely fascinating picture at the moment of what the country's status is. Jimmy? Peter, this is uh, some relatively new software from a Boston company that shows us exactly what flights are in the air uh, virtually in real time. Each one of those dots that you're looking at represents a plane. Uh, you can still see a lot of flights uh, north of the border in Canada. They're probably making their way back, uh, back into the U.S. Um, if you count up those little dots, I'm told that there are 638 flights and the company that produces this flight view says that on a normal day there would be some 3,000 commercial planes in the air and another 2,000 private planes. So that's a total of 5,000 aircraft and right now we have 638. Um, this software is used primarily by regional jet companies and by cargo carriers who want to and are able to um, track their aircraft from takeoff to touchdown so they can coordinate cargo deliveries and things of that nature. It's updated every 15 seconds. So every 15 seconds, you get a exact real-time look at uh, where your planes are. Now, you're looking at a graphic there. You're actually looking at their computer site, which is flightview.com. I am looking at a graphic. Okay. All right. So we'll now, there's the, Peter, there's the tri-state area, New York, uh, Connecticut, New Jersey. And we see one, two, three, four, five aircraft in the air. And I would imagine that any other day you would see hundreds. Say again, Jimmy. I, I'm, just, I'm just looking at this uh, picture right here, and I can add up three, four, five planes uh, over the New York vicinity. And I was just saying that on any other day, you'd probably have hundreds there. Well, I can guess what those planes are in the air over New York City, too. They may be helicopters uh, being used by the rescue authorities. I think in all likelihood, they may be that contingent of fighter jets in which have been flying in New York airspace uh, since this disaster well, happened. I, I think in this case, they are commercial, uh, commercial jets. And why do you think so? Because the company explained that they get the flight, uh, the flight plans, and that's what they enter. Oh, I see. Anything else, Jimmy? Uh, Peter, that's it. Great. That's a terrific piece of information. Can we just have a look at the original graphic again and thank flightview.com again? Um, we're going to use them. Uh, have they given us permission, James, to go on using them? Oh, I think if we keep saying <laughs> flightview.com, they'll be very happy. Well, thank you very much indeed, and thank you to them, because this is really the best picture we can possibly have at the moment of how the skies over North America are beginning uh, to change from only a few hours ago. And with that in mind, let's bring our aviation correspondent of the day, because she covered so much else for us, Lisa Stark in from Seattle. And, and, and were you able to see, I, have you got a monitor anywhere near you, Lisa? I, I am not able to see that, but I am familiar with uh, with that sort of software, and I can get an idea of what the picture must look like. All right, so now supplement it, if you will, with, with hard time information. 
Well, I guess the good news, Peter, is that there are some flights in the air. Uh, as uh, Jimmy Walker said, though, of course, it is a very, very small fraction of what you would see on any given day. And a snapshot of the airports that we've looked at around the country show that at many of them, it's, it's quite chaotic and confusing. Chicago O'Hare Airport, for example, uh, open for business this morning. I'm told the lines were extremely, extremely long. And then in about just some time in the last hour, all of the sudden over the PA system at the airport, it was announced that Chicago O'Hare was immediately shutting down. We have not been able to determine exactly why that is, but I'm told by our folks on the ground there that they stopped letting people through the gates and they announced the airport was shutting down. Uh, we don't know again why we're trying to ascertain. So let it's me, a very confusing picture out there. Let me interrupt you just about Boston because there's been quite a lot of controversy. First of all, this is where two of the aircraft took off, but there's been quite a lot of controversy today ever since I think the chief of security at Logan Airport said they had the, some of the best security in the country. Mm -hmm. and, I, and I gather that may be one of the reasons they're having trouble getting up and running again. Well, I, I'm not sure if that's one of the reasons, but I know that it's taking a lot to convince the a FAA to let airports go back online, if you will. And uh, there are a lot of security procedures that have to be in place, both uh, by the airports and the airlines. One air airport spokesman, uh, the spokesman from San Francisco, said it has just been a logistical nightmare. And the airlines, too, are telling me they have to reposition crews. They have to reposition planes. They have to get the catering reordered, the fuel trucks. It really is like starting all over again. And it's been very difficult for them to get the system up and running today. Lisa, when Ari Fleischer, the president's spokesperson, was asked at the briefing a while ago whether sky marshals and military personnel would be used on aircraft. He said he didn't really know the answer to that. It wasn't clear to him. Do you know? Well, what we're hearing from uh, the Air Transport Association, they are the folks that uh, are the trade association for the airlines. They indicate to us, at least, that they believe there will be a very visible sky marshal presence on a number of airplanes. Now, uh, Secretary Norm Mineta today indicated that he would ask the military for some help with the special Delta forces, that they would go on board uh, the aircraft as well. During the Pentagon briefing today, we're told that the military said, no, their understanding was that they would help train Sky Marshals. So I think there's a little bit of confusion about who will be on board the plane, but certainly on some planes, there will be Sky Marshals. But you may not notice them, Peter, the whole idea with the Sky Marshal program is it's the guy sitting next to you and you have no idea that that person's actually a Sky Marshal. Now help us put something else in, in context. There's a trade group which represents, I think, 266 airlines around the world, estimates today that the expenses occurred this week for airlines may be $10 billion because of their inability to operate. And they go on to say that 40% of the carrier's costs continue even when they don't have planes in the air. Does that make sense to you? Absolutely so. What I'm being told is they're still paying everyone. No one's been laid off. They're still paying their crews. Uh, the only thing they're not paying are landing fees. They're not paying their fuel costs. But much of their costs uh, really are labor. And that is what they continue to pay. And I've also been told that airlines keep about a 15-day cash reserve on hand. And many of them are in very precarious, uh, I wouldn't say they're in precarious financial shape, but they've had a very, very tough year financially. And there is a sense that this will be a very big economic blow to a number of the airlines. Although they don't want to talk about that right now because they're much more concerned about, about security and getting back in business. With one exception, that's Midway Airlines, Midway Express in the Midwest, which uh, in fact closed down its operations because it couldn't afford to continue. It, it's Midway Airlines, not Midwest Express, Midway. which is a different company. I don't want to get people confused. Midway right. Airlines is yeah. the one that shut down. Anything else you want to add? I do. I want to talk about general aviation a little bit because there has been a significant amount of confusion about whether these folks can get back up into the air. Initially, uh, the Department of Transportation said at 11 a.m. Eastern Time this morning uh, they would open the skies to everyone, mm. basically. General aviation as well. What is Apparently, you, by general? Sorry to interrupt. By general no aviation, problem. you mean private aircraft? I mean private aircraft and corporate aircraft. Uh, that, that's what we're talking about. And they indicated that the skies would be open to basically everyone starting at 11 a.m. Apparently, 
The Department of Transportation changed their mind shortly before 11, but we're told by folks in the general aviation community that the notice wasn't really received by anyone until 11.22 this morning. By that time, there were already a number of general aviation um, flights up in the air. And as you know, there are military aircraft. I think mm. we have some videotape, actually. There are military aircraft, F-15s, F-16s, patrolling uh, much of uh, part of the United States uh, off of the Oregon and Washington coast, for example, in the New York area. Apparently, there were a number of force downs by military aircraft of general aviation planes this morning uh, because those planes, it turned out, were not supposed to be up in the air. We don't know exactly how many planes were forced down, but we know that a number of them were, in fact, forced down by military aircraft. Lisa, thanks very much indeed. Lisa Skarg in Seattle. You can imagine how that must have made the pilot feel when, an air, when, a, when a military jet comes nearby and says you're going to land immediately. At any rate, very much, very many thanks to Lisa Stark and to... James Walker, and also to the people at FlightView.com um, for giving us a real picture in real time of the number of aircraft in the skies over the United States at this moment. And with their indulgence, we will continue uh, to use that graphic to give you a sense uh, visually of what is happening. Change subject again. Um, for all of the spirit we have seen in the country today, and it has been terrific, for all of the unity and the patriotism we have seen in the country today, there is a huge amount of trauma. And we want to talk a little bit now with some experts about trauma and uh, people's emotions and how they deal with the impact of this enormous shock to the national and personal system in many cases. First of all, here in her own words is the story of a survivor named Sheila Moody. I heard a whistling like a whistling sound and a rumble and then just a big whoosh um, of like it felt like air at first but then I realized it was it was fire just a big ball of fire that kind of came in um, it felt like it came in through the window and it just kind of engulfed us all and then and then it was gone um, my clothes were kind of my hands were on fire because I think I instinctively put my hands up to cover my face and um, I was kind of knocked back, but I wasn't knocked down, and, and um, I never lost consciousness or anything. And then um, just kind of realized that, you know, there was an explosion. Something had happened. And the other lady um, that was in my office, and she was calling, and I was, she, you know, she was saying, I can't move. Is anybody there? And I told her, I said, I'm here, I'm here. And she said, who is it? I said, it's me, it's Sheila. I said, I'm here. I said, we got to try to find a way to get out of here. I could, I could see a little light coming um, through a window. So I, I tried to reach up and, and hit the window to see if I could maybe break it or, or we could get out, but it was too high and it was too hard. So I looked around to see if I could um, find something that maybe I could break it with, but there was so much smoke and the, the fumes were, you know, were just filling up the room and I started coughing and choking. So I tried to crouch down to see if maybe I could breathe a little bit better if I got down a little lower and um and then I just I just started praying um you know I was all I could do was pray I was just like God you know you got to help me help us get out of here I said I can't believe you brought me down here for me to die here and um and and I just started I kept praying and no sooner that I um that I was praying and thinking you know I wouldn't see my children anymore and, and without the prayers and God, I know I, I just wouldn't have made it. I heard the man coming. He said, I can't see you. I said, I can't see you either. I said, but we're here. We're here. And so I kept trying to call to him so that he, maybe he could follow the sound of my voice and he could get to us. But the smoke and the fumes was taking my voice away. So I started clapping my hands, hoping that he could follow the sound of me clapping my hands and I could hear the fire extinguisher and he was getting closer. And then for a brief second, I could see his silhouette just through the smoke, just enough so I could go in his direction. He, and he put out the flames that were between him and I with the fire extinguisher. And I went to him, and he led me outside. But I said he was just an angel sent by God to get me out of there. That's not applause. That's trying to, just trying to imagine this. Once again, an extraordinarily articulate survivor, in this case, Sheila Moody, who was on 
the second day of work at the Pentagon. Only the second day of work she'd been at the Pentagon, clapping her hands in the dark so that someone attempting and willing and wanting to rescue her, her would. And we thank her for one more quite extraordinarily articulate description of what it was like to get out. We're joined this afternoon by Dr. Alvin Poussant. Um, he's very familiar to, to many American audiences. He's a psychiatrist at Judge Baker Children's Center in Boston, widely known on issues of adult and child trauma. Thank you for joining us, Dr. Poussaint. Thank you. Awful lot of it out there today, isn't there? Awful lot. So, where do you start? Where do I start with all of this? I think that the woman who just spoke uh, suffered a great deal of trauma. I I'm sh I'm know she's very grateful to be alive, but I wonder how that trauma is going to affect her in the future. Uh, she must have been terrified. It's likely that she may have nightmares about this, and it's likely this may stay with her for the rest of her life. Anyone who experiences that degree of, of trauma, and that's true for many of the people who were on the scene, who, who were survivors and who got out of there. But it's also true for many people who were either close by and for some people who witness it on, on TV, that some people were so frightened and shaky that they were traumatized as well, but to a lesser degree. And I think the trauma is even greater because this is a different, different type of, a, of an issue. There's a feeling of, of violation, not just that, that the, the towers was bom were bombed and the Pentagon was bombed, but a, a feeling that the country was violated in the same way that a, a, a rape victim feels violated. And in that type of situation, you feel even more helpless sometimes and more powerless, particularly when the enemy is, is obscure and you, you, you feel uh, a, a sense of emptiness and what are, you going to, what are you going to do about it? In a sense, to me, symbolically, knocking out those two towers, kind of phallic symbols, I'm sounding like a psychiatrist, was kind of a symbolic or attempted symbolic castration of the United States. Okay. Something that we have never experienced before and made us feel very, very vulnerable but what do we do with our anger? Okay. That's an important well, ingredient of the grief we're feeling. That, that's the question indeed, and let's try to break it down. And you are a psychiatrist, and I think it probably takes a psychiatrist to see the Twin Towers in that way. But let's move beyond this. You've mentioned several categories. Adults who are in it, adults who were close, or children who were close, people who saw it at a distance. Um, let's quite frankly take advantage of your services here. For those people who were involved in this, who were close to ground zero at the Pentagon um, and at the Twin Trade Towers in New York and their families, what should they do? I think those, those families have to be very supportive uh, of each other. It's a time for them to come together and they should realize that the, the people who were there, the victims, are very traumatized. They have to be very, very patient. I think they, some of them may need more than just support. If they can't function or they get so depressed or they get so anxious, then I think many of them need not just counseling, but they may need medical attention at least for a short period of time to get through the, the anxiety, the fear, and desperation that they're, they're feeling. Do you mean, uh, is, is there a difference here between medical, of course there's a difference between medical Attention well, when and I said medical, in some respect. Uh, yeah, med medical, I was thinking that temporarily, perhaps in some of these cases, people may be in such distress. Like, let's say they're having nightmares, they can't sleep for days and days and days. I think in that type of situation, you might want to prescribe a mild tranquilizer, a mild sedative, so that they can get some sleep and they can get some rest. Or, or you know, even over a longer period of time, if they're very, very anxious and can't get over it, you might prescribe something to take them down a little bit, to take away some of the anxiety and even some of the depression. Some people are going to be very, very depressed after this experience as well. And so you have to make a choice about perhaps what kinds of medic medications would be of help to them temporarily. Do you believe that anybody who feels any sense of trauma in the country, even if they think it's a temporary issue for them, because we all feel some sense of trauma at the moment, that they get in touch with a professional counselor? No, not necessarily. I think the, the main help that people will, will get will be from each other, from the churches, from the community. I think that's the, the first stage of the first step. I think it's only those who don't begin to recover over a period of time. I'm talking about maybe a month, maybe two months, that you would begin to think about getting them 
uh, some type of additional treatment, unless in an individual case they really can't function and they really collapse, then in that type of situation, you have to seek out professional help. I understand completely, I think I understand completely, the people who've been in, engulfed by the violence in a personal way, people who have been victimized by it in a physical way, or the families of such persons, will suffer perhaps the most. But what about the people, not but, and what about the people who've seen this violence at a distance on television, as you mentioned earlier? Well, is that a lasting thing, do you believe, it, is possible? It, it, yes, I think because of the visuals, there were children complaining that from watching television and seeing, seeing the towers go down and the explosions, that afterward they were having nightmares about it. They fear for their own personal safety. We feel very vulnerable. A lot of people are going to be afraid to get on those airplanes again, particularly since many people fear flying anyway. They feel, in a sense, that they can be easily become a victim. It's a different kind of, of uh, horrific ball game that they're in, and they don't know where someone may strike ne next. And I think this raises the anxiety level of everyone in the, in, the, in the country that we're going to have to deal with in some way. And we're trying to deal with it by people coming together, by, by uh, showing respect for the American flag and trying to make people feel uh, very loyal and together and more communal. I think that helps. But I think now that every time we go to an airport, we have to face the additional uh, security there, there's going to be a little twinge of anger about how this all came about. And I think the need for retaliation is a way, in fact, we're thinking of getting rid of some of that anger and getting some revenge on the perpetrators of, of these atrocities. But essentially, essentially, you've talked in very general terms about the need to be in communication with people, a counselor or a family member, a professional church or a community center. Right. Now, on Saturday morning here on ABC, we're going to devote a considerable period of time to trying to answer children's questions about this. But mm -hmm. let me ask you, and I could ask you a hundred questions, as you well know, uh, uh -huh. being a representative of the national patient here for a moment. But let me just ask you one. Mm -hmm. If uh, I'm an adult, is this, this relationship between adults and kids? If I, as an adult, mm -hmm. am, am so distraught about this, how do I talk to my kids? Well, I, I think that if you're very distraught about it, and that's, that's you know, relative uh, type of thing, I think that the adult should try to get some control. Mm -hmm. But I think it's okay to tell your children and let them know that you're upset and you're very distraught by what happened. It's a very normal reaction. And that you can understand that they would be, be very distraught and very upset and very anxious by what happened. But then reassure them that all of you can get through it and in fact they're relatively, that they're safe. That's safe, nothing's going to happen now and this will pass and they will be taken care of. I think we have to reassure the children as much as possible. And I think the adult who is upset, in time, they'll begin to calm down, but I think their upset is normal and something that we should all expect. Uh, people, are, even doctors around the, the medical center uh, yesterday were, were nervous and fearful about, uh, about what happened. And if you know any of the victims, even in a remote way, the anxiety is even greater, no. that it could have been you. So I think that people with time will begin to settle down as we get back to our normal activities and feel uh, less anxious. I have one last question, but I do want to observe that I think that the national spirit, you can confirm for me if you think I'm right, that the national spirit of unity that we think we see apparent in the country today is indeed going to help individuals in many ways. I think it will help in individuals. I don't know how long it will last. I hope it lasts for a very long time and crosses ethnic, racial, uh, and religious lines so people really come together and see what they have in common rather than the divisions that we frequently see in America. And just one other question on the subject of divisions. Every public official today and yesterday has taken note of the Arab American, the Muslim American, and the South Asian American population in the country who are in some respects traumatized two ways. First of all by their American instinct to mm -hmm. what has happened, like everybody else's, I gather, and secondly by the fact that they in some ways as communities are being victimized. So what do they do at a moment That's like right. this? I, well, I think that they have to come together and I think they have to speak out. I think many of them did the right thing. They spoke out and immediately con condemned uh, the terrorism that, that took place. I think that Americans on, on their part have to stop having stereotypes about Arabs and South, Southeast a Asians 
and people from the Middle East because they do have stereotypes about them. And there's a tendency when something like this happens to want to blame someone. And that's when we begin to get scapegoats. And it's very easy to scapegoat people who may be members of the ethnic group, uh, even loosely speaking, of the pe people who committed the ter terrorism. Dr. Busan, let me ask you to stay and look at one piece with us and then get one more comment from you afterwards. Judy okay. Muller, um, who is based in the West for us, has done a piece which at least is represented to me by my editors here as anger. And it takes place in Salt Lake City. Here's Judy Muller's report. Salt Lake City is feeling the ripple effects of terrorism. A bomb threat today forced the evacuation of several city buildings. The bomb scare isn't different, but the world's different now. Everybody's different now. And so even though this may be something that's happened in the past, the past is gone. Fear and frustration, especially for travelers stranded here. The new ticket's being purchased. The two-week-old tickets don't do you any good to buy them in advance. You're still sitting here waiting because there's no buses. I'm upset. I'm supposed to be in Boise for a birthday party at 4 o'clock, and I'm not going to be there. Important birthday party? My daughter's birthday party. Feelings of frustration are giving way to... Anger. These New Hampshire residents are not just angry well, about travel problems. I think our people have been attacked. Um, and it's very, very um, frustrating that you really don't have any place to vent the anger to. Even truckers are finding it tough going because the economy has been affected. Because of the bombings and whatnot, the fuel prices have skyrocketed and I get paid by a percentage, so I refuse to take anything out of here because the freight hasn't gone up. I'll be driving for free. Even though Salt Lake is known for its large Mormon population, it also has a sizable Muslim population of 25,000. Some Islamic leaders here, worried about a backlash of discrimination, are urging Muslim Americans to help in the relief efforts and to donate blood. Even so, Muslim Americans have been victims of prejudice. Some white guy, he pulled up in the Jeep and he's like, where are you guys from? I was like, from Iraq. He's like, I hate you guys. He pulled out the gun, loaded it. And I was like, oh man, I got nothing against you. <laughs> That's terrifying. Yeah, it is. His mother finds it terrifying too. I like uh, United States. It's your country. Yeah, my country. <laughs> yeah. A country that may never be the same, no matter what city you're in. Judy Muller, ABC News, Salt Lake. So, Dr. Poussaint, welcome back for one final question on the subject of anger. Mm -hmm. What do you do? What do you do? If you're I angry, if you I, want to I, strike I, out. I think you're angry. I think you, the best thing to do is to talk about it and say that you're, you're, you're angry. Uh, punch a pillow if you have to. Another way that people let out aggression is to watch sports. In that sense, maybe the NFL should be playing this weekend because so many people let out aggression in front of that TV set, particularly uh, men. You have to channel, uh, channel the aggression uh, and, and the anger. And I think the anger also will begin to dissipate, but there'll be so many reminders as different groups begin to hurt because of not only the terrorism, but the shutdown of the country for so many days and a loss of, of, of income. So it will be, be vented and we should be prepared for it, but people should even let it out at home rather than letting it out in, innocent strangers or trying to find a scapegoat or someone to beat up and blame yeah. uh, for what happened. But, but let's be very clear, when you say let it out at home, you simply mean punch. Uh, yeah, yeah. I, I, I mean talking. Yeah, I mean talking yeah. and out your frustrations, not hitting anyone. Uh, at all, of course. Yeah, thanks very much, Dr. Poussant. It's great to have you here this afternoon. Thanks very much. You've been very helpful. Alvin Poussant, who's a psychiatrist from Judge Baker Children's Center in Boston, been around for a long time. Pretty wise guy. Uh, on the subject of the children, uh, uh, I said we're going to do this program for children on Saturday morning, and people with questions on how to talk to their kids can indeed submit questions to abcnews.com, um, and we will be more than happy to take a look at them and try to include them on Saturday's broadcast. And as I said, one of the things we want to do on Saturday is, is begin to get a real sense of this crisis from the children's perspective. But we had, abcnews.com has a tremendous amount of material, including a whole lot of professionals in every subject uh, that we have been talking about today who are there to answer your questions. And there's a, there's a message board there, as, I, as all of us know, and it's a real chance for people to, to vent, sometimes in a pretty ugly way, but at least in a non-violent way. On the subject of concern, um, Mayor Giuliani just, of New York said just a while ago that he, uh, he wants the public to keep in mind that do not panic when you hear one more report about 
a bomb threat. Yeah, sure, there are a lot of mouthy, bad, dumb people around, but he points out today that 90 bomb threats were made in New York today and not a single one of them was valid. And he also said, this is very important when you go to the website, don't trust the unofficial websites. We said a while ago people are scamming folks in order to get, in order to raise money allegedly for the victims of this disaster. Be very careful at the moment with unofficial websites. Talk a little more about public opinion. Gary Langer, the director of our, of our polling unit. Well, this is a lot different from politics, Gary, when you and I talk and fight so often. Um, we did a snap poll the other day, and I, to be perfectly honest, don't have it immediately available. But I remember you asked questions whether or not people like, such as, would people give up their liberties um, in order for more security? How did they feel about uh, responding if a target be found? How did they feel about the leadership in the country, etc.? Um, is it changing? Or is it pretty constant? It seems pretty constant, and in fact, public opinion in, in, in cases like this tends to be surprisingly stable, changing only as the facts on the ground change, if you, if you will, w w when and if they do. People tend to form opinions that are stable and that move when new information comes out, and there hasn't been a lot of new information that's going to change opinion. So what are you finding in the country at the moment in terms of public attitudes about all this? You know, we see a lot of, uh, in, indeed, a lot of anxiety, as the doctor mentioned, a lot of personal concern, a, a, a sense that this could happen again, a sense that this could happen to me or someone close to me. Uh, and and uh, that fuels, indeed, anger and, and similar emotions. At the same time, we see a, a broad sense of, uh, I think, what can be called national resolve and, indeed, even national confidence. Uh, in that, for example, even the night this happened, we had nine in ten Americans telling us they were confident that the perpetrators, people responsible for this, would be caught. A majority, even very confident of that, and uh, it is uh, confidence in government, confidence in law enforcement. Yeah, even though there was uh, a split in opinion as to whether or not the government could have done more uh, to prevent it, there was nonetheless um, a majority sub uh, belief that m future attacks perhaps can be deterred, and that the perpetrators here can be caught. We also saw over overwhelming support for. Uh, military action against any groups or individuals found to be responsible. Now that could be an expression of anger, but it also could be a, an expression of self-protection as well, an, a, a view that it's necessary to, to protect ourselves. And as I recall, you asked the question in a very specific way, did people support military action if you could identify those who were responsible? At, at first there was a tendency to think the country just wanted to strike out. That seems to have dissipated pretty quickly. Well, precisely. I mean, you need a target, of course. And not only that, but, you know, there have been plenty of cases in which there was not broad public support for military action. Uh, uh, Somalia and Haiti and even Bosnia come to mind. There have been other cases, though, when there is strong and broad support for, for, for military action. Uh, and the Persian Gulf War is a good example of that. And that was support that was very resilient, that held steady, and, uh, and that uh, lasted throughout the many months of that confrontation. We can't predict where this will go, and as facts change, opinion may or may not change as well. But it would be a mistake, I think, to underestimate the resolve of the American public to deal with crises of this time. Well, we, we, we've said often that this is an extraordinary test for a president under these circumstances and we know from the, all of the polling data you provide us all the time that the public is m at, at the very least moderately disenchanted with politicians and with government in general when you ask questions now about trust in government belief in government belief in leadership do they seem to come around indeed you you normally see a rally around effect in times of crisis the people of the public tends to close ranks Good afternoon. This is a Channel 4 News special report. A national tragedy. Attack on America. But this country will not relent until we have saved ourselves and others from the terrible tragedy. That came upon America. President Bush visibly fighting back tears, vowing that America will lead the world to victory over terrorism. And now, you're looking live over New York City, where miraculously, what a story here. Rescue workers have found two firefighters alive inside an SUV deep in the rubble of the World Trade Center. Hello once again, everybody. A special edition of the Channel 4 News. I'm Paul Moyer. And I'm Colleen Williams. We begin with the devastation at Ground Zero tonight, the site of the collapsed Twin Towers in New York City. 
And really, I guess, Colleen, the only bright moment in an otherwise dark day in search for the victims. Despite all the earlier rescue efforts, the crews, as Paul said, have found two firefighters alive in the wreckage. Not five, as we were told earlier, and apparently they've heard some tapping, they believe, from a woman who may be trapped in the rubble here. You are looking at a live picture of Manhattan at the uh, rubble and the search for the victims. The unconfirmed death toll from the attack on Tuesday is climbing toward 5,000 at this point. Now, as for those two firefighters pulled from the rubble, they've been missing since this morning after they were trapped in an air pocket. The rescue work is very slow because some of the top floors of a nearby skyscraper are buckling. We understand that is the American Express building, but there's also a second building that's damaged and structurally unsound. Meantime, President Bush is describing those attacks as, quote, the first war of the 21st century. The president will travel to New York City tomorrow, and commercial airlines are being allowed to fly once again with very limited service. LAX is open at this point. Two flights went in there today, uh, a Delta flight and an Alitalia flight that had been diverted to Calgary. All right, we're going to go now, uh, Colleen, uh, forgive me, to, uh, I'm sorry, are we going to LAX? We're going to Handelsman. LAX. All right, we're going to go to Los Angeles yeah, International Airport now. Here's a news conference about what's going on there. Starting today from LAX. This is in contrast to this over 2,100 normally director. daily flights scheduled here. The air carriers tell us that they plan gradually to resume flights. Each carrier will decide when to resume service and which flights to operate. Travelers are asked, please do not come to the airport. Please first contact your airlines directly for flight information. Some major, air, some major airlines are not providing service today at all. Travelers whose cars are parked in the central terminal area are now free to come and retrieve their cars. They will be charged only up until the time of the incident last Tuesday. Private vehicles remain temporarily prohibited in the central terminal area. Please plan on meeting your arriving passengers in either Lot B, located at 111th Street in La Cienega, or Lot C at 96th Street and Sepulveda. Los Angeles World Airports wholeheartedly thanks each and every one of the public, members of the public, the airlines, and certainly the staff of the City of Los Angeles and our own Los Angeles World Airports for the tremendous amount of cooperation that has been going on since this tragic event. Now that our airports are open again, this will be the last media briefing. We will be able to provide you with additional information later. Or partial collapsing of building facades um, in the area. They don't want to go in in a manner that would endanger anybody trapped in that rubble. Uh, we're just giving you this live picture here of the scene right now, and as we've been telling you, Gary just said, the American Express building is what uh, prompted this latest, when you saw people running, uh, the facade on the building was coming down. That is on the right-hand side of your screen. If you can uh, just take a look a little ways down, and uh, I believe past the, the bigger building there, if I'm correct, right, Gary? Correct. Yeah. So the, that's the uh, situation we're talking about. Let's let's just fill you in on the debate on the day's developments, uh, and as we get more information, because it's coming in as we're talking to you, we'll fill you in on that. But uh, these are some of the updates we have, and I'll have Gary start it off. In a conference call today, President Bush said that he would uh, come to the city tomorrow following a prayer service in uh, Washington's National Cathedral. He's also saying that he's uh, authorizing expedited payment of benefits to the families of New York's fallen officers, both police officers, uh, firefighters, and of course, uh, uh, emergency medical technicians, uh, a dozen of whom are still missing. We heard from the, the senators earlier, and they were talking about a $20 billion package uh, that they're looking for, and obviously that number will go up. It's, it's pretty much been said a blank check uh, would be, you know, given depending on what the need is. $20 billion in damage is the estimate uh, so far. Mm -hmm. That's about the amount of money that the president is uh, going to ask Congress mm -hmm. for. Uh, in terms of just keeping just keeping the recovery, recovery and the rebuilding going. effort and the cleanup effort going. Um, in terms of the investigation, uh, authorities believe as many as 50 people may have been involved uh, in the attacks uh, operating in teams of uh, five or six. They believe that they've, uh, that they've accounted for most of them. They are looking for about 10 right now. Um, not just here, uh, not just in the Boston area or in Maine or in Florida, but actually all across the globe. 
um, Attorney General John Ashcroft uh, says that thousands of agents uh, are all across the world involved in this investigation, maybe as many as 4,000 special agents and 3,000 support personnel. There was a, a report that came out uh, just before 1 o'clock today that federal agents in Florida were looking at uh, several men as suspects in that area. Their investigation had taken them to a car rental company that was in Pompano Beach, and that's where the owner says agents confiscated contracts, receipts, and credit card charge slips on several rentals, and they were all linked to a man named Mohammed Atta. And, uh, they say that he had trained with another man at uh, that, I, I assume that's flight school. That exactly. The, the two flight schools down in Florida, one in Venice and then the other in Vero Beach, Florida. The Justice Department is saying that a number of people who could have some link to the terrorist plot have been detained for having false identifications. They're also saying that officials may soon release the names and possibly the countries of origin for the hijackers that have all been identified. A key piece of evidence in the investigation, the black boxes from any of the four planes have still not been found. The box from Pennsylvania crash might shed some light on whether or not passengers are fully aware of what had already happened at the World Trade Center may have tried to take action in overpowering the hijackers. Locally here, bridges leading into New York are open. The Lincoln Tunnel is open. The Holland Tunnel, though, remains closed since it empties out into Lower Manhattan. We want to take you back right now. Uh, Jeff Simmons standing by at Bellevue Hospital. That is where those firefight. Oh, excuse me. We're going to stick with the live pictures right now uh, as we get updated on the situation. And maybe you can just tell me in my ear who we're, who we're going to head to. These are, these are live... All right, these are live pictures from Bellevue Hospital, and that is where the five firefighters who were uh, buried in that SUV, SUV or the, in the buried SUV, they were uh, taken out. Three of them walked, as you said, Gary, under their own power. Without Unbelievable. A without, a, without a doubt, great news for rescuers who, at least to this point, are aware of the fact that there's, there are more than 300 firefighters that are missing, um, going all the way up to uh, the first deputy commissioner, Bill Feehan. And not to be lost in all this, we're talking about the facade crumbling. Uh, uh, Greg had said maybe there was a report of possible gas leak, but they're also in communication with uh, maybe as many as a couple other people, and one through a BlackBerry pager. Through a BlackBerry pager, uh, being communicating back and forth between um, themselves and rescuers, letting them know if, if, if noise is made, are they getting closer, do they think they're, the, the sound's getting louder, or is it getting fainter? trying to sort of uh, low jack rescuers to their location so they can get out from under that rubble. Ironically, the, the one complaint people usually have about those Blackberries is they can be reached anywhere. And yes, in this case, in it's this the case, best thing. Life saving. Uh, let's uh, continue to talk about the, the situation going on in relative to uh, the traffic situation here. Um, we are being told right now that um, the, the transportation is somewhat in, in mayhem, uh, in, at least on the island of Manhattan, for various reasons. There are various security concerns, and, and people are having a difficult time getting just about anywhere. We see this uh, ambulance here with the Middle Village Volunteer uh, logo on it rolling past our picture in, pulling into Bellevue. You, you see a New York City ambulance already parked with its lights on. That's been just about the only activity um, in the last few hours at Bellevue. We, we can only assume that they are carrying one or more of the five firefighters who were pulled from the rubble literally just moments ago. Is there any way, uh, I'm just going to ask her. Okay, now we're actually uh, switching gear. We're hearing that these firefighters are being taken to St. Vincent. So obviously, this is St. Vincent. So we, we apologize for that. And uh, information just coming in. So if you'll bear with us as, as we get it, we will relay it to you again. Five firefighters, we're talking about St. Vincent's, which... I as you can imagine, there are, there are thousands of people who, literally, there's 4,700 people who are missing. And uh, because the area where all of that information would be found is so unstable, and people are worried, and officials at least are worried, that more people don't get hurt in this process, uh, information coming out it comes out in spurts. Sometimes it comes out in large mass. Sometimes it comes out in a trickle. We are doing our very best to try to, de to, to decipher what um, to decipher which information and what information we can accurately put out to you. What, what I would like to do, maybe we can uh, do this as we're updating people about what's happening. John Schumel was out there and he had also uh, been out at the scene, so at some point we'll go back to him because he had an important story as well. Uh, actually, I'm being told we're going to go to Carrie Lyons, who uh, has, obviously you hear her, we're having a little bit of technical difficulty, but Carrie, can you hear me now? 
Carrie? Yeah, okay, it's Kristen, Kristen, I can barely hear you. I know that you're trying to talk to me, and uh, I'm just going to kind of go with it here. But as we know, there was a, uh, a structure that just collapsed about a half mile down uh, in, the, uh, in the wreckage. And we have uh, with us right now a construction engineer who was down there, and he's going to tell us a little bit about what he saw and what exactly uh, is causing all this extra smoke uh, and dust to come, uh, to come up. Can you tell us what you just saw? Uh, well, the main objective is to remove the north bridge, north pedestrian bridge so that all the traffic can get to the World Trade Center debris. Uh, it appears that part of the pedestrian bridge has just collapsed. And this is the pedestrian bridge that crosses over to Stuyvesant High School. Is that the one you're talking about, right on Chambers? This is the Stuyvesant High School. I'm talking about the further down, right. And was anybody uh, hurt under I'm there? I, I don't know that. But all I know is that I've been inspecting the American Express building uh, because there's a bunch of debris that flew from the World Trade Center building and hit uh, the American Express and penetrated 17th and 21st floor. And now we have to secure all the steel to make sure that it doesn't fall down on top of the Winter Garden. Tell me right now down there what other structures you're worried about falling down and what you're trying to uh, get people away from. Uh, well, yesterday's collapse of the World Trade Center 5 was only partial collapse. So it is a concern that the building is still unsafe and uh, we want to keep people away from that structure. Uh, otherwise, everything that is uh, west of the West Side Highway appears to be in sound condition structurally. What are you hearing about One Liberty Plaza? We're hearing it's about to come down, is that right? Uh, that's, that, that's a concern. There's also a confusion between One Liberty Plaza and One Liberty Place. So I can't comment on that one. So which is the one that uh, right now is not sound? I don't know right now. Okay, and uh, you'll be heading back down there. What, what, what's your role going to be from here on in? I'll be uh, coordinating with uh, all the different construction companies, whether it's Bovis, Amec or Turner, who are being directed under the Department of uh, Construct Design and Construction in terms of all the removal of the debris and, uh, you know, so that fire department can get to the people who are still trapped. Tell us, uh, you, you told me that uh, you talked about the five people, the five firefighters that uh, were rescued. Did you happen to see them uh, walk out of there? Uh, that's a negative. Uh, all I know is that one person was trapped inside an SUV. And when they freed him, he just asked for water and just walked out of the car. A miracle. Yes. Okay, thank you so much for joining us this afternoon. Of course, we've been hearing stories uh, like that all afternoon. Uh, people who come up here and can give us a better sense uh, of what exactly is happening down there. Because we should note that... Uh, that it does seem like security is tightening a bit. It's uh, getting much harder to uh, get down there, though. Our John Shumo, who... Uh, who is uh, with me right now, did spend a, a little time down there today. And John, can you just elaborate a little bit more on what you said? clarify, too, it is One Liberty Plaza uh, that they're talking about, the one that has been in imminent uh, danger for the past two days. And the reason why, as I was trying to explain before, is that large piece of uh, almost the girder actually sticking out of the building. It was several stories high, uh, and it was a large piece of girder, and it was sticking right out, uh, almost coming out of the building uh, like a J, like the, like the letter J, forming out and coming a little bit up. Uh, and, and that is why, obviously, that whole section was clear. When we looked at that one building, uh, we were told to step several, several, uh, you know, feet away. We were behind about, probably about two or three blocks away, in fact, and it was all isolated, and we obviously couldn't get any much closer than that. Uh, that is obviously a building that's in question, and there are several other. I know that we uh, are getting very excited at this point when we hear of a collapse, and people are running, and it, it, it appears to be uh, chaotic, and I'm sure at times it is, but uh, make no mistake about it, this is going to happen uh, a couple more times. Uh, there are Now that I look at some of the buildings, uh, there are some structures that are literally uh, just walls, uh, and those walls will eventually come down. Down, and the crews down there know that, uh, and that is why the sensitive areas, uh, certainly the media was kept further away than the crews, uh, but that is exactly why this is taking place. They know some things may come down, and as a precaution, uh, they're keeping people away. Uh, obviously, there may have been injuries there. This may have been a section of a building that was uh, not expected to come down so quickly, so I'm not necessarily saying no one is hurt. I don't know that. Um, but. Um, Having been down there now for about a half an hour, uh, you can see that it is a large operation, one that covers several blocks, uh, and it is a very controlled operation. Uh, there was Army National Guard, uh, police department, fire department personnel, just about anyone uh, you could possibly think of, Red Cross people down there as well. So uh, we'll continue to monitor this, obviously, and, but uh, right now it looks as if the, uh, the main cloud has subsided. The dark smoke that you see um, shortly after one of these collapses has already subsided, uh, and now we obviously just wait until more information is filtered. Yeah, it's interesting. 
interesting. I, if they didn't think it was uh, it was somewhat safe, uh, they wouldn't have sent more uh, camera crews and more journalists down there. But they they are just about to dispatch them. So we will have more for you here throughout the day. Right now, let's go back to you in the newsroom. We'll say anything. All right. Uh, thanks very much to, to John and Carrie. Just to update, uh, the American Express building, also known as Five World Financial Center, the facade is crumbling or crumbled. And also, Paul, if uh, you could put that map back up for us, we'll try to give you some perspective as to where it is. Now, right. the number one represents, of course, World Trade Center Tower One. The pedestrian walkway that the, that worker was talking about is just to the left, would be just to the left of that box uh, of the one extending across. West Street and the World Financial Center would be on the extreme left side of your screen. That is the part of Lower Manhattan that we are talking about. Also, we are hearing uh, from uh, New York One's Greg Kelly that One Liberty Place, which is uh, toward the lower right side of your screen, is in imminent danger of collapsing completely. But of course, we've been reporting on that now for, for a while. Yeah, Tom was just talking about that. Uh, we are efforting to get uh, Greg Kelly on the phone as soon as we do. We will have that available. Uh, just to recap, the other big story today is the five firefighters who were rescued from that buried SUV getting some uh, conflicting information about where they're headed as soon as they know. Uh, as soon as we know, we'll give it to you, and uh, we expect that at, at some point. But again, the concern now is about some of these structures down there. We were speaking to a, an engineer earlier, and he said uh, he was talking about how to shore up these buildings and also how you balance the rescue effort and recovery effort with you know these facades that are are in danger or and, the structures that are in danger and that is the main concern to make sure that uh, the recovery your actual recovery effort doesn't go counter isn't counterproductive to what your objective is and that is to pulling out people alive mm -hmm. and uh, that added with the, the the suspended or altered subway service concern that the, the vibrations from subway trains might have uh, further compromise some of these buildings. Switching tracks again, Gary, sorry, uh, to the firefighters. We're getting information which is going to be hard for everyone to believe, but two went to Bellevue and three walked away, refused medical treatment. Uh, that is from Bellevue Hospital. That is what we're being told. So if, if that's the case, they're saying that three firefighters walked away from this after being buried for more than 50 hours in a, a sports utility, utility vehicle. vehicle. Uh, absolutely unbelievable. unbelievable. Yeah. The other story of the, of the day is that airline service is slowly resuming at a number of the nation's airports, including, of course, La LaGuardia. But that is taking place amid increased security uh, following the terror strikes. Major airlines are expected to begin limited flight schedules now that federal officials have reopened the nation's airspace. Um, only small crowds are showing up for the day, of course, and travelers are being met by federal marshals, police, and canine units as part of the government's new security measures. Of course, part of the, part of the security measures and the, investi the ongoing investigation is the, is the worry that there may be more teams out there uh, from the group of the, um, of, of the terrorists who, who started this whole thing off in the first place. Right, as you mentioned, they, uh, they believe 50 people involved. They know of 40 or have gotten 40. And then of those uh, 18 hijackers, they believe there was uh, five on some of the planes, four on the others. And uh, they, have, they seem to have it pretty well, naming names and following the leads, but it's taken them as far as Arkansas and Florida. And Arkansas, and Florida, Portland, and, and Canada, Europe. and Europe, and Germany. Uh, the, the investigation, as uh, the Attorney General said, is, is a wide uh, net that, that's being cast with thousands of agents involved. Now, if you are a, an air traveler, just because the airports are being opened, Quite naturally, you, you just can't plan to get on your flight. Officials are saying that you should check uh, with the airlines or the airport itself to make sure that the flight is even actually taking off. And then you should allow plenty of time for some new uh, security measures that are being put in place. There's going to be no curbside check-in, no off-airport check-in of any bags. You're going to have to go to the counter to uh, make sure uh, that your bag um, is going to be checked. You're going to have to be subjected to some personal, probably, searches of those bags, and uh, the hand security metal detectors are going to be used uh, in, in conjunction with the larger uh, body scanners. And if, okay, uh, let's go out to Bellevue Hospital. That's where two of the firefighters were taken who were uh, rescued, and he has got more information from Bellevue for us. Jeff. Kristen, what we know at this point, our producer Rosedale Castillo is inside and has been talking with hospital officials, and they have told her that only two of the five firefighters who've been rescued are coming here at this point. 
that the other three, according to hospital officials, got up and walked away, that they were in good enough shape that they were able to walk away and not go to the hospital. Now, this is not confirmed by other authorities, but hospital officials here are saying that only two of those firefighters just rescued within the last few hours are coming to Bellevue Hospital. Now, a short while ago, we did see two ambulances rush by. There was a lot of expectation over here. We are at the front of the hospital, not near the emergency entrance, so we would be unable to see them as they enter this facility at this point. But this hospital already has treated more than 250 people just in over the last uh, 48 hours. They also saw 82 firefighters, 38 police officers, and uh, 33 of the people who had been brought here except for the two officers who are coming here now, the two firefighters rather, um, are still admitted to the hospital. Now, our producers are inside. They have been speaking with some patients who are being discharged today. The hospital is making them available, and we hope to have some of those inter interviews for you later on this afternoon. And that's all for now from Bellevue. I'm Jeff Simmons, New York One. Back to you in the newsroom. Jeff, if you can still hear me, um, you've, been, you've been there pretty much most of the last two days. There was a time when there was a, an atmosphere that you, there, there that you described where people weren't really anticipating any more live bodies coming in there. Has the arrival of the firefighters changed the mood there a little bit? In fact, it did. Also among the reporters who've been here and speaking to person after person who's come here looking desperately for relatives, not even knowing if they're here even in the city because they're pointing out that their relatives could even have been taken to hospitals in New Jersey or Connecticut. Now, right now, the scene is not like it was before. Shazi, if you could just pan around. I want to give you a sense, Gary. There are still family members who are coming here, and in fact, they are approaching the media, Gary, uh, hoping and expecting that we might have some nugget of information. They're asking us where to go who to talk with at that point. But you are right. That uh, news that uh, signaled some seeds of hope for a number of people who seemed that they were just holding on to just some vestiges of hope at this point. Gary? Thanks a lot, Jeff Simmons. All right, we have uh, some updated information about uh, One Liberty Plaza. That is where their concerns are now about that building, whether it will come down or not. We're told uh, on the Associated Press wires that the top floors of that building are buckling. Uh, that is obviously of concern and we're trying to effort an interview with with greg kelly he was down there and he had seen uh, uh, a number of police officers even running and they were moved out of that area so as soon as we know uh, what is happening there we'll give that to you you see right there on your screen what we're talking about is one liberty plaza to your right it's in the blue there and then we have added now the world financial center so you can see where we're talking about the pedestrian bridge and uh, also five world financial center which is also known as the American Express building. Correct. And the One, One Liberty Plaza is on the lower right side of your screen. Um, reports that the, not really sure how many floors are involved here, it, it's, it's certainly more than 10, um, but uh, the top floors are um, said to be buckling. And if that's the case, um, we can only expect and we can only hope that if it does collapse, that it comes down in a straight line motion, pretty much like the other buildings have come down to minimize the possibility of any further lateral damage to other buildings or putting more people who are in that general area at risk. Let me ask our, our control room, is this the same picture we're, we were just seeing and now there's, it's just smoke filled right now? Or is this a different angle? Okay, this is the same picture that you were just looking at before we put, Liberty, Liberty Plaza is falling right now, so that is why you're seeing that. Uh, that dust coming into the screen. This is the same picture that we were looking at uh, just a minute ago before we put up the map uh, of the area to let you know where everything is located. So word is that one Liberty Plaza is is down um, and this is tape from earlier today. This uh, looks like a view down the west side highway down West Street. Um, if this is the same position where uh, John Schuma was standing from, uh, the World Financial Center is on the, is on the right it's, uh, it's actually that building, the American Express building, toward the uh, left, uh, left side of your screen. We're going back to this live shot now of uh, what we're being told is what's left of, of, one, of um, one Liberty Plaza, which we're being told the top floor started a cascade and that the building there has actually collapsed and completely. It, and you, you were on last night, Gary, and there were concerns then about? Concerns then about the, the possible collapse of it. We were told that it was just the facade. Uh, people were moved back. Greg Kelly was there. Uh, from what he could see, he could really he couldn't get a, a hard look at One Liberty Plaza, but it, all he could see was in the general streets that he wa that, that where he was, the dust 
that was created from the collapse of the facade. It seemed like uh, they had a lot of time that this may be coming down. For ho hopefully, they had right. cleared that area beforehand. But now we're seeing a little bit of the dust start to settle. And uh, what that building is right there, I I'm not sure. You know where we are there, Gare? Um, I'm not sure where the position of this right. particular camera is, but um, I believe it was pointed in the general direction of uh, One Liberty Plaza. Is there any way we can get John Chimo or Greg Kelly on the line with us? Okay. We're working on uh, getting John Shimo as soon as we uh, connect with him. We'll bring that to you. In uh, Let's just update you on the investigation right now so that uh, you know what's happening there. The number two official at the Pentagon is warning that there will be a long-term military campaign. He's not talking about a single strike in retaliation to these terrorist attacks. Uh, the de Deputy Defense Secretary will not say when it would begin, but he's warning it will not end until the terrorists are, quote, defeated. Until then, the military is remaining on high alert all across the country. There is a naval aircraft carrier that's been moved into our waters to provide um, air cover and support. Other warships are also standing by off the East Coast. In terms of what's going on here, in terms of the recovery of bodies, 94 bodies have been recovered at the World Trade Center so far. 46 have been identified, and then there are other 70 other body parts that have been recovered, and Mayor Giuliani along with saying that some 4,700 people have been reported missing on this list, which includes the people who were on those airplanes. Uh, there are 30,000 body bags being made available uh, for what he has said in the past is going to be a catastrophic number of people uh, that will ultimately be recovered and identified. They were giving some numbers earlier and they were saying, to put it in perspective, it's much larger than Pearl Harbor, and in fact, it's uh, larger than Pearl Harbor and the Titanic combined. Not that they, those two events have anything to do with one another, but uh, just to give you some s scope of the enormity of it. Uh, We've heard from both senators uh, on the floor of the Senate today uh, expressing support for a resolution which will basically so sh show complete support for uh, President Bush. There was some concern earlier in the day that uh, the President Bush's version or the White House version of what those powers would be were, were a little bit too extreme, um, and they're trying to work out the details of that now. All right. Um, let's go out to New York once John Schumo, who is at the scene and can maybe give us a little bit more insight on what's going on out there. John? Gary, what I'm going to do is take you through the tour that I just took of the downtown area about an hour ago. So things have changed in the past hour. What you're looking at right now is what we were told as to be Liberty Plaza. You're going to see that piece of equipment right there. That's the girder I was talking about. That is out of this building, as you can see, and that is why authorities are so concerned about the stability of that one building. You can see these American flags that I've been talking about for the past couple of days uh, draped on many buildings down here uh, as this massive, massive uh, rescue and recovery operation is underway. You can almost see in the lower hand of your screen right now how some of the buildings are actually leaning forward, some of the smaller buildings. That is why there was some question as to, to its stability. It is very unclear from our vantage point whether or not that was the building which just came down. Uh, it is very unclear. I can't state that enough times to you how information is very, very slowly making its way out of this enormous uh, epicenter and filtering back to the media through several ways. So I apologize to our viewers for any sort of confusion that these past hour may have caused. But as you can imagine, uh, we are simply trying our best to bring you the most accurate information under very difficult circumstances. Uh, as part of this tour, if we have time, I'll continue to let this videotape roll. We made our way south first, and then of course we made our way west that we were north of the World Trade Center at this point, working our way over what appeared to be Barclay at time, Barclay Street uh, over there. Now you saw some of the debris here. What you're looking at right now is what remains of five World Trade Center. This, of course, one of the several of the trade centers which collapsed. Uh, this was the most striking image we saw. This was the first major, major debris site which we came across. Uh, once again, those American flags pinned on the backs of workers throughout this downtown area. Uh, an eerie sight to say the least. As you see these images, you can get a, 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 an example of just how enormous this is, how difficult this is for the rescue workers. You can see they are dwarfed by the debris, p the debris piles which stand uh, themselves several stories high. Now you're looking also at more right now of Five World Trade Center. Uh, we started heading west after this. Girders uh, sticking out of buildings pretty much uh, everywhere we looked at 
buildings, of course, at the Trade Center. We made our way uh, east at this point, heading over to West Broadway, uh, around uh, Church Street as well. Uh, we will survive, written in ash, carved out of the ash on these buildings. Uh, police cars, as you can see, cars that may indeed have arrived on the scene after the planes hit and before the building came down. Again, this was an escorted tour of the downtown area by the NYPD. Uh, members of the uh, Army were there, the SWAT team I'm pretty sure you're seeing right there and as we continue our walk. Uh, an emotional tour to say the least. We received a couple of applause ourselves from rescue workers who thanked the media for doing their best under these trying circumstances. It seems silly thanking us when we have simply uh, a camera in our hands and perhaps the easiest job to do. The applause and the thanks truly go to those folks as well. The images of the cars you just saw, I don't want to mislead our viewers here. Those cars were stacked on top of each other on purpose. They were not crushed uh, and the, they did not land on top of each other. They were moved there as a precaution as a way to to actually make more room uh, in the streets. Now I'm sure some of our viewers who live in and around this area who uh, who of course uh, work in this downtown area may be concerned about the structures the status of their buildings so uh, we took some video of that as well. Uh, there you see what is left. You can see on the left hand side of the video as I zoomed in there you could see the, uh, what is left of the two larger towers of One World Trade and Two World Trade. This uh, here is an eerie view. I believe I was on Church Street here. Uh, eerie because you normally do not see any sunlight in that area. The sun is, uh, is really blocked out most of the day by the, what was our World Trade Center. Uh, and for the first time I can remember uh, standing on that block, uh, we actually saw the sun. It was. Uh, uh, an odd and sad moment. Uh, again, more cars as we continued our, our walk around. Um, NYPD there, uh, several units there. It was, as a matter of fact, uh, more people than I expected. Um, the debris field, the magnitude was much larger than I expected. Uh, we were being moved uh, along very quickly. I want to take this time right now. Let's go back to our mass cam if we can right now. I want to show you a quick overhead while we shuttle forward our tape here uh, in the truck. We were able to talk briefly with some people as well uh, along the route, people, rescue workers who were who were um, showing pictures they found, pictures they found along the way, uh, various uh, pieces of debris that they were collecting, so to speak, in an effort to maybe one day uh, return it to the rightful owner or at least family members of the rightful owner. One person from Verizon uh, found a picture on the floor of a couple and he said someone wants this picture uh, and he was going to hold it uh, at Verizon. Uh, the chances of that picture ever finding its way back uh, to its rightful owner obviously uh, next to nothing but he was holding out hope the little that that one man could do uh, as so many men and women are down there right now uh, staring at the unthinkable and doing their best of course to try to make things uh, a little bit better church of saint peter a familiar area down on barclay uh, you're going to see in a moment i'm pretty sure uh, what what was uh, remaining of the church the church appears to be fine from the outside uh, structurally obviously i'm not an expert and cannot tell but the church uh, appeared to me to be fine. There were rescue workers and some relief people actually sitting on the steps, as you saw uh, moments ago. But uh, in a few seconds, I'm pretty sure you should see what remained, or less certainly a symbol of what was uh, uh, a lot of people pointing out to us as we went down there. It is the cross on top of, uh, of the church. Now we're going to get to that in just a moment. There it is, uh, the sun peeking through on what otherwise would have been a beautiful day um, as uh, many people pointed it out. Uh, the people who were working on top uh, at the church at the foot of the stairs were saying, uh, look up at that. Uh, that's why we're still here. Uh, more ambulance, more debris. Uh, Gary and Kristen, feel free to, uh, to ask any sort of questions you may have. There you see uh, 99 Church Street, which of course is Moody Investors. Uh, that building appeared from my, uh, again, not too knowledgeable eye as far as engineering is concerned, appeared to be sound uh, as well. Gary and Kristen, if you have any questions. John, besides the epicenter of, of World Trade Center 1, 2, and 7, which we know are collapsed, uh, are there any rescue efforts being conducted peripherally in, in other buildings that you're aware of? Not to our vantage point, no. Uh, I'm sure they are taking place, but uh, from our vantage point, we really could not see too many of the, uh, of the actual people on the debris. As a matter of fact, I didn't see any uh, people inching through debris. We were kept at a very safe distance, uh, as you can imagine, uh, a very controlled 
walk through. You can see some of this uh, this, this donut truck abandoned uh, as uh, as people, I'm sure, ran for cover. This, I'm pretty sure, is going to be the end of our tape. Uh, this man uh, trying to trying to get a few mo moments. Maybe he's reflecting here, or maybe he's uh, exhausted, like uh, most of us down here are. Gary, Kristen. All right, John, thanks very much. So let's just update you on the situation downtown. Uh, the American Express building, two buildings in jeopardy. The American Express building, that's in the World Financial Center, obviously been evacuated. It is at the northeast corner of the World Financial Center. And on the right of your screen, it is the one, which I don't think you can see, with the pyramid shape on top, if you, people are familiar with downtown. You can't see it from, from this right. particular shot, so but you, you have, we have shown it to you at, at, at other points. And we can go to that other more, we can go to that other lower shot that we were If you're, okay, we don't have that right now, but if you're, if you're looking north, and for people who work down there, they mm -hmm. know which one we're talking about. Also, One Liberty Plaza, also in danger of buckling. We're told that the uh, top floors are in jeopardy. Okay, here we go. Here's a, this is um, American Express um, in the World Financial Center. That is what we were reporting. It's 51 stories tall. And it is the pedestrian walkway that, was, that used to connect World Trade Center Tower 1 and that building that was actually brought down. We're being uh, led to believe, based on the interview that we conducted there earlier, that it was um, brought down on purpose so that rescue and recovery vehicles could get into that area closer to the epicenter. All right, let's, while we watch that situation develop, also looking at the, uh, the five firefighters who were rescued earlier today, two of them brought to Bellevue, we're waiting for word from uh, medical officials there on their conditions. We'll continue to just give recap the day. Earlier this morning, the mayor held a, a news conference, and I imagine we'll be hearing from him in a little bit, but he did announce that uh, 4,763 people were reported missing. He can subtract five from that number right now with those firefighters who were found. Um, and he also said it could turn out that we recover fewer than that, and it could be more. He said he just simply doesn't know the answer right now, which is understandable. The uh, fire commissioner said rescue workers uh, remained optimistic despite all that uh, was there. And even this morning, he was saying there's a good probability there are people in that building who are alive. So he said it's not to not only a recovery operation, which would he was proved right uh, this afternoon. Meanwhile, authorities continue to hunt for accomplices in this attack. And, and Gary, I'll let you take that. They have uh, made a number of arrests. So, made it, so far, they have uh, detained a number of people who they believe have some link to the terrorist plot. Um, they've been uh, detained for having false identification. Um, the Justice Department says that they may soon uh, release the names of the people they believe who are directly involved. They believe that they've identified just about all um, but ten of those people and they are searching and scouring uh, not just the, the country for them but uh, all of Europe um, for them since it was believed that many of them may have come through uh, Canada and they believe all with links to uh, terrorist fugitive Osama bin Laden. The president will be in our area tomorrow. He's going to take a tour. He'll be at the uh, National Cathedral tonight for a prayer service there or, or tomorrow. Um, the U.S. Senators, Hillary Rodham Clinton and also Charles Schumer from New York, toured the area yesterday. They were expected to meet with the president sometime this afternoon. They also spoke on the floor um, of, of Congress. And uh, as we continue to talk, we'll just show you this live picture that we're getting from downtown. And as a reminder that this didn't just happen here, uh, crews at the Pentagon, uh, according to officials, have, have switched from rescue to recovery. Officials there saying that the casualty estimate right now is standing at about uh, 200 dead. Uh, Arlington, Virginia fire uh, chief is saying that the effort to retrieve the bodies um, will be a long-term process. The, the day, uh, first uh, major thing was uh, the Staten Island was pretty much blocked off. That was around 9 o'clock this morning or 9.30 because they felt like they had seen a suspicious vehicle and uh, it turned out no arrests had been made in that. But at one point, all four bridges, entrance and exit from shut, that shut, shut down. Well, all, four, all four bridges in any way off, or on or off the island were, were isolated. Um, also hearing, we also heard reports earlier this morning that um, two men who were on Liberty Island uh, during the time of the uh, of the of the attacks on World Trade Centers one and two by the aircraft uh, were what were detained because they were seen celebrating as the aircraft uh, went into 
as they went into the buildings. We still had, we don't have any updated information on the status of, of those two individuals. And then they were looking for someone in Bayonne, New Jersey, and pretty much had, had blocked that area off as well. So those are some of the developments today. Also, throughout the day, we've been getting numerous reports. Some we've been giving you, some we have not, of, of bomb scares and bomb threats. Uh, LaGuardia was evacuated for a little bit. There was a situation at Grand Central Terminal. Both, thankfully, turned out to be nothing. Uh, but we're choosing to report them to you some of them and some of that we have to be very careful because we don't want to alarm people. For another update, now we're going to join New York One's Annika Pergament, who is here in the newsroom. Annika? All right, uh, quite a bit to tell you about going on. First of all, the New York City Board of Ed uh, announced that all evening and after school programs citywide have been canceled for today uh, as well as tomorrow, Friday. Um, Okay, I want to move on now. Uh, Amtrak uh, is giving us an update here. Uh, first of all, they're telling us that because uh, there are so many rest FAA restrictions regarding flights uh, and uh, a, a Red Cross having trouble getting some materials into the New York area, they've provided trains to transport uh, m emergency materials uh, such as um, uh, masks and wa bottled water and that kind of stuff to the New York area. Uh, they are also increasing their capacity by uh, 30 percent in the northeast corridor and um, they are also uh, reaching out to the airlines to assist family and friends of victims who want to travel to the New York area but are restricted to because there uh, is no air service right now. Uh, information on Amtrak, you can call this number and it's an easy one to remember, it's 1-800-USA-RAIL. Okay, moving on. Um, there are a number, number of memorial services that are already beginning, and I want to tell you about a few of them um, that have been uh, that are being organized around the city. Uh, tomorrow at 7:30 p.m., there is an interfaith memorial service sponsored by the Park Avenue Christian Church and Temple of Universal Judaism, and that is at 1010 Park Avenue. That's at Park Avenue at 80 Fifth Street. Once again, that's at 7:30 p.m. at uh, 8 p.m. tomorrow night, there's going to be a candlelight prayer vigil at our Savior Lutheran Church, um, and that is in Jamaica, Queens. The address there, 9004. 175th Street. Um, they are also having one at that same location at 4 p.m. on Saturday. Um, there, there's no time yet, but there's a funeral um, f uh, for uh, the FDNY, and that's at St. Francis Assisi Church at West 31st Street, um, and that is going to be on Saturday as well. We'll give you the update on that, but that's going to be Saturday afternoon sometime. Sunday at 5.30, two masses at St. Patrick's Cathedral, Cardinal Egan, uh, has planned two special masses um, for those who are died, for those who are mourning, and those injured, and all of those who served in this rescue effort. On Monday, uh, Cardinal Egan has planned another mass that is scheduled for 5.30 p.m., and it is for the men and women of all of the uniformed services who have given their lives. Um, United Way has gotten fifteen million dollars in donations to date to aid the families of the victims uh, so what they are doing is they have set up a toll-free hotline for anybody who wants to donate money uh, it is called the September 11 fund um, the hotline uh, you can you can donate two ways there's a hotline and there's a website I'll give you the hotline first which is an 800 number 1-800-710-8002 uh, their website is www.uwnyc.org, the United Way of New York City. Um, okay, moving on now. Uh, the Bar Association is saying that it will make its offices on West 44th Street available to lawyers who were displaced. A thousand lawyers, about, they say, worked in the World Trade Centers. Um, they are also providing free legal advice to anybody who might need it um, regarding estate planning, insurance matters, and so forth. And uh, the New York Bar Association, you can contact them at 212-626-7373. Uh, um, NASCAR, this is, I, I'm just giving you some sporting events updates. Many of them are canceled. The, the latest one is the NASCAR uh, canceled Sunday's Winston Cup in New Hampshire. Um, all right, the uh, construction union, construction workers unions are putting out some information. They are urging uh, workers to go back uh, to report directly to their current sites if they have not been assigned to help downtown. Um, they don't need to be doing that. They will be contacted if they're needed downtown. In the meantime, uh, their unions are asking them to report to their sites. Um, 
There is a place near the Lexington Avenue Armory where so many people are going. It is that bereavement center that has been set up, and it is called the Olive Leaf Wholeness Center. It is a sort of spa um, area down there, and they are providing free uh, respite for victims' families and rescue workers. Um, if somebody feels that they want to just go in there um, and, 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 and try to... Uh, relax a little bit or, or just to get away but not entirely leave the area. That address is on uh, East 23rd Street between 3rd and Lexington. It's 145 East 23rd Street and it's called the Olive Leaf Wholeness Center. That's a, a free service that they are providing. Um, Finally, uh, a lot of people concerned about pets who may have been left um, in evacuated buildings in the downtown area um, and people also concerned about pets um, who have been, uh, who, who belong to people who are now missing and might be trapped in apartments. You can contact the ASPCA for that. Uh, if you're trying to get into a downtown building and you're concerned about a pet, or if you have medication there that you're unable to get at a pharmacy elsewhere and you need to get into your apartment, Battery Park City has a website that will give you a lot of information for that. The, the address uh, online is uh, Battery parkcity.org. They are saying that people should report to Pier 40 where they can be escorted in. Uh, Pier 40, which is at West Houston or Clarkson Street uh, along the Hudson River there, and they will be escorted in. But of course, you might want to check on the websites for specifics because, as you know, uh, it's not too easy to get down to what Pier 40 at this stage of the game, considering that uh, everything is really frozen um, in that area. One more thing I want to tell you about people who have been displaced and have nowhere to go, uh, looking, need assistance with renting an apartment temporarily or for the long term. Uh, when realtor Douglas Element sent us a fax, they are waiving fees um, and providing assistance in finding short term housing. Um, and uh, you can contact them um, at 705. 1040. That's 212 705 1040. Once again, uh, probably the most significant for parents in the city is that all after school programs citywide have been canceled by the Board of Ed today and tomorrow. Classes, we are told, will be on schedule though tomorrow. They won't, they won't be uh, starting with that delay that they had today, except for, of course, classes canceled still in New York City schools below. 14th Street. All righty, I'm going to send it back to you guys. When I have more updates, I'll bring them to you. Thank you very much, Annika. We'll check in with you later. All right, we're going to move ahead and, and check in with Andrew Siff. I just want to tell you before we do that, we're going to keep a picture in the upper left-hand side of your, on the upper left-hand side of your screen. That is the live picture for looking down downtown, uh, just to keep an eye, because as we've been telling you, that one Liberty Plaza is in danger of buckling. And uh, just to, to give you an idea, We'll, we'll keep that picture up and bring it to you if there's any information on that. But let's check in now with Andrew Siff. He's covering the investigation portion of this and uh, a number of press conferences this morning, one by the Attorney General and the other by uh, Colin Powell. So, Andrew, what do you have for us? Well, Kristen Gary, more and more it appears the suspected terrorists were very close to home for quite a while before Tuesday's attacks. These are men who trained to fly in the U.S., got driver's licenses in the U.S., taught other suspected terrorists to fly here in America, and may have stayed at hotels in the New York, Boston, and Washington areas, even though they were on the FBI's terrorism high alerts list. There has been a search today, in first on Staten Island, then in Bayonne, New Jersey. The terrorism task force searching for two men and a car registered to Mohammed Atta. He's one of the terrorists suspected of hijacking one of the four planes Tuesday. Senior government sources tell us the men wanted for questioning are suspected to have ties to the bin Laden organization. 33-year-old Mohammed Atta, a trained pilot whose driver's license was recovered and lists an address in Florida, Atta is believed to have been one of the renegade terrorists on Tuesday. And Attorney General John Ashcroft now says the number of terrorists per hijacked flight varied slightly. The total number of hijackers to our best uh, estimate and our best knowledge given the information at this time on the four planes that crashed was at least 18 unless contradicted by uh, evidence which uh, we wouldn't anticipate. Uh, two planes had five hijackers and two other planes had four hijackers each. There has also been a person arrested in Germany, a known lieutenant in the Bin Laden organization who lived in South Florida until January of this year. There is also now a manhunt on for Mataz al-Halak, an associate of Osama bin Laden last seen three days ago in Texas. There are literally dozens of suspects in this case, with federal authorities trying to seal off all the exits, all the means of escape from the U.S. 
The FBI questioning people all over, including a man and woman in Arkansas after finding paper bags in a car filled with computer equipment. No word yet on a link between that equipment and Tuesday's attacks. The FBI is not characterizing exactly what all the detained people have been questioned about. As a result of following up leads, we're interviewing a number of people. And in the course of doing those interviews, we find that a number of the individuals, when asked for identification and the like, are out of status. And when we find somebody out of status, we quite obviously bring in the INS and they are detained. And that is the policy and procedures we are following. We haven't yet publicly identified the organization we believe was responsible. But when you look at the list of candidates, uh, one resides in that region. So without waiting for the whole body of evidence to be ready for us to make a judgment and a presentation to you, I think we're acting in a prudent way by talking to those governments in the region. Secretary of State Colin Powell going on to say that Osama bin Laden is considered a prime suspect in all of this. Earlier, we learned that federal investigators believe at least 50 people took part in planning the attacks. Just 40 of those are so far accounted for. Two dozen believed to have died or slightly less than two dozen as you heard the number now 18 in the four hijacked plane crashes with approximately four to five hijackers on each flight. 27 of the 50 suspected terrorists in the planning were trained pilots. We are told many taught at flight schools in Florida. New York One senior government source telling us at least two suicide notes were found from suspected hijackers in the World Trade Center attacks. Investigators have also linked credit card receipts to the attacks. In Boston yesterday, a man was taken into custody at a hotel downtown, allegedly charged some of the plane tickets to his credit card. Also yesterday, FBI agents detained five men in East Rutherford, New Jersey, after getting tips they were seen watching the attacks from Liberty Island and celebrating. They were taken into custody by the INS. Again, the FBI not characterizing what these folks are being questioned about. And yesterday afternoon, FBI agents searched the Newark Airport Marriott. It's believed two suspects spent the night there before the attacks. President Bush, who is scheduled to visit New York tomorrow, says this is the first war of a new century. Uh, the nation must understand this is now the focus of my administration. We will be very much engaged in domestic policy, of course. I look forward to working with Congress on a variety of issues. But now that war has been declared on us, we will lead the world to victory. Several other names have been linked to the investigation, including Shatan Sukami, a Saudi national who was on American Airlines Flight 11 and who... Back and forth. I continued to walk south then in through that World Trade Center plaza, and I don't know if the camera shows it yet, but there was a chilling statue there of a, of a metal man that carried a tribute to the heroic rescue workers who worked there. And after seeing that, I continued to walk south where there's far more damage. That South Tower had the most damage, Peter. Um, and we saw at that area, great deal of rubble. Uh, the flag that you were talking about, an assembly line of workers that had, had planted a flag right in the middle of the rubble that was very reminiscent of the, that statue we've all seen of, of Iwo Jima. Crushed cars, buildings all throughout that plaza were devastated. I would say the buildings on the south side were those that had the absolute most um, damage, the most devastation. And finally, Peter, the work just continues, even though everyone is on a hair trigger, even as I was there late this afternoon on Pine and Cedar Street, all of a sudden at around four o'clock, there just came this word, evacuate, evacuate. People thought one of the buildings was going to come down. It was a false alarm. George, is there any change in the pace of the operation between what you saw today and yesterday? It seemed to be about the same, Peter. There, it, I, I will say it seemed a little bit more organized. Yesterday when I was walking through that area, except for the main work in the middle where the cranes were working, a lot of other groups were, were working on their own almost in small posses, people going out in gangs of three and four to look through peripheral parts. Of the, of the World Trade Center Plaza. Today it seemed far more organized, and Peter, there was far more security today around the entire uh, perimeter, and everyone did seem to be even more nervous about possible building uh, collapses. And finally, Peter, today, one other big problem that is affecting not only this plaza, but the whole downtown area today is far more smoke 
than we've seen uh, before. I don't know if you can get a flavor of it no, uh, over my so. shoulder, shoulder right now, but we ran into many uh, families, even though they have been allowed by the police to live here. We saw them leaving with luggage, with their pets. They're saying, we just can't take it anymore. Our kids don't feel safe. And they've been told that the smoke is going to get worse. So they're just evacuating, even if they're not forced to. George, um, you mentioned Trinity Church, and you went by it very quickly. It is, uh, it, it was, that's a church that goes back, I think, to 1846. Um, has it been damaged, or just has rubble fallen into its gardens? Amazing, Peter. The, the church looks completely intact, except covered with this fine layer of soot and smoke. But what's so eerie about it is there's many trees, as you know, in that graveyard, and they're all littered with debris. The, the papers, the shredded papers just hanging from the branches, and then they've just covered the entire graveyard, except standing tall and straight. In the middle of that graveyard is still the stone of Alexander Hamilton. George, just, just stay with us for a second, because going to go on and talk about a couple of other things. Very interesting about Trinity Church. In, in, in the 1840s, it was regarded by, by New York City as, as a beacon of hope for ships sailing into New York Harbor. And the New York mayor of the day used to refer to it as the glory of our city. Um, I don't know what it says that stand. I mean, it's, it's standing, and many of the more modern buildings have fallen down. That's no comment on, on structural uh, in, integrity. But uh, people who come to that part of New York uh, just notice that Trinity stands out uh, in an incredible way as the representation of another era in many ways. Um, we, we talked uh, to Cynthia McFadden a little earlier about this, this notion that the volunteers need things like boots. She mentioned boots, gloves, hard hats, goggles, oxygen, baby powder, and neosporin. Uh, ointment for one thing and there there was she described to us an acute shortage or an awareness of a shortage on the east side we suggested maybe the federal emergency management agency should should handle this turns out they didn't know about it uh, uh, Cynthia's just talked to them to their representative in New York they didn't know about it we asked them whether or not they should handle this or how do they feel about a public appeal for issues like this and they have promised to get back to us as quickly as they can but it is quite stunning after hearing from government officials for a long period of time that they have everything they need to hear from our reporter on the street that people are coming and asking for things which they say they need very badly so message um, at least delivered to officialdom if by any chance uh, they're listening to this broadcast uh, back to you uh, George again um, were you, how close were you able to get to absolute ground zero today in terms of that place which we can see from where you are now currently standing? And secondly, what is all that smoke today? Is it current or is it just enduring? No, it's current, Peter. Earlier in the day, a very large fire broke out, one of the largest, according to rescue workers who were on the scene. I think it, it, it broke out near the south tower and that's been creating a lot of the smoke so far you know this is like one of those charcoal fires i hope that's not an inept analogy but when you turn over one of the coals or you 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 turn something over it can lead create oxygen for the fires and that's i think what's happening in many of the areas on top of the rubble i got i would say about a hundred yards uh from the rubble particularly near uh tower five uh of the world trade center we got quite close to tower five right up to the lobby of the Millennium Hotel. And as I mentioned, that was one of the most surprising things to me. As I said, the, the, the building does not look to be in good shape at all. On the other hand, there are workers all around it and even right up leaning against the building. So, so at least those at the very center of the action at the, mo at the half hour or so that I was there didn't seem uh, too concerned. But there was an awful lot of smoke all over the place. And uh, one other difference from yesterday, Peter, that I could tell, Lower Manhattan has become something of a maze. Every other street, some streets are open, some streets are closed because the streets may develop problems on their own. A suspected gas main uh, may be breaking. Uh, people feel they may be in, in the path of a building that might be falling. So there's no um, definite pattern to the, to the streets right now. They're open and closed on and off. It changes every 15 minutes. One other remarkable thing I saw today, Peter, uh, the dust has become occasion for, for graffiti artists of all kind. And I don't know if we're going to be able to show this, but I hope at some point we'll be able to show some of the graffiti that people are now writing in the dust. Obviously, very mm -hmm. strong messages like vengeance and mine is mine. But the most striking one I saw was something that I think captured what might be a debate going on in the country right now. One person had come along and written, forgive them, they know not what they do. 
a second had come along, crossed out the knot, and said, kill them. So they knew exactly what they were doing, according to that person. Thanks very much, George. Incidentally, that Trinity Church shot that you had, that's the current Trinity Church, or the present Trinity Church. That goes back uh, uh, to uh, the 1840s, but the original one was built in the 1690s and has been a beacon at the corner of Broadway and Wall Street uh, ever since then. Uh, Lisa Stark. Lisa Stark on information yes, about Kennedy Airport today through your sources in aviation. Uh, Peter, I've heard from government sources that apparently four gentlemen, four passengers, were arrested uh, today, late today, as they tried to board an airplane at uh, New York's JFK Airport. They were taken off that plane or taken off as they tried to board the plane, both by a Port Authority police and by the FBI. We have no word on what type of plane it was. It was a United Airlines plane, we know that. We don't know what type of jet. We don't know where it was headed. We don't know the key question why these four passengers were arrested, were taken off by the FBI and police. But they were taken off as they tried to board this plane, and a ground stop was immediately put into effect at both New York area airports, both LaGuardia and JFK. Okay, thanks very much, Lisa. You answered two questions there. It may, may in one case be jittery officials and maybe even somewhat more legitimate. They, I noticed they did not take the Speaker of the House. I believe he's right over here to our right. Yeah, he's I just can't, down, he's the, just the, down the way there. The Speaker was evacuated on Tuesday immediately as soon as they knew about the Pentagon incident. Uh -huh. Does that tell us something that he's still standing here? Does that tell us that they don't take this as seriously? Well, they've got a package that they're looking at. Basically, that's what this tells us. And uh, I suspect that it'll be cleared and we'll be back in there to finish our briefing soon. Judy, okay. I'll send it back to you. Kate, it's sounding like uh, the, the members of Congress we've been talking with, Senator McCain earlier uh, and uh, John Carl saying uh, he was talking to uh, Senator Daschle and others, uh, they seem to be taking this very much in stride, although as we watch it, it as you point out, Kate, this is only the second time, uh, within, and it happens to be in the span of just a couple of days, that the United States Capitol has had to be evacuated because of a threat that they take seriously. Now, granted, we're in a much uh, more sensitive time right now, given what happened Tuesday. But uh, I can uh, tell you, Judy, that the, the Capitol, I talked to the Capitol Police this morning about security here. Yesterday, there was a perimeter that had been drawn around the Capitol, about one block to the east and the west, and two blocks to the north and the south of this whole area. Now, that has been changed, Judy. There is no longer that perimeter. They had moved it in this morning. When I came in at 6 o'clock this morning, they checked my car very carefully. They used mirrors to look underneath the cage of the car, which is something new. However, there was no perimeter any longer, so they had ramped down a little bit on security a little bit earlier today. Uh, that's, that's what I can Kate, tell you, but that is more than they usually would do. Judy? Kate, what are the restrictions? Who can actually come on the grounds of the Capitol and go into the building now? I mean, I know that tourists go in there, reporters go in, who, who can get in and out? I have my pass on me right now, but there is a press pass that I carry with me at all times. That shows these guards that I'm legitimate and that I work here and that I can bring my car in. I also have a tag on my car. Uh, that's typical. All of the members uh, have press identification. They have buttons that they wear. All the staff have identification. Those are the people that can come into the buildings. Now, normally, Judy, tourists can also come into this area. Normally, they can also go into the building. Today, that has not been exactly the case. Uh, I think they've been allowing tourists in, escorted. They've not been doing tours of the Capitol. So it's been a little bit more secure than normal. On a normal day, if you're a tourist, you have to go through magnometers, you have to go through uh, uh, detectors to make sure you don't have any weapons. There's quite a bit of security here on a day-to-day -day basis. Right now, it's a little bit more than it normally would be, but less than it was two days ago. Judy. All right, Kate Snow at the Capitol, where members of Congress evacuated, everyone else in the Capitol evacuated because of a threat, a suspicious package. At the White House, also increased security in the aftermath of Tuesday. Let's go there now, and our senior White House correspondent John King. John. Judy, increased security and what most Americans certainly will see is some dramatic steps just in case the White House is saying, but dramatic steps nonetheless. We have been told repeatedly in recent days about the increased security around the White House. We are now told that Vice President Dick Cheney was taken from the White House complex earlier today and ushered up to Camp David, the president's retreat in 
in the mountains in Maryland, a very secure area. That we are told to get a good distance between the president and the vice president because of what sources describe as yet another threat on the White House grounds. We reported earlier today that they had extended the security perimeter, again, outside of the White House. Obviously, they have not evacuated the White House. We are still here, as, as is the president of the United States and his senior staff. But we are told as a precaution, they decided they did not want the president and the vice president together on the White House grounds. So the vice president was moved up to Camp David. We are also told that there are plans for the president himself to go to Camp David this weekend, where the vice president will be as well. So the president and vice president John. will be together later. Judy, go ahead. John, the question is, if there's a threat, why wouldn't they put the president at Camp David and leave the vice president at the White House if the threat is at the White House? Well, Judy, they don't want to answer all of our questions about this, obviously, because of the security measures involved and the fact that we are all still here, that they have not evacuated the president, not evacuated the senior staff, would obviously lead us to believe that they are, do not view this as an immediate and perhaps not as an overly credible threat, should I say. But just as you see the evacuation of the Capitol, just as we have seen extraordinary measures around the White House in recent days, they have no choice, they say, but to take these things seriously and to take some steps in response to them. I would also note, and I don't want to go too far here because we know some things we don't want to tell our viewers because some of our viewers might be of ill intent. There are facilities here on the White House grounds, if necessary, in which the president would be safe, at least they believe he would be safe, from a nuclear attack. So there are places here on the grounds of the White House where they could take the president if necessary, and indeed where the vice president, when the president was out of town the other day, did indeed go to a command and control bunker that is believed to be nuclear proof here on the White House grounds. Seems ominous to be talking about these things, but this is the circumstances we find ourselves in in the 60 hours since these deadly terrorist attacks. Again, the White House saying this was a precaution, but the vice president has been moved to Camp David. Indeed, uh, look at what these terrorists have wrought, not just the World Trade Center, not just the Pentagon and Pennsylvania, but look at what it has meant in terms of shaking up uh, the nation's capital. Now back to Atlanta, Bill and Joey. Judy, thank you. Many people said we're going to wake up to a new America on Wednesday morning after the attacks on Tuesday, and I think this is a reverberation of that, about echoing what Jeff was saying about different threats being called, and all of which has been bogus to this point, and we don't mean to underscore what's happening. But a certain uh, or diminish what's happening in the capital. Yeah. And, and if you think back five years ago, Joey, here in the city of Atlanta in July of 96 when the Olympic Park bombing took place across the street here, uh, that Saturday, it happened on a Friday night, that Saturday and Sunday, there were threats all over the city of Atlanta. Shopping malls and our subway stops here in town and shopping malls downtown all turned out to be just that. Un bogus. Unfortunately, there are people who would like to take advantage of the worst right. of situations. On, though, the level of concern and a still developing story at this this hour, the closure of the New York airports, at least a ground stop at the New York airports because of concerns about some FBI activity today. Patty Davis is following that part of the story now, and she joins us now from Washington again. Patty. Hello, Joey. Well, the, F, uh, the FAA has ordered a ground stop at all three airports, uh, that's New York, LaGuardia, and Newark, uh, in the New York area. Uh, they're saying that is due to FBI activity. Now, what that means, a ground stop meaning that flights are not allowed to take off at those airports. Also, flights that are scheduled to come into those airports not allowed to take off from their originating points. Now, the FAA says uh, on, a, on a call just a moment ago that there apparently have been arrests, and we're trying to confirm that. Earlier today, LaGuardia Terminal, uh, the central terminal building, was evacuated due to a scare. A man, uh, according to the Port Authority of New York, uh, made what was interpreted as a threat about a device uh, in his bag. That turned out to be unfounded, but that person was arrested. Now, this apparently involves different FBI activity, different incidents. We don't know exactly what the scope of those incidents are at this point, but there is a ground stop now in place at the three New York airports. Joey? CNN's Patty Davis for us in Washington again. So there are two developing mm -hmm. stories at this hour that we're watching quite closely. What Patty was talking about, the, clo the uh, ground stops mm -hmm. at the airports, all three of the big airports mm -hmm. there in New York, as well as the situation in mm -hmm. the Capitol. Yeah, watching the Capitol, Judy Woodruff informing us both houses of Congress have been evacuated. These are your congressmen and women standing on the lawn outside the Capitol building. The Senate and the House have been evacuated. We will follow this after a bomb threat was issued there. Some reports that a suspicious package was picked up and a dog had what's called a positive hit on that. In other words, 
the dog sniffed the possibility that that package could be more than just an empty package there on Capitol Hill. We will watch that. Any developments we see here, certainly we will bring you the very latest as we get it. Of course, the terror strikes in Washington at the seat of the nation's political and military power, as well, of course, in New York at the seat of the nation's the world's financial power, and that is really causing some ripple effects to the financial community. We do know the stock market scheduled to open now Monday morning, 9.30 a.m. East Coast time, and for more on that, here's Lou Dobbs back in Manhattan. Lou? Bill Joy, thank you. Good evening, everyone, and uh, as we begin tonight, uh, we want to tell you that the three New York airports, less than eight hours after having been opened, have now been closed at the order of federal authorities. We are told that arrests have been made at JFK Airport, the international airport here in New York. We have no further information about who the arresting authorities were or who has been arrested, but we, of course, here at CNN will be bringing that to you as soon as we learn the details. And, of course, the U.S. Capitol has been evacuated, as we have now been reporting, the vice president being moved to Camp David as a precaution, and we will keep you fully informed on those developments as well. 30 blocks behind me, the devastation that was the World Trade Center. Rescue workers now into the second day of their efforts, working relentlessly to free whoever is buried there, alive or dead, from the debris. Their grim search for survivors goes on just two blocks away from there. Leaders from all of the various stock exchanges and the brokerage houses met today. They decided to reopen the markets Monday morning, 9.30, the four-day closure is, by the way, the longest closure of the New York Stock Exchange since the Great Depression. And those stocks, of course, traded on the exchanges by people. Sadly, some of those people no longer with us. Reopening those markets as soon as it is safe and it is sensible is essential, if not critical. And a lot of people are working very hard tonight under the most difficult circumstances imaginable to do so. Christine Romans has the story. Christine? Lou, Wall Street will take another weekday to dig out and to mourn and a full weekend to test its systems before getting back to business, they hope, on Monday morning at 9.30 Eastern Time. The chaos outside the New York Stock Exchange, it's turned really into an eerie quiet. Security here, very tight. Police on nearly every street corner, but uh, there are still worries about unstable buildings in this area. Traders here have never seen stocks closed for four straight weekdays in their time. And for nearly 60 years, an unwritten rule has prevailed that you don't keep markets closed for more than three days. But fears are fading that an extended shutdown in U.S. stocks will create panic selling when they open. I think the time aspect is, is going to allow it to be a lot more stable than it would have otherwise been. I think the markets are comfortable that we will have an orderly price adjustment. There's more risk in the market, there's more risk in the economy, there's more risk in the global environment. There has to be a price adjustment down ultimately, but if that's an orderly price adjustment, we will see transactions start to come back and we will see the markets get back on their feet um, you know, over the next few weeks. Now the plan is to open stocks on Monday, but there are still more questions and answers. Can New York's tiny, crooked downtown streets handle the thousands of workers needed to open its trading floors? 3,000 traders and, uh, and uh, support staff are here at the big board on the floor. How will those people get here? Will phone lines and power sources remain secure? And will investors even be ready? For now, uh, many folks here say they're relieved and they'll take it one day at a time, Lou. Christine, thank you, Christine Romans. And of course, amongst the many challenges, the formidable challenges facing everyone downtown Manhattan, uh, those trying to rescue those who we all hope could be still alive under the rubble and the debris, trying to repair the infrastructure itself that will make access to that area possible. And principal among that infrastructure, some of the most densely concentrated telecom uh, communications equipment and lines in all the world. And that presents a major obstacle to the reopening of these markets. And Alan Chernoff is here to, to tell us how they're going to get that done. Exactly, Lou. And in fact, the building immediately north of the World Trade Center site is a very important telecommunications switching center owned by Verizon. Normally, that building provides 20% of the data circuits for the New York Stock Exchange. Now, the building, of course, is out of commission. Verizon is doing its best right now to rebuild that capacity. Now, a very different type of rebuilding effort involves investor confidence. And today, the SEC Chairman Harvey Pitt did his best to calm investors. 
This is not an economic problem. It's a physical catastrophe. People are responding to a physical tragedy. Uh, that should not in any way, shape, or form cause anyone to believe uh, that there will be something um, uh, sinister like a Black Monday resulting uh, from the uh, opening of trading. We apologize for the interruption, but we're going to go back now. Further developments at the evacuation of the U.S. Capitol. We're going to senior White House correspondent John King. John? Well, Lou, I want to bring you up to speed on a briefing we've just had with a senior administration official, not on the developments at the U.S. Capitol, the evacuation of the Capitol, but on the investigation here in Washington. Speaking to the senior administration official, no doubt the administration believes that the suspected Saudi terrorist Osama bin Laden is suspect number one in this, but this official saying one of the reasons the administration has not flat out said so just yet as the investigation continues is, quote, that there might have been not one, but multiple organizations involved in this. So that one development as the investigation continues and as the president meets with his national security team again this afternoon to consider possible military strikes. Also, this official making clear in an obvious effort to try to build American public support and prepare the American public that even if the president authorizes a military response to these terrorist strikes of the past few days that the administration is also preparing what she, this official called a sustained effort involving other governments to crack down not only militarily but financially and diplomatically as well not only on terrorist groups but on nations that harbor them as well and as an example of that the administration putting extraordinary pressure on the government of Pakistan today asking we are told by sources for the Pakistani government to close the border with Afghanistan to stop supplying fuel to the Taliban government government in Afghanistan to provide any information it has on the movements and the organization of Osama bin Laden and to allow U.S. warplanes access to Pakistani airspace if requested in the event the president does go forward with a military response. That is significant, of course, because Mr. bin Laden has his shelter in Afghanistan. A number of developments in the investigation, an urgent tone here at the White House, and as we previously reported, a new security environment again here at the White House as well, as the president continues his discussions inside today because of an earlier threat today on the vicinity of the White House and on the White House grounds itself. We are told as a precaution, Vice President Dick Cheney taken out of the White House grounds, brought to the Camp David retreat in Maryland, so he and the president would be a safe distance apart. Lou. And John, the president remains in the White House tonight. He does indeed. The president here as we speak, that a sign number one that they don't view this threat as credible right now, although just a hundred yards away in Lafayette Park, armed secret service continue to patrol and they have blocked off all vehicle traffic on a much broader perimeter than had been the case yesterday. The president in the White House working. We should also note though there are very secure facilities beneath the White House grounds should there be a threat on the White House. John, thank you very much. John King from the White House, who will, amongst all the other correspondents as well, of course, here at CNN, be keeping us up to date. Uh, we want to return to Alan Chernoff. Uh, Alan, the obstacles facing uh, the big board, all of the exchanges and these brokerages to bring Wall Street back uh, uh, fully re recovered, at least as recovered as possible by Monday huge effort here and it's not only the stock exchange all the brokerage firms of course the city officials and as we mentioned the telecommunications companies very critical here as well as con edison the power company because there was a generator in the basement of number seven world trade center which also is gone and verizon the principal telephone company working down there precisely okay alan chernoff thank you very much uh, and again as i said uh, as we focus on what is happening here in the financial capital of, of indeed the world uh, we will also as any development warrants be moving you back to uh, to wherever the development takes place to to give you the full report we have some good news tonight uh, morgan stanley the brokerage house the uh, world trade center's largest tenant occupying parts of both towers in fact 3,700 3, 3, employees. And we're going to tell you about the remarkable story of the survivors of that in just a moment. We're going to go now back to Washington, D.C., Lieutenant Dan Nichols of the Capitol Police. Into the building to the specific area where the threat was made. The first team went in and conducted a sweep and hit on, a, on an area that was a concern. As a precaution, we sent a second team in, and that second team hit also. Based upon two dogs hitting on a package, we went ahead and, and did an immediate evacuation of the Capitol to ensure the uh, public safety and the security of the Congress. Everyone was evacuated out of the building. I'm pleased to say now that we've cleared this. We sent our hazardous devices unit in. 
Uh, they've examined that area thoroughly and they have not identified anything of a hazardous nature and we are now getting ready to reoccupy the Capitol building. Uh, this event lasted approximately 45 minutes or 50 minutes and it's now concluded. I was, I was developing some more information. Uh, the reason why I was late coming to the briefing is we had just had the information passed on to me that we have cleared that, the bomb team has cleared the package or cleared the area and we are now re-entering the Capitol building. Can you tell us what kind of package it was? Was it a, was it a briefcase or a... I'm, I'm sorry, I'm not going to get into that specific information. Uh, as far as... It's, I'm sorry, I'm not going to give you the location either. Um, Lieutenant Dan Nichols uh, right. explaining the reasons that, that uh, for the uh, first time uh, that we know ever, uh, the U.S. Capitol has been evacuated. That after a uh, uh, obviously a very credible uh, threat, in this case the threat of a suspicious uh, uh, package or briefcase, at least something suggesting the possibility of a bomb and uh, the vice president indeed being moved off to Camp David while the president remains at the White House. That evacuation now ended and staff and of course uh, our representatives and senators to return uh, to the Capitol. Now, I was just saying there is some good news, some almost remarkably if not miraculous news that amongst 3,700 employees at the World Trade Center uh, destroyed in the space of less than two hours that all but 40 of those 3,700 people uh, are accounted for. 40 people missing of them and one of the people who made it out of the World Trade Center in time, uh, Joe McAlinden, who has appeared on this broadcast a number of times and uh, an old and good friend. And Joe, we're, good, we're just delighted to see you obviously safe. Uh, tell us what happened. Well, I was having a breakfast meeting on the 66th floor in our dining room when the first plane hit the uh, number one building and uh, burst into flames. And uh, so our uh, security man on the floor urged everyone to get out, uh, even though there was no immediate danger from that to the number two building. We're worried about the fire spreading. So I got the, down the elevator with a bunch of colleagues and then, uh, and then walked down most of the way from you, 44. You took the elevator down? I took an elevator from 66 to 44. Uh, at the time, our building was believed to be a no threat. Right, Who right. knew? At that point. Yeah. Uh, your thoughts, as you reached the ground, you saw at that point the extent of the damage and what was going on. When I first reached the ground, the second plane still hadn't hit. It hit about a minute after I walked out of that elevator. And, did you uh, actually see it? I did not see it. I was in the concourse underground, right. uh, exiting with a bunch of other people. And at that point, it was fairly orderly uh, evacuation going on, and uh, people were uh, viewing it as a freak accident. Well, Morgan Stanley's uh, security there to evacuate all of those people there, uh, I mean, that's truly a remarkable accomplishment. It, it is, and, and we were very fortunate. Uh, as you know, a lot of other firms and, and, and organizations uh, had, had, had much uh, larger problems and, uh, than we have to report so far. Well, the, the fact that the security people were able to move that quickly, they, they literally started moving you out of the building. Within seconds. Within seconds. Uh, on the floor that I was on, our, our, uh, our guard, uh, Roy, got us uh, all into the elevator and down. The most remarkable act you saw there the, the, the one that st stood out to me, actually, I didn't witness it, Lou, but I just heard about it today. Uh, one of our guys carried a woman who was on crutches down from, I think it was the 71st floor, all the way down the stairs. Remarkable. Well, the stories of, uh, of escape and surviving and, uh, the and heroism. And heroism, not right. Uh, unfortunately, not enough uh, stories of survival as, they, as we continue to look for some 4,700 people who are still missing. Uh, as you know, the, the market's set now to reopen Monday. Uh, I, I, do you believe, first of all, that they'll be successful in bringing these markets back Monday? Uh, it's going to be, I think it's going to be really tough to get the downtown area functioning. Uh, I think that the exchange may be trying some new innovative things to actually have securities trading uh, underway on Monday, but they I believe they're, they're committed to doing so. We're geared up now to we, open fully on Monday. We've heard a lot of people trying to speculate and predict these markets in this environment, uh, which is in the very best of times, and these are certainly not the best of times, uh, very uh, sometimes prom <laughs> always problematic. Uh, is it your suspicion that these markets will be orderly or 
do you think we'll have a problem? Well, we saw what happened overseas in response right. to this, and the, the, the initial plunge was followed by some, uh, some, some bounce back, and I, I think you'll see that again, uh, uh, I suspect, on Monday, if not during that week. There'll be an initial plunge, and then buyers will come in and, and uh, support this market. Well, Joe McElhinney, thanks for being with us in every sense of the expression. Thank you. Good to be here, Lou. Thank you, Joe. We're going to go now to the New York Stock Exchange, uh, where its chairman, Dick Grasso, uh, he is standing by. Dick, uh, if you can hear me, first of all, well, good, to, uh, good to talk with you tonight. Lou, it's good to be with you. Thank uh, you. I can only imagine the tumult that uh, you and uh, all of the people at the New York Stock Exchange have been going through trying to uh, make this decision. What, uh, what prompted, uh, what were the two or three major considerations that prompted the decision to open uh, as early as Monday at 9.30? Well, first and foremost, Lou, let me say that the entirety of my industry in a joint an unprecedented effort got together and made certain that when the markets are targeted to resume <clears throat> that decision and that timing should always be secondary to the human factor to the wonderful acts that are going on as we speak Lou over at that um, site of the former Twin Towers that thousands of brave men and women from the fire department and the police Dick. department who are putting their lives on the line. The target of 9.30 on Monday, Lou, was a coordinated effort amongst the firms, the markets, with the oversight and support from our government. Now we, again, this, uh, this evening, have heard that One Liberty Plaza, the uh, headquarters of the NASDAQ, uh, that now looks to be at some risk. We know that a number of structures, Mary, Mary Giuliani has said that a number of those structures down there may not uh, be stable. They seem to be all right now. We know the American Express building, for one, that looks, uh, looks like it may be a difficult issue. Uh, how concerned are you about the, environments, uh, the environment of the New York Exchange itself? Lou, we will not allow anything to happen in the markets, and I speak in the broadest terms, that in any way compromises the safety and security of the wonderful men and women who operate this business. And I say that in the broadest terms, Lou. So we are working in partnership with the mayor and the governor and agencies of the federal government to make certain that no factor of marketplace resumption ever comes before the safety and security of the wonderful men and women who work in this business. Okay. Dick Grasso, uh, I know you've got a lot of work to do. I'll let you get back to it. Thanks for being with us. Thank you, Lou. Thank you, Dick. Well, I want to turn now to our economics correspondent, Kathleen Hayes. Uh, Kathleen, uh, give us your, your best judgment as what's happening first in terms of the bond market that reopened today. Well, it's very interesting, Lou. The bond market did reopen, and apparently it was a reasonably successful day. A big rally at the short end of the government bond market. Uh, a big rally took the two-year note down to 2.99%. I was speaking to Bill Hornberger at AG Edwards. He says he can't remember when the a yield on that short-term paper was that low. The long end of the bond market, though, there's a concern now, an expectation that insurance companies are going to have to sell a lot of their bonds to fund their liabilities. Wow. That has put a hold on the long end of the bond market and put pressure on the corporate bond market as well in that sector, Lou. Which, uh, at least at this point, is not trading, and so that pressure is awaiting us. Uh, the, the question, uh, I, I guess, that arises is with the two-year down, and this uh, this security was what created in 1972. Uh, this in this precise maturity, to see these yields down at this level. Uh, what does that tell us? Well, it tells us a couple of things. First of all, it tells us that investors around the world are parking money in a short, liquid security. They don't know what's going to happen. They don't know what's going to happen when the stock market reopens. This is a place to put your money temporarily. Beyond that... A quote-unquote safe haven. That's, well, as long as our U.S. government, which we definitely have our full faith in at this point, holds up, that paper is good. That's what an investor is saying to his, him or herself. In addition, though, very weak economic data today. University of Michigan has a very important consumer sentiment survey. It fell sharply even before we had this tragedy happen this week. The, the survey concluded Monday night, a big drop. That added some steam. But i got to tell you, there's some concern below the surface about how well the Treasury market is actually functioning. I'm hearing 
from my sources, we have a couple of big clearing banks, Chase and Bank of New York. Right. Bank of New York is about a block from the epicenter of the World Trade Center, and there's some concern about the stability of their computer system. So there is concern, concern, some, some concern right. about settlement next week. Um, this is something I think we have to watch and monitor and find out what we hear tomorrow from uh, the big dealers. In terms of the trading in the bond market today, relatively light trading, which we expected, uh, but we didn't see any wild moves here. We saw very little speculation in this market. Uh, what's that a direct result of? Um, people are saying that there's a concern right now not to be seen as predatory, not to be seen as taking advantage of a difficult, perhaps unstable situation. Okay. Kathleen, thanks. Kathleen Hayes. Well, as we mentioned, the airports uh, in New York, those uh, three primary uh, airports uh, in New York, Newark Airport, uh, JFK uh, and LaGuardia closed by federal authorities. We have just been told that three arrests have been made at John F. Kennedy Airport. Those arrests made, we are told, by uh, Justice Department officials based, uh, and I should say detained rather than arrested, detained uh, based on apparently they, their names matched a profile that the Justice Department has been screening for. And again, uh, that uh, that appears to be uh, uh, the reason for both the closings of the airport and uh, the reason for all of the federal uh, uh, authorities moving into the airports uh, this evening. Uh, in times of crisis like these, if there have been times of crisis like this, Americans generally open their hearts and their wallets to, to those in, in real need. In great need has been created here in downtown Manhattan. But corporate America has started stepping up and stepping up big. Susan Lasovich has that part of the story. Lou, it's one of the most heartening things about reporting this terrible story is that companies seemingly by the minute willing to do anything, offering products, services, and millions of dollars in aid to assist this massive rescue effort taking place. And some of this, by the way, comes with enormous personal loss. Verizon Communications, for instance, lost several technicians working high up in the World Trade Center. Verizon setting up free pay phones in lower Manhattan. AT&T distributing thousands of free cell phones to Red Cross and other relief organizations. Anheuser-Busch donating thousands of cases of drinking water, McDonald's, uh, giving free food to rescue workers not only here in New York, but Washington and Somerset County. And then millions of dollars of, of aid. General Electric donating $10 million. Cisco Systems donating $6 million. The list goes on and on, but it also includes small businesses like Bluefly.com, which is donating 9,000 square feet of prime midtown office space to companies suddenly left homeless. Domino's Pizza offered to send pizzas up for the new tenants, and we've had uh, people who have volunteered uh, engineering services and computer services and furniture rentals. So it's been pretty surprising, at, and, and, and we're obviously grateful for the response that's f followed on from this. The Silicon Alley reporter is another local business that's also offering free office space, and it says there are other reasons for companies to step up their generosity. And we have to realize that one of the reasons that people did this was to screw up our economy. It wasn't just to psychologically scar us, to kill people. They want to shut down the economy. And these companies, mid-sized companies, small-sized companies, are the bulk of our economy. And they're going to go out of business. People are going to lose their jobs. And Lou, one of the new tenants in the new office space, a man by the name of Bruno Dellinger, used to work at a marketing consulting firm housed in the World Trade Center. He says it's important to send the perpetrators of Tuesday's attack a message, a message that life goes on and that literally New York's financial district will rise again. And that's very encouraging, obviously. Encouraging, uh, moving. I, I have to say, at least for myself, General Electric's $10 million to the families of those firemen and policemen who lost their lives you know, fighting this devastation and this, uh, this terrible tragedy uh, is to me just singular in its focus and, uh, and its generosity. So I, I and the calls should... keep coming in, the faxes and the emails, they're not alone. Terrific. Susan, thanks a lot. Well, as we've just reported to you, three 
three suspects, uh, if you will, have been detained at uh, JFK uh, International Airport here in New York in order to carry out uh, uh, those actions. Federal authorities had to shut down all three uh, New York airports within just the last half hour or so. But around the country, airports today began opening up, and we want to turn to uh, our colleague Casey Wyan in Los Angeles at Los Angeles International Airport to bring us that part of the story. Casey? Well, Lou, you're seeing something behind me that we haven't seen here at Los Angeles International Airport in two days, and that is airline passengers. The FAA gave the go-ahead for the airport to begin operations earlier this morning, and the first flight arrived about 10.30 a.m. local time. It was an Alitalia MD-11, originally departing from Milan, that was diverted on Tuesday to Calgary. It finally arrived at its destination this morning, two days late. Other travelers began lining up for a limited number of departing flights on a limited number of airlines. New security procedures, of course, are in place, and LAX recommended that passengers arrive two and a half hours early, even for domestic flights. They just want me to get home, too. Now, those new security measures, which, of course, are extraordinary in nature, involve no more curbside check-ins. And at least at Los Angeles, no passenger cars are even allowed anywhere near the terminal area. They have to park at satellite lots and take shuttle buses into the terminal. No e-ticket check-ins. Everyone must report to ticket counters whether they have baggage to check or not. Only passengers with identification, photo identification, and tickets will be allowed into boarding areas. All carry-on bags will be searched. All airplanes will be searched for security precautions before passengers board those planes. There will be an increased presence of federal air marshals on all flights. And of course, no knives, not even pocket knives. All this, of course, is expected to add up to more costs for the airline industry, which even before these events occurred this week was already struggling. Analysts projected that the airline industry would lose between one and a half and three billion dollars this year, wiping out all of its profit from last year. Those losses, Lou, are expected to mount in the wake of this tragedy. Casey, thank you very much. Casey Wyan from Los Angeles International Airport. We mentioned uh, the good fortune of the 3,700 employees, uh, nearly all of them, uh, at Morgan Stanley at the World Trade Center. Uh, the inverse of the story is Cantor Fitzgerald, uh, the largest uh, bond uh, broker in the country. About a thousand employees, most of those uh, at the top, the uppermost floors of the World Trade Center. Peter Viles is here with that part of the story. Peter. Lou, if what happened at Morgan Stanley is a miracle or a near miracle, the folks at Kenner Fitzgerald, the hundreds of employees there, are looking tonight for a miracle, hoping for a miracle. This is one of the biggest bond trading firms in the world. Very heavy losses at Cantor Fitzgerald. It is the saddest vigil you can imagine. Scott Hazelcorn's parents. It's not even revenge. I mean, I don't, I just want to hear my son's voice. The members of Jun Ku Kang's church. We all pray every night. John Perconti's wife expecting their child in December. He, he called me at 10 to 9 and said, our building has just been hit by a plane, turn on the news. And I changed the channel and I saw what happened and I said, oh God, John, please get out of there safely. And he said, I love you, I have to go. What links these stories is that all the missing worked at Cantor Fitzgerald, all above the hundredth floor of the North Tower, the first one hit. Cantor is not a glamorous firm, but it is crucial, one of the world's largest bond trading firms. A thousand people worked up there, fewer than 300 are accounted for, but it is not clear any of those now safe were on the top floors Tuesday morning. I don't think anybody got out at this point, but uh, we pray for miracles. Scott Hazelcorn's parents suspect that their son did not run for his life. He didn't care about himself. He only cared about his friends. If Scott was there and he was getting out, he'd probably help everybody out in front of him. That's the kind of kid he was. They gather at a city-designated center for relatives of the missing on 26th Street, where trees have become pleas for help. And further uptown at the Pierre Hotel, a gathering site for Cantor Fitzgerald families. I don't think the company has the information that we need. I think they're sharing everything they know, but we have not heard of... of 
Okay. To validate any, any stories that we've heard. The city has set up official clearinghouses for information on the missing, and the families we spoke to have been to those clearinghouses, but they are convinced that every extra effort that they can make on behalf of their loved ones is at this hour worth making. Lou. Pete, thanks very much. Well, S Secretary of Treasury Paul O'Neill cut short his trip to Japan to return to, uh, to the United States uh, as we uh, begin to watch these markets come back to life. Uh, Secretary O'Neill held a press conference this afternoon in which he said that the U.S. markets remain strong and resilient. Tim O'Brien has the story for us tonight from Washington. Tim. Lou, Secretary O'Neill was back at work today, cutting short an official visit to Asia. He said he kept in touch with the Treasury Department, the Fed, the administration, and financial markets while away. And in a brief statement to reporters, he said the United States has every reason to maintain its confidence in the U.S. economy. Then he added this. This tragedy will cause some short-term dislocations. Supply disruptions are real as some transportation stopped or slowed for several days this week. These effects will be transitory as transportation flows return to normal. O'Neill said the country's economy is not located in any one place, that innovation and productivity are found in every factory and every farm, every laboratory, every financial institution, every small business, and every home office across America. In a calamity of this magnitude, however, there will surely be ripple effects a long way down the road. One may involve the annual meetings of the IMF and World Bank, which are scheduled to be held here in Washington September 29th and 30th. Sources close to the decision-making process tell CNN there is a, quote, high probability that these events will either be postponed or canceled altogether as a result of Tuesday's attacks. Lou. Tim, thanks. Tim O'Brien from Washington. The Pentagon now says it will launch sustained military strikes against those responsible for Tuesday's attacks against the United States. Today, Deputy Defense Secretary Paul Wolfowitz said that those options will include the full array of America's military power. I'm joined now by former Defense Secretary William Cohen, who is also our Moneyline regular contributor. Bill, good to have you with us. Hello. At this, uh, at, at this point, uh, as the search goes on for those responsible, it is becoming increasingly clear uh, that the administration, that the agencies, the Justice Department, uh, and other agencies are focusing on Osama bin Laden. Is there a, any surprise in this for you? Uh, not really. Uh, he is uh, prime among the suspects, but I should point out that we uh, ought not to focus on uh, Osama bin Laden uh, solely. We have to go after the terrorist network, and that means going well beyond one individual. And that's why I think uh, Deputy Secretary Wolfowitz, uh, Secretary Powell, and Secretary Rumsfeld, and others, the President, have indicated this is going to be uh, a long sort of twilight struggle, if I can use uh, John Kennedy's words, against a, an unspeakable evil. And it's not going to be over with one strike. There'll be multiple strikes. And it won't only involve military application. We need to apply diplomatic, economic, uh, the full range of, of, of pressure that we can upon all those governments and countries and organizations who lend safe haven, provide financial or moral support to these groups who are determined to try to bring us uh, down to their level. The president has made it clear that this is war and today with considerable emotion, frankly holding back tears, he talked about the loss and the fact that he would prosecute uh, those responsible to the, to the fullest extent. Uh, do you think that anything less would suffice here? Oh, I think nothing less. Uh, the president expressed uh, profound uh, sadness and grief, anger, and above all, uh, resolve and determination. Uh, I would say that uh, he and his administration will work with the Congress, which, by the way, is about to appropriate some $20 billion, and that's just a, a first down payment on what will be required. But there is unanimity in this capital. There's unanimity in both parties. They're going to lend their full support behind the president in this war against the terrorists. Bill Cohen, thanks for being with us. Thank you. Well, the Chicago Board of Trade today reopened for business. Uh, at noon Eastern time, traders and staff halted for a minute of silence in tribute to those victims who died in the terrorist attacks in New York City and in Washington, D.C. It was a sobering sight. It is uh, in a bond pit that is normally loud and animated, and as you are about to see, it was absolutely silent.
On a personal note tonight, the husband of our colleague, Lisa Delalo, like so many, is missing. Tom Clark is among those who worked in the World Trade Center. Tom, uh, in this picture, is shown with his son, Matthew. He works for Sandler O'Neill on the 104th floor of Building 2, the South Tower of the World Trade Center. Lisa last heard from him at about 9 o'clock Tuesday morning, right after the first explosion. If you have any information about Tom or any other Sandler O'Neill employees, please call 212-714-7826, 212-714-7827. Our thoughts tonight are with Lisa, her family, and all of those who still search for relatives and friends in the debris of what was the World Trade Center. For tonight, that is Moneyline. We thank you for being with us. I'm Lou Dobbs. Now back to Bill Hammer and Joey Chen. Alto human. Thank you, Lou. Uh, a few housekeeping notes before we move on here. The Capitol all clear. Members of the House and Senate allowed back in about 30 minutes ago in case you missed that. And also three men detained at JFK Airport in New York. But still, it appears that stop down does continue for JFK, LaGuardia, and Newark, the three major airports serving the New York area. We're continuing to follow up on those things. You know, uh, Lou's last comments there about his colleague and her husband who is still missing at this point really brings to mind, you know, a lot of people have asked us over the years as journalists, doesn't yeah. it ever bother you to see the horrible things that you have to cover? And it does. And, and it does. And I think people forget that we are human too, and sometimes our pain too enters into the story as it did this afternoon. Our colleague Elizabeth Cohen out of the New York Armory in New York meeting with so many of the families there so desperately looking mm -hmm. for those who are missing now. We want to bring you a little bit of Elizabeth's encounter with one of those uh, family members right now. It's Elizabeth. Um, Andrew called Erica the, right after the first plane crashed and said, I'm okay, I'll call you back hung up the phone and we haven't heard from him. The only thing we heard were reports that he had evacuated his office, told everyone to leave. The last thing we heard was from his secretary who said that he was on the 70-something 70, 70 floor on his way down the stairs. Um, but he's a very good soul and we're just afraid that he might have gone back to try to help more people once they announced the building was secure. And you, we did a story with you yesterday. You've been hospital after hospital yeah. searching. Um, I've been, yesterday I was at NYU and Bellevue and down by St. Vincent's, um, passing out pictures, talking to people, finding out lists, calling hospitals. My sister, my parents, and friends are calling hospitals, personally going to hospitals. I came down this morning. I walked from 50th. I took the subway to 14th. I walked to St. Vincent's. I checked their list. Um, I walked all across World Trade Center and up West Street, giving out flyers to people going down to the World Trade Center to Ground Zero. Um, today I came up to um, the Armory and I filed a report with them. I handed in his dental records, his fingerprints, um, all the information they wanted, hair follicles, gave them pictures, and we're just hoping that someone heard or saw something or can give us some confirmation of where he is, some real valid confirmation that's been verified. You've had some problems with some internet sites where yes. one site said he was okay. But there are these New York.com survivors, there's New York City.com. They have lots of websites that have people on that are saying they're okay. Um, I can go on and put anyone's name in that I want, and it's false. They, these records are not verified. They're giving out um, a phone number for the New York Greater the Greater New York Hospital Association that's putting up a verified website of people that they know the status of and where they are. Um, and that's the only thing I think that's verified. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. CNN's Elizabeth Cohen joins us now again outside the armory and Elizabeth we see so many of those people behind you just desperately holding up pictures of their loved ones any chance that somebody might have seen them or known anything about it. It is just heartbreaking. Exactly. I've spoken to countless people uh, today and yesterday, and all of them, every single one, have hope that their brother, their sister, their wife, their husband, their best friend will be found. No one I've spoken to has given up hope. I want to give you sort of a flavor for what's happening here. Behind me at the armory, hundreds if not thousands of people have stood in line to give authorities information to file reports. The authorities are taking it all down. They're telling people to bring in dental records. They're telling people to bring in blood samples of close relatives 
positive so that there can be a DNA match if a body is found. Um, what you hear behind me, that noise is a generator. It's generating lights for the police because they're going to be doing this into the night and they need lights to help people figure out where they need to go. I want to show you sort of what's going on here. This woman right here is looking for her sister Bridget. She worked on the 94th floor um, of Tower One. She worked for American Express. This woman here is looking for Yvonne Bonomo. She worked on the 94th floor also uh, for American Express. She is 30 years old. This woman here is looking for her son and her daughter. They are both missing. They both work for Windows on the World on the 106th floor of the first tower. Her son is Roshan Singh and her daughter is Kamini. They are 21 and 25 years old and she is looking for both of them. People are putting signs also all over the city. You can see these flyers. They are pasted on restaurants, on the sides of trucks, on walls, everywhere, advertising, saying, please, if you have heard anything about this person, please call this number. You can see, for example, just right over here on this police barricade, people have posted up these signs saying, missing, please call. Uh, people here, you see them with their children. You see, we, we've seen a lot of wedding photographs. I guess that's often what people um, have handy. Um, and people are just looking for, for some sign, really, for any sign about what's happened. Um, I'm going to talk now to the Bustillo family. Uh, the Bustillo family, there have been searching two brothers and a sister. Henry and Gilbert Bustillo and their sister Disa are searching for their brother Milton. Henry Bustillo, what, what was the last anyone heard from your brother? Well, last we heard it was my sister. She spoke to him on Monday and uh, he was so happy that he just purchased his new house. And uh, he was he was just really glad and then he went into work on, on Tuesday and we haven't heard since. I mean, it's such a tragedy, you know. We've been looking for him for, for three days already and we haven't found anything. We stand online changing, swapping information so we can you know, swap information with, you know, other people that are missing their loved ones. And many people from his company are missing, is that right? Yes. Contifix Gerald is, uh, it was located between 101 and 104th and that's where the impact hit the most. And it's just, we're, we're waiting, I mean, we're waiting for some results or for the company even to come up and step up and look for us and say, give us some little comfort, you know, because we need their support as well. And we haven't seen them yet. Please. If anybody has seen my brother, please give us a call. You can reach us at 201-346-9018 or you can reach his wife at 1718-698-6982. She's desperately, desperately looking for him or to hear about him. He just, he just, he has a, a daughter, seven months old, and he's really, she, you can hear that people in the background are yelling the names of their loved ones, yelling out phone numbers. People are doing anything to, add, to, to let everyone know that they are still looking for their loved ones. No one here has given up hope. Joey? Elizabeth, I want you to take a deep breath because I know that you are as moved as we all are uh, about the Bustillas and their story and, and those of so many other people around you. Uh, it, it is hard for me to believe that there is no other more structured way that these people can get some information. I mean, here we are in the 21st century. Shouldn't there be some way they should be able to find out more than just standing out on the street corner? Well, there is a more structured way, Joey. I mean, what you, what you see behind me is the armory where people have been in line for, you know, hours and hours. There was a line also at NYU Medical Center yesterday. Um, and so there is a more structured way. You go in, you tell the authorities the name, you fill out this page, this report. It had, you know, I think almost 10 pages. The color of their eyes, exactly what they were wearing, um, descriptions to a T. And so that they can know if they see that person, they can link them up. So people have actually been very complimentary of how the authorities have handled this. One thing that people have not been complimentary of, the families I've spoken to, is the internet sites. There are several internet sites, but it's not, uh, several of them listed people as being okay and found who weren't 
found and who may not be okay. So the internet sites, I think people are, are although the internet should be a tool in this situation, apparently these sites aren't secure and they're not uh, completely factual. Elizabeth, there are other, so many other people around you who want to give some of them a chance. Uh, can you talk to some of those other folks around you about, about the people they are looking for? There's a woman there to your right. She's, got a, she's really been trying very hard to bring her okay. loved one's okay. picture Okay, let's talk to her. Hi there. Tell me who you're looking for. I'm looking for my older nephew. He's 28 years old. He was on the top floor on the first hearing on the North Tower. He worked for Genuity Company. It was only nine people from the company. We heard people up to the floor 106. If somebody at least heard from one person on the floor 107 to let me know he was on the phone with his boss a couple of minutes before the first hitting on the tower. His body started devastated. He was on the 107th floor of which tower? On the North Tower, the first one to be hit. And he was on the phone with his boss and what did he what did he say? No, he, that was just technical conversation. He hung up and two seconds after that, the first airplane hit the tower. We heard people up to the 106 floor, okay? If somebody heard from 107 floor, that's all that we need to know. Okay, thank you, ma'am. Let me, let me talk to the, the gentleman behind you. Hold on. Sir, could you tell me who you're looking for? Yes, this is my cousin. Her name is Tanyelle McDay. Uh, she works for Marsh at, uh, I believe, Tower 1, 97th floor. And um, if anybody's seen her or anybody heard anything, please contact uh, we have the number here is 732-499-7118. Uh, if anybody has seen her, please contact us. And we really do miss her, and uh, God bless everybody. Can you tell me, when was the last time anyone heard from her? Um, the last time was, it was approximately 8.30. She spoke to uh, one of our relatives, stating that she was okay, she was at work. And uh, that's the last time we heard from her. She said she was okay after one of the explosions? No, this was approximately, when she got to work, it was approximately 8.30. She was telling us that she got to, you know, work okay. So, and that's the last time we've seen her. Now, have you gone and spoken to the authorities in the armory? Have they been helpful? Yes, they have. Um, my family and everybody, the uh, staffs and police department, fire department, everybody, everybody's been very helpful. Um, we filled out the claim and everything, you know, to try to find, try to find her, you know. So um, everybody's been doing a, a great job, you know. Okay, thank you, sir. Let me, sir, can you move forward a little bit? Can you tell me who you're looking for? Looking for my cousin Nino Gargano. And uh, where, what floor was he on and in uh, which? I think 104, 103 in uh, the North Tower, Tower Number 1. When was the last anyone heard from him? Uh, Tuesday morning. Uh, his mom and uh, when he went to work, his mom said goodbye to gave him a big kiss and never saw him again. So we're still looking. The entire family's totally looking for him. We've got posters all over the place. Thank you, sir. Thank you, ma'am. Hi, um, I'm the wife of Peter Mutos, and we just want to let all his relatives know and Peter as well that we're not going to give up until we find you. We love you. Where where, where was he in the World Trade Center? Uh, he was on the hundredth floor in Building Number One. And did anyone hear from him just before? Um, the only lead I have is that there's a William Mutos um, in the World Trade Center. And that, um, so right now what I need is the master list of people that were in the World Trade Center, because Mutos is not a common name. And my, my thought is, is that there might be a, a cross in the, the first name when they're retyping the list. Now what have you done? I'm sure you've spent the past two days now trying to find him. Tell me what you have done in your search. Um, basically, I have gone to the sites. I've gone to St. Vincent's is where they have a master list and I've checked upon the, uh, the, the list that they have of people there. I went to Bellevue because there um, they also will print out an hourly list of updating. I went to the Red Cross yesterday on 29th, uh, 29th Street and 1st Avenue. Um, I've also been getting uh, information which is important is the, um, the a recent medical history, um, any other you know, you know, dental records or anything as well to help them um, find them. And uh, presently also going just to the individual hospitals and giving him a picture as well as posting this, this picture around so that if perchance he is, he is not go, uh, 
doesn't know what happened to him, he will be able to read this himself and um, be able to call the Marsh, this Marsh number. Uh, Marsh for other employees, um, they have a crisis center set up in, in which they're also helping us. In fact, this is what they printed for us. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. There's another family who we want to... Same floor. Same he was floor, on the same building. He was on the same floor. Tell me, tell me about the person you're looking for. I'm looking for Salvatore Ziza, my brother-in-law, who has now, two man? young children at home and a very large family. And the pain that we feel, we express the same sentimentality to the thousands of people that are out on this street. As much pain as we feel. We wish everyone else here our best. The experience that we've had from all the authorities that we've dealt with, including everything the girl before me mentioned, the same process, the same sources, everybody is doing their best to help. There are thousands of people on the street from every organization and then some trying to help us all. Tell me, there seems to be sort of a, a, a brotherhood, a sisterhood that's grown up on, on this street corner. I haven't seen the American karma come together like this since the Vietnam War. Everybody feels the same way. Everybody has anger, but everybody has compassion. There is no script for what to say, and there's no script for how to feel. I've run into probably 10 people that have Marsh McLennan signs on their pictures, and I don't know their names, and I don't know where they're from, but they've hugged me and they've cried with me together. Everybody is feeling the same thing. There is no script. However, we're reading off of the same lines. And do, do you think, do people still have hope? I think everybody has hope, but I think everybody is prepared to face what they have to face. I think they're facing it the best they can. Like I say, there's no script. When was the last time you heard from Sal, or anyone heard from Sal? Sal's wife, who's home right now with his two children, spoke to him 10 minutes before the plane hit the building. We've had absolutely no contact from anyone other than the Red Cross. Okay, thank you, sir. Let me move to some people who are behind you. Thank you, sir. Ma'am, tell me you are Yvonne's best friend. Yeah. Tell me about We're Yvonne. Best friends over here. We're looking for Yvonne. She was on the 94th floor. She was an Amex employee who worked at Marsh McLennan. Please, somebody from any floors from 88 and up, please call our number 917-364-4906 and tell us what happened over there and if anybody got out and if anyone made it, please call us. We're looking for her. Please, 917-364-4906. Yvonne Bonomo, she was, she's a, she is a great little girl, and we have hope we're going to find her. Tell me what you've done. Have you searched through the city? We were, we were everywhere. We were everywhere. We went to the hospital. We registered her. We've called hospitals. Please, if anyone on the 94th floor got out, please call us and let us know our parents are beside themselves at home. We're waiting to hear anything. Please. Thank you. Thank you. Tell me, your your sister, you're looking for My your sister. My sister, Bridget Esposito, she worked, sat right next to Yvonne Bonono on the 94th floor at, Seven World, at One World Trade Center. The last time I spoke to her was at 20 to 8 before the blast, just like a regular day, and I haven't heard from her since then. And did you, did, tell me what you've done to search for her. I've been to every hospital in the city. We went to 28th and 1st Avenue yesterday and registered her. We've been on several TV channels begging people that if they see her, to find her for me. If anyone finds her, please call 718-436-9177 for Michael Esposito or Yvette at 718-339-6380. Ma'am, do you still have hope? I have a lot of hope. She's also with her best friend, Ben Valentine. Um, he sits right next to her, Bridget and Yvonne as well. So if anybody sees him, call our families. We're, we're looking desperately for them. Okay, thank you, ma'am. And ma'am, you are looking for Sal. I'm looking for my son, Sal. He left home that morning and he hasn't called back since then. He's a cadet. He's a train EMT and most probably as soon as he came into Manhattan, he just flagged someone down to go down and help the people in the World Trade Center bombing thing, just to help 
people to help people take them out. He's a trained EMT. If anybody has seen him, he, most probably he's helping people. So he was near the building at the time of the explosion and went in to help people. That's what I think, because he usually he comes into Manhattan like about 9:15, 9 9:20. And then he has to take the sixth train to go uptown. So most probably, he flagged someone to go downtown to help assist in the ref rescue. So if anybody has seen him, if they would just have call us at 718-225-7883. Even if they just seen him assisting somebody over there. Tell me how old Sal is. He's 23 years old. He just graduated from college and he just found a job at Rockefeller University. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, ma'am. Sir, sir, tell me, tell me who you're looking for. I'm looking for Pablo Ortiz. He works at the World Trade Center on the 88th floor. Um, he called his wife early in the morning on Tuesday, told the 88th floor was being evacuated. He was leaving. He left, and they never found him again. They never so haven't seen him. Right yes, gentleman right there with my mother, and we've been looking for him. And my sister's been doing all of that work, and I finally got out. And it's, I, it's, it's hard, and it's. And if anybody's seen him, just call the number one here, um, one two one two six seven three one two nine two. Um, anybody? Anything? Do you still have hopes, sir? Do I have hopes? Uh, yes, I have hopes, and I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. It took okay. Me two days to get out of my house to do this, so it's hard. I can understand why these people are suffering and crying. This is, it's hard. It's hard for these people. It's hard for me. I don't know. I shake. It took you two days, meaning you just emotionally could not get out of your house. I made it to my mother's house down on Lower East Side, and I just made it to started walking today. I just started walking today. My sister's been doing it for two days, and she's got a lot of hope. And I'm just picking up on where she left off. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you, New York. Joey, as you can tell, it is just an endless sea of people who are looking for their loved ones, who are doing anything they can to find some sign, any sign. Joey. Elizabeth Cohen at the Armory. Elizabeth, stand by there. We see so much emotion in those people around you. It is just... it. You can see the, you can see the desperation and, and you can hear the hope in their voices. And, Sometimes when and they don't putting talk, putting up their pictures. Yeah, and sometimes when they don't talk, they just stare, and you can see their faces being so empty. But this is clearly a human side of the story, Elizabeth. It was about two and a half hours ago when we first saw your initial interview. We were quite struck by not only your interview but also the reaction. And to give the folks at home a better indication of what, quite honestly, we go through covering a story like this, we want to take you back two and a half hours ago now. Uh, my father knew how to operate the rig, so. He brought down all the workers to inspect the building. If you think your father might be out there somewhere, what would you want to say to him? I want to tell him that we all miss him. His little nephew, Luke, misses him. And that uh, we're strong. We got hope. Thank you. Thank you. Aaron, I've been talking to these families for two days now, and all of these stories are very much like this. People are just hoping that their relatives are out there somewhere, and they're begging us to talk about them, to show their pictures, hoping that if someone's seen them, that they might be able to identify them and give some information. Aaron? Elizabeth, that was two and a half hours ago, as we mentioned, and uh, I know it must be extremely difficult for you, having a family back here in Atlanta, to hear these stories. But uh, you're serving a purpose there, and you're giving them hope to get their message out. And the thing that strikes me is the number of people who stick their pictures inside the camera frame in order to see, hey, maybe there's someone watching somewhere who may recognize their loved one. And I see so much politeness in, in what they're doing. I mean, everybody knows that other people are suffering too. Nobody's shoving anyone else out of the way. They all have a story to tell, but they seem to be giving each other a chance. I can't hear anything. Yeah. You can tell Miriam what that's you'd like me shame. to talk about. Okay. All right, Elizabeth, so. we're going to let you go there. We apologize for that. But indeed, that's the human element that we're seeing throughout this. And 
believe me, it's just begun at this point. Yeah. Uh, because these stories will continue to trickle out by the thousands at some point. Well, we want to uh, give our viewers another opportunity. If there is a chance that your picture has not been seen, those who have relatives mm -hmm. uh, still missing, who are quite concerned, CNN is trying to open up an opportunity for our viewers to be able to get those pictures out on the internet. We know that there are some internet services that have not been quite credible. This is a CNN.com service. If you can email us the picture of your missing loved one at missing at CNN.com, missing at CNN.com, that's the address to send in your picture if you have a missing person that you're looking for. And please, we do ask that people try to use this system judiciously and honestly. Um, there's so many people who suffered so much loss. Please do not use this unless you really have a need to. Also, CNN.com, there's a link there. If you go to CNN.com, there's a link there to get your picture used on the web. And uh, if there's any chance, it's Yeah, it's quite help. likely also, as we look at the quick vote online, we're just taking the pulse in a very unscientific fashion here at CNN.com about what Americans feel about what they're seeing and, and hearing and watching throughout the week. This is a question, what are your feelings about Tuesday's terrorist attacks? And you can see the, the options there, shock, sorrow, or anger. And clearly, nearly half are saying at this point they feel anger. And, and Joey, just from knowing this quick vote over the past year, typically we might have 30 to 40,000 yeah. votes there, but this is well over half a million. And what we saw earlier was, you know, initially a, a feeling of disillusionment on Tuesday into Wednesday, but clearly it's into anger at this point. We'll move quickly now to the White House. John King has some late information there. John. Well, Joey, this is a fast-developing story, and we have seen over the past several hours the many facets of this the president has to deal with. First and foremost, let's give you some breaking information about new security concerns here at the White House. Earlier this afternoon, the Secret Service, unannounced, suddenly went back out across the street, cleared Lafayette Park and the area around Pennsylvania Avenue. All vehicle traffic, traffic now moved back from the White House, and as these new security precautions were put in place, Secret Service saying this is part of an ongoing security operation. Other sources, however, though, say they were concerned about another possible threat on the White House grounds. As all that took place outside of the White House, the administration made a decision to take Vice President Dick Cheney off the White House grounds and move him to the presidential retreat at Camp David, Maryland. The president stayed here and kept working. The decision was made, though, that they did not want the president and the vice president in such close proximity at a time when they were concerned about another possible threat on the White House grounds. Now, again, the president stayed inside as all this played out. We know he has spoken to several world leaders today, also met with his national security team, and sources telling us the administration moving ahead in those discussions on two fronts. One, discussions with military planners about possible retaliatory strikes, but also this administration talking about what one senior official told us a short time ago is fundamentally different from anything the United States has ever done before responding to terrorism. All those phone calls to world leaders, part of an effort by the president and the administration to build an international coalition. They're talking about years-long effort now to choke off, in the words of one official, the safe harbor provided to terrorists and the financial support provided to terrorists. Now, as part of all this, the Secretary of State, Colin Powell, called the president of Pakistan today, Pakistan neighbors Afghanistan. Afghanistan is the home of Osama bin Laden. Mr. Powell told the president of Pakistan if he wanted to follow through on a promise of cooperation, that he should close the borders with Afghanistan, that he should stop supplying fuel to the Taliban government in Afghanistan, and that he should grant permission for U.S. military warplanes, if necessary, to use Pakistani airspace. All this planning taking place, as another senior official tells us, one reason the administration has not retaliated yet is that there, quote, might have been not one but multiple organizations involved in this. So the investigation continuing, and earlier this morning in the Oval Office, the president choked up as he spoke to reporters and considered the enormity of the challenge ahead. I think about the families, the children. Um, I'm, a, I'm a loving guy. And I'm also someone, however, who's got a job to do. And I intend to do it. And um, this is a terrible moment. But this country will not relent until we have saved ourselves and others from the terrible tragedy that came upon America.
Now, despite the obvious renewed security concerns here at the White House, Mr. Bush still planning to leave the grounds tomorrow and travel up to New York to assess the devastation and to get a first-hand update on the relief and recovery effort. Bill, Joey. John King for us out at the White House this evening. Also in Washington, Judy Woodruff. Judy. Bill, uh, joining us now from the Capitol, uh, the senator from the state of New York, Hillary Clinton. Senator Clinton, we've been listening to some heartbreaking stories uh, from people looking for loved ones. Can you bring us any new information about uh, recovery efforts there? Well, Judy, they continue even as we speak. They will continue as long as it is humanly possible to hope that we can find any survivors. We had some good news today when we found some of our firefighters and uh, another citizen. Uh, so we are far from uh, giving up on this uh, aspect of the search and rescue mission. Senator, what price do you now believe New York will ultimately pay in terms of lives, its economy, its financial uh, well-being and so forth? Well, Judy, it's devastating and of course this was not only an attack on New York, but an attack on America. And because New York is the global city and, you know, an engine of uh, American economic growth, this is a loss that's going to be felt throughout the country and even the world. But directly at home, where we've suffered the most grievous losses, uh, there is um, not any inventory of any kind yet. Uh, we are going about the painstaking business, as I saw firsthand yesterday when I visited with uh, the mayor and uh, the governor uh, of trying to make sure we account for every person. Uh, the necessity to really know who may be missing uh, is bringing people uh, down near the site to the armory on Lexington Avenue where they can uh, register and give information about their loved ones. Uh, but I think we're, we're at the beginning of what will be a very emotional um, time for our country because uh, the horror of seeing the planes crash into the towers, the unbelievable, just a moment of, of sheer horror in watching the buildings collapse um, is now going to be made even more painful because we're going to have uh, faces uh, to go with those people who um, were just going about their daily business, doing their jobs, and we're also going to know more about the individual firefighters and police officers and port authority officers and emergency technicians all of whom lost their lives the economic costs are just beginning to be calculated i was very grateful today when the president agreed with a request that senator schumer and i made for an additional twenty billion dollars in the supplemental appropriation uh... to deal with the overwhelming costs principally in New York, but also um, New Jersey's so, been affected, uh, other places. So we're talking about, what, 40, the neighborhood of 40 billion now? Yes, and, and 20 of that will go uh, for purposes such as beefing up our intelligence, repairing the Pentagon, uh, the military assets we need, uh, making it uh, clear that we're going to afford whatever security precautions are necessary at our airports, and then 20 billion will go to the kind of rescue, reconstruction, rebuilding, counseling, um, efforts that are, are going on right now in New York. Senator, we're hearing from President Bush, from Secretary Powell and others uh, at the Pentagon and elsewhere in the administration that no effort will be spared uh, in effect to go after the people who were responsible for this. Are you prepared to give the President in essence a green light to do whatever he and the people around him think is necessary to find these people? Well, I'm going to support uh, the president's uh, authority to uh, wage war on uh, these terrorists and wherever they are, root them out and make clear that anyone who provides comfort or financial aid is going to pay a price. Uh, we're in the process of drafting the resolution. I've consulted with some of my colleagues who've been here a lot longer than I who went through the Gulf War and even before uh, to know exactly uh, the best way to go about doing that. But we're going to come to agreement. Uh, behind the president to give him uh, the authority and the resources as commander-in-chief that he requires. What about a threshold of evidence? Is that something that uh, is a factor here? Well, Judy, you know, this is not a legal case. Um, you know, I used to practice law in another life, and uh, we're not, um, um, you know, we're not putting together uh, the kind of case that we would take to a jury necessarily. Certainly, we are painstakingly acquiring whatever evidence is available. Uh, but I'm not sure that uh, 
it would be appropriate or prudent for the United States to um, just uh, pursue this legally, to try to, as we did with uh, the first uh, incident at the World Trade Centers, uh, the bombing, you know, spend uh, years tracking down the perpetrators, bringing them uh, back to justice. Uh, this is a much more like the bombings of our embassies in Kenya and Tanzania. Uh, this is an act of war, and I think we have to respond accordingly. Senator, finally, there was an Associated Press report today saying, quoting senior officials as saying in the final days of President Clinton's administration, your husband's administration, that there was specific intelligence about the whereabouts of Osama bin Laden, uh, that decisions, that it was discussed whether to take action, and ultimately a decision was made not to attack. Do you have any information about that? Well, Judy, I, I'm not privy to all the information. I know that um, there was uh, intelligence about his location. There was uh, a plan that was put into place uh, to try to pinpoint his location. Uh, it relied, as I recall, on uh, human intelligence assets, namely people who were on the ground providing us with information. And my memory is that at the last minute, uh, those uh, assets proved unreliable and were not able to form the basis for the kind of uh, uh, firm footing that is needed for launching uh, the sort of attack that we are considering. Um, that is how I remember it, but as I say, I, I wasn't in the thick of it. Uh, but I do remember very well we acted similarly uh, with respect to the cruise missiles that uh, were launched uh, at his uh, camps in Afghanistan based on intelligence that he would be there at the time. Uh, it was very well thought out and planned and unfortunately uh, for whatever reason he turned out not to be there and I want to just add that this is part of the challenge that um, our current president faces. Uh, we are engaged in a battle with an adversary who lives in the shadows. When we were bombed at Pearl Harbor we knew where the enemy was. Uh, and not only does he have his own assets, but because of his uh, considerable wealth and connections uh, with regimes and organizations around the world, he does have his own intelligence uh, network, uh, people within governments and military operations uh, who frankly keep him apprised of what we or anyone else uh, are interested in. So that's one of the reasons why I really support uh, the kind of painstaking, patient approach that the president is pursuing. I know there, there are some who think, you know, we should be able to, you know, launch an attack, press a button tonight, but that's not the way this can be done, and I think all Americans have to be resolute. We have to be prepared for uh, the action that will come and very supportive of those working with the president uh, who are putting together the pieces, as difficult as that is, to give us the basis for action. All right, Senator Hillary Rodham Clinton of New York uh, talking to us from the U.S. Capitol just a little over an hour after the Capitol had to be evacuated because of a threat. Senator, thank you very much for being with us. Thank you, Judy. Thank you. And now back to Bill in Atlanta. Judy, thank you. Senator Clinton mentioning the name Osama bin Laden. We have heard his name so many times lately. We have also heard about the group known as the Taliban back in Afghanistan. But how is it that this group and this man could intersect with the lives of ordinary Americans? CNN's Christian Amanpour now with a bit of history. When the Soviet Union invaded the treacherous and mountainous terrain of Afghanistan on the eve of the 1980s, it quickly found its own Vietnam. This superpower was taken on and eventually forced out by a network of Afghan guerrilla groups known as the Mujahideen. The Cold War was still on and the United States helped recruit these resistance fighters through its allies in the region, allies like Pakistan, which borders Afghanistan. Osama bin Laden was one of those fighters and after the war with the Soviets, he took control of the guerrilla network which was swelled by fighters from all over the Islamic world. Bin Laden's group grew out of the Mujahideen forces that were trained initially by the Pakistani intelligence services and the Pakistani military and also of course funded by the United States. 
But the United States is faulted for failing to track the growing ranks of radical Muslim guerrillas once the Soviet occupation ended. Afghanistan then descended into civil war and eventually split into two main blocs. On one side, the Northern Alliance, a loose network of ethnic minorities, nominally led by the charismatic Ahmad Shah Massoud, known as the Afghan mastermind of the Soviet defeat. He has not been seen since a bomb attack by assassins last week. On the other side, the Taliban, a fundamentalist Islamic movement representing the ethnic majority. They captured the capital Kabul in 1996 and are now in control of almost all Afghanistan. But their repressive regime, particularly their harsh treatment of women, have earned them almost universal condemnation. The West also accuses the Taliban of harboring Osama bin Laden, America's enemy number one. Pakistan is one of only three countries recognizing the Taliban as the legitimate government and now it's under intense pressure from the United States to get the Taliban to give up bin Laden. We regard terrorism as an evil that threatens the world community. Concerted international effort is needed to fight terrorism in all its forms and manifestations. Experts point out the Taliban itself is divided between hardliners and some who would prefer more cooperation with the West. Some analysts believe the United States should now offer ultimatums and incentives to the Taliban to give up bin Laden, at least as a first measure before a military attack. Christian Amanpour, CNN, London. Christian, helping us with our understanding of the Taliban, Osama bin Laden, and all the key players who may or may not be connected to all this. We want to go immediately now to the Justice Department coverage from CNN's Kelly Arena, who is our justice correspondent. There's some new developments on that front. Kelly. Joey, uh, we just found out from New York City police officials and FBI sources that there has been an arrest made at uh, John F. Kennedy Airport in New York City of a man who was uh, purportedly uh, trying to use fake pilot credentials. There also, we are told, up to five or six people that have been detained. Uh, they are being questioned by the FBI. Those people uh, had tried to either board flight, had bought tickets, tried to board flights when their names were punched into uh, airport secuter, computers. Um, security red flag was raised. Uh, we don't know why. It could have been immigration. It could be for a variety of reasons. But those people were detained and are now being questioned. Uh, earlier today, the FAA had uh, issued a ground stop on all New York City area airports and uh, and now the details are finally tricking out as to why that action was taken. Joey? Is there a further update on the airports themselves, Kelly? No, I don't, Joey. Uh, I've been I've been covering the law enforcement angle on this on this story. All right. Well, CNN's Kelly Arena, our justice correspondent, following up in details on that. Thanks very much, Bill. Uh, Joey, we saw a plane leave uh, Dulles International Airport. I think it was oh uh, two and a half hours ago. Air Nippon leaving back for Tokyo, Japan. Going to go there now. Kathleen Koch stationed there. Kathleen, what do you have for us now? Bill, the FAA has announced that the closest airport to the nation's capital, Reagan National Airport, will now remain closed for the foreseeable future. They're saying that that decision has been made because of, quote, its proximity to key federal installations, including the Pentagon. Now, what that will mean is that anyone in the Washington, D.C. area wanting to try to fly out will have to come here to Dulles International Airport or go to Baltimore, Washington International Airport. Now, as you mentioned, the first flights finally started to Starting here about 5.30 this evening, an all Nippon Airways flight bound for Tokyo, Japan, and people were indeed very relieved to get on it and be able to leave. Uh, so things are beginning to get back to business here, though, albeit on a much smaller scale than normal. You are seeing people lining up at the ticket counters. You are seeing people, of course, no curbside check-in that has been eliminated. And very interestingly, some people are getting quite a surprise when they approach the security screening checkpoints. Not only now have our knives and box cutters no longer allowed in carry-on baggage, any sharp metal object is banned. So we saw numerous men opening up their shaving kits and throwing out razor after razor into the trash can. And what is very telling, Bill, is the fact that the people who are, who are 
manning these checkpoints told us that they have not had one single passenger complain about that at all today. One woman who is confiscating those razors said that when it comes to security, that now people really do understand. Uh, another thing that we have noted here at the airport is that as across America, American flags are popping up everywhere. We are seeing them. There are two of them hanging on the, uh, the control towers. They're popping up behind the departure counters. Uh, there are, this airport is under construction, so construction cranes are actually flying the American flag. Even ground crew vehicles that are moving around. So, Bill, we are seeing here that again, as in New York, as, as across the country, there is a real determination to, to express that feeling that, that America is not giving up and will persevere. Kathleen, Bill, got a call from my sister yesterday in Cleveland, Ohio, saying a Walmart there was handing the flags out for free for anyone who came into the store. Curious to know from the passengers that you've talked to today, do they have any apprehension about climbing back on board one of these planes, 757, a 767 and the like? Bill, we talked to passengers here uh, yesterday who are coming to pick up their bags, asking them that question, and then passengers leaving today. And to a person, everyone said they believe that now with this additional security that's being implemented, that they will be safer than, say, they would have been flying on Monday. That does not mean that they're not nervous. It does not mean that they are they're not apprehensive. But they believe that, that what's been done, at least, is, is a good step toward making the entire nation safer when they fly. Kathleen Koch, live at Dulles. Kathleen, thanks. When you get more, let us know. I want to also let our viewers know at this time, we reported about an hour ago at JFK International Airport outside of New York City there, several men have been detained for questioning about all the information we have at this point. But in addition to that, Numerous FBI officials responded to JFK, and as a result, LaGuardia, JFK, and Newark, the three major airports serving the New York City area, have been shut down at this point. Again, we anticipated flights to continue from there, but to this point, that has not been the case. We'll keep you posted as soon as we get more information here. Now, Joey. And CNN continuing to watch on all fronts the latest developments. Of course, we'll bring those to you as soon as they come in to us. Right now, another group watching over all that has been happening, shaping up since Tuesday's our crossfire gang. Joining us now is CNN's Bill Press. Thank you, Joey, very much. Together with all the sorrow and the anger and the rage that we Americans feel about Tuesday's terrorist attacks against this country, we also have a lot of questions about how something like this could happen and how we might respond. Tonight, we turn for answers to two United States senators. Joining us, first, uh, Senator Chuck Hagel, Republican from the state of Nebraska and ranking member of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee, and Senator Bob Graham, a Democrat from Florida who's chair of the Senate Intelligence Committee. Bob Novak. Senator Graham, we have had some interesting developments today. The Senate was evacuated. The House of Representatives was evacuated. Several government buildings downtown was evacuated. Several blocks have been cordoned off downtown. The, now we hear the word the Reagan National Airport may be closed indefinitely. And the Vice President of the United States, Dick Cheney, was spirited off to Camp David. Can you tell us, as Chairman of the Intelligence Committee, is something going on? Or are we just a little bit nervous after the catastrophe of Tuesday? Bob, I can tell you that uh, Tuesday was not a single chapter event, that there is still the possibility of further uh, events, uh, terrorist attacks, not necessarily of the same form, uh, directed against uh, the American people. And therefore, this heightened sense of alert that we've seen so much of today is very much warranted. But no specific uh, event. No, there's no of. specific. Uh, target of uh, where, when, who, or how. Uh, Senator Graham, uh, as far as a retaliation goes, are we talking about a surgical Delta Force taking out uh, some uh, terrorists, or are we talking more of a military operation, heavy bombing, cruise missiles? Uh, that uh, is Senator, I'm sorry, we have to interrupt. We have to go back to CNN for breaking news, and we go to CNN's Jamie McIntyre. Jamie? John. Well, Bill, uh, in an interview that's going to air tonight on CNN's Larry King Live, Defense Secretary Donald Rumsfeld said that the United States has fighter planes on 15-minute strip alert at 26 bases around the country. And Pentagon sources tell me tonight that the Pentagon is considering a substantial call-up of reservists in part 
to provide air crews and pilots to continue to man those planes as they sit on the runway in preparation just in case something happens. Meanwhile, Defense Secretary Rumsfeld does say that he has discontinued the combat air patrols of fighter planes over most U.S. metropolitan areas. However, those uh, fighter planes are still uh, flying in the New York to Washington corridor. Uh, again, it appears the Pentagon is considering a call-up of a significant number of reservists, not just uh, though for pilots and air crews, but also other areas of special uh, specialty where they need uh, assistance. Already about 10,000 National Guard troops have been called up by the state's governors, uh, by governors in 31 states, but the activation of reservists is something that can only be done by presidential order. The last time it was done was in the uh, 1991 Persian Gulf War when over 200,000 reservists were called up. Bill? Thank you, Jamie. Bob, pick Let me up there. That question: Are we considering a commando-type Delta Force raid on the guerrillas, or a big military operation? This is not going to be a pinprick, uh, Bob. Uh, our nation was struck in a way that we have not experienced since uh, Pearl Harbor. Uh, more loss of life in a single day, uh, any day since uh, Antietam in the Civil War, uh, within the uh, continental United States. Uh, this was a crushing blow directed at the American people and there will be an equivalent response equivalent and response. those who have harbored and supported and assisted and allowed uh, these terrorists to, to act will be treated as terrorists. Uh, Senator Hago, I'd like to, you, you heard uh, Jamie McIntyre's report uh, about these planes saying by people being called up. Is this a proper response? Are you surprised at this? Did you know about this? Uh, I did not know about it specifically. Uh, we were told generally this was, was a, a very viable option. It is a, an appropriate response. Uh, what Senator Graham has uh, laid out here is exactly right. Uh, I think we have to face the facts here uh, that not only do we have a, a short-term issue here, but probably more importantly, this is a long-term uh, uh, fight against organized terrorism worldwide. Uh, all the appropriate responses that we must put together now to deal with this, uh, uh, we have to consider. So what they're doing, I think, is exactly the right thing. Senators, we're going to bring uh, CNN's Jamie McIntyre back into our discussion. Uh, Jamie, can you tell us again, when is this uh, effective? Uh, well, right now, there has not actually been a, a final decision made, but Pentagon sources say that they are working the, uh, the process of drawing up a plan to uh, call up several thousand reserves uh, to f uh, fill in some of these positions. Part of this may depend on whether Defense Secretary Rumsfeld believes it's necessary to, to continue to have these fighter planes on what's called strip alert at bases across the country. Uh, but even if that is uh, discontinued, there are some special areas um, uh, in which uh, the U.S. military has some specialties in water purification, perhaps in air traffic control or, or logisticians or even medical support that might be needed and uh, the Pentagon is considering a call up of reserves for those kinds of tasks as well. And does this, is this accompanied by any uh, increased activity or, or calls for alert around the world of U.S. forces, Jamie? Well, U.S. forces have been on pretty high alert around the world. In fact, uh, uh, Pentagon sources tell me that yesterday uh, the, the U.S. was at what's called DEFCON 3, which is the uh, third highest level of alert. Um, according to sources, we've come down to DEFCON 4 today, uh, 5 being the lowest, uh, 1 being the highest level of alert. So uh, the U.S. military is still on pretty high alert. Uh, around the country, but uh, I'm not. I, I think that this call-up of reservists is more tied to getting people with special skills into areas where they can uh, be some help as we've uh, uh, beefed up the military presence around the world. And I guess final question: Is this is this any sign that any military response on the part of the United States is imminent? Well, the uh, Pentagon, the State Department, the White House have all dropped lots of uh, signs that uh, a military response is in the future. I'm not sure how imminent it is. Uh, I think this is really just a, a signal of the fact that uh, the military is getting a lot more attention. It's going to be getting a lot more funding. Um, they're going to try to bring everything up to a greater state, state of readiness so that when they feel, when the United States feels it is capable of acting, it'll be fully ready to act. Thanks, right. Jamie. Thanks very much. Back to Senator Hagel and Senator Graham. I'd like to ask both the senators, both uh, familiar with intelligence, former uh, CIA Director Jim Wolsey has said that he thinks there is a state supporting this terrorism which struck us on Tuesday. And he said a suspect, a good suspect, is Iraq. 
Senator Hagel, do you think that, that, that Iraq may be involved in this? Uh, I, I don't know, but I think uh, we need to take what uh, Mr. Woolsey says very seriously. It seems to me that we must uh, include uh, all possibilities uh, in this uh, net as we examine the facts and get the facts so that we can react with facts. Uh, I don't know if Iraq was involved or not, but they certainly should be examined pretty closely. What do you think, what do you think well, the, like pattern, of the pattern of terrorism, Bob, is that uh, most of the significant terrorist cells around the world do have some linkage back uh, to a sovereign nation that can provide them with financial support, with safe uh, havens if those are required. Uh, our policy is, as it should be, that a state which provides support to a terrorist is treated as a terrorist and the retaliation will be uh, but the we've same. Had a, we've had a long history with Iraq, though. I just wondered if you think uh, that is a, a possibility. A lot of people say that uh, Saddam Hussein may be a bad guy, but he's not crazy. And to be involved in this is, uh, is signing his own death warrant, uh, considering our power. How do you gentlemen feel on that? Well, one thing is, is quite obvious, and it was very clear uh, Tuesday evening. This was a very sophisticated operation, uh, unlike anything the world, quite frankly, has ever seen. The infrastructure, the training, the financing, all the information gathering intelligence that went into this it was pretty significant now that could very well lead to a state sponsored involvement not maybe the front line of this but certainly something in the in the dark recesses well, of the background speaking and, and of an it, answer to your question i would say iraq has to be on any short list of suspect states that have been providing that support speaking of intelligence that's one area where many people feel that uh, we were let down i'd like you to listen to one of your colleagues uh, Congressman James Trafficant always puts it colorfully had to say about the, the failure there of our intelligence community. Here he is. America gives sixty billion dollars a year to the FBI and CIA for intelligence. And the truth is, we learned of every one of these tragedies from Fox News and CNN. With zero intelligence on our part, Senator. Well, I defer to the chairman. Well, I'm sorry, first, Mr. Chairman. I, uh, first, uh, we may well find, when all the facts are in, that there has been a serious uh, failure of intelligence. We have known for some time that there were areas of considerable weakness in our intelligence capacity, particularly spies. Uh, the fact that our listening devices were becoming technologically out of date and that we were not able to analyze but a small percentage of the information that we collected. Those are serious deficiencies, which I am pleased to say that uh, we started several months ago identifying and developing uh, a, a five-year plan to correct. And I imagine that the events of Tuesday are going to accelerate that five-year plan. But let me ask you, Senator, a couple of Republican senators who today are reportedly seeking support to call for the resignation of CIA Director George Tenet because of the fact that we were caught flat-footed. Do you join that call tonight? Uh, no, I don't. I think uh, that's premature. We will uh, get the facts here uh, through, obviously, the appropriate hearings and means, and, and uh, uh, Senator Graham and other committee chairmen will be involved in that, we'll, uh, as will all the appropriate committee members. But uh, I, I would only uh, make this observation. Uh, it has been 25 years, over the last 25 years, that we have seen a constant erosion of human intelligence. Now, that term gets bandied around uh, often, and, mm -hmm. and Senator Graham knows an awful lot about this business. But in fact, uh, I think uh, because we are so without human intelligence, it may very well be that that was one of the prime factors here. Uh, that uh, has produced this gap and somewhere. Just, just for people who haven't been listening, we're talking about spies. Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. yeah, and we're talking about different types of spies. We're yes. talking about those that are U.S. nationals who are employees of our intelligence agencies. We're also talking about spies who we recruit who are foreign nationals. And there we well, have some legal limitations. Today, if a potential foreign spy who has offered himself to work for us has had a bad background, and frankly most of these people didn't come out of monasteries, uh, <laughs> then they are, are rendered ineligible to be hired by the United States. And that's I, a bad policy, if, isn't yeah, it, if, Senator? If, if you're going to attack terrorists, you're going to be dealing with be people... Changed? you're going to be dealing with people who are dirty or they wouldn't right. have the access okay. to get inside That's going to be cell. changed. Uh, I hope so. That is not a law. That is a policy of okay. the CIA. Sen Senator Graham, uh, 
uh, William uh, Bennett, who was a former cabinet member, a man I respect, was on this network last night, and he said something uh, which rather startled me about the possible uh, targets of retaliation. And let's just listen to it. Senator Bennett, I mean, William Bennett. And it's not just these individuals and groups, but it's these nations, these states that sponsor or support. That could be a lot of people. That could be Syria, that could be uh, Libya, that could be Lebanon, that could be Iraq and Iran, it could be China. Now, uh, I have uh, General Bennett uh, declaring war against Islam and China. That's, if you add them all up, that's about two billion people. I know he didn't mean to attack them all at once, but is that something we have to be careful about, of isolating ourselves so that we are against, uh, we are really separating ourselves from a large part of humanity in this? Well, what, what we need to do is to be very careful that when we have uh, identified the perpetrator of this horrific event that we are able to establish beyond a doubt uh, who it was because we're going to be trying to get the world community starting with NATO to come together uh, in a common cause against terrorism we can't attack two billion just people go, around the world but we can attack a nation that we have uh, uncontested evidence has been and we, harboring and supporting and we terrorists. We can't attack somebody just because we don't like them. That's right. We've, well, we've, that's, we, we've got to have uh, the uh, irrefutable evidence. My, my question to you, Senator Hagel, we, we, we huffed and we puffed after the bombing of our embassies in Africa and we bombed Sudan and Afghanistan and it turns out we bombed the wrong targets and we killed a lot of innocent people. Mm -hmm. How do we know we'll get it right this time? Mm -hmm. Well, uh, we don't is the quick answer, but uh, I am confident that uh, the maximum effort and focus and resources will be put into this. It must be put into this using our international coalition that's being put together. Essentially, it's the coalition of the civilized world, Bill, that but, we're dealing with here that we, must, uh, that we must put together in order to drive a stake through the heart but, of, this, of this scourge. But here, here's what I've seen happen, that we, we get angry and we strike maybe a pinprick or something, Osama bin Laden, but he's still on the prowl. Go after Saddam Hussein, he's, he's still in power. Will we have the resolve to this time to stick with it and finish the job? Bill, we, we must. I said earlier, Senator Graham has said the same thing. This is a long-term effort. We, we must make no mistake. America must understand the free world. This isn't a one-month project. Yeah, and I think what we've got to also understand, this was not uh, a passing event that occurred on Tuesday. I think this was a real turning of the pages of history. Uh, the, the last page had words like uh, innocence and assumption of invulnerability. This new page uh, has under attack and we've got to act as a nation which is under attack on our own soil. Gentlemen, uh, we've been talking about an intelligence failure. Uh, there's also a security failure uh, when you have four uh, hijackings in one day. And of course, as we uh, today, tremendously tight security restrictions were being put into effect on American airports. How, how intelligent they were, I'm not sure. Do you have any concern, either of you, that the victim of all this is going to be the American air traveler and that you won't have appreciably more security, but you'll, it'll make uh, traveling a lot more difficult? Well, I, I would make one observation. Uh, uh, we are the most open mobile society probably in the history of mankind. Uh, we cherish our individual rights and liberties and conveniences, quite frankly. What we must find is a balance between preserving those individual liberties and the security of our institutions, our state, and our people. Just quickly, do you have a, any comment on that? Uh, I think cl clearly we are going to see uh, and the airports were probably one of the first places uh, that we're going to be living in this different uh, era. I personally uh, will not uh, question uh, if they look a second or third time at my bag as it goes on the airplane. Senator, Senator Bob Graham, thank you very much. Senator Chuck Hagel, thank you. And uh, back to Bill Hammer in Atlanta. All right, Bob and Bill and the Senators, thank you very much. We left off with Jamie McIntyre at the Pentagon. I want to get back to Jamie quickly. Jamie, you were talking about the call out to reserves coming up. I want you to clarify that again, but also curious to know about the current numbers that you're getting right now for the missing uh, there at the Pentagon following Tuesday morning's attack? Well, the current number is 190 missing and feared dead here at the Pentagon. That includes 126 uh, military and civilian workers at the Pentagon and the 64 passengers on that American Airlines flight 
that slammed into the side of the building. Uh, it is possible that the death toll could go a little higher. Some of the people who are injured are very badly burned and could succumb to their injuries. The hope at the Pentagon is that 190 number will be the, the top level. They've pretty much given up hope of finding any survivors in the rubble. They gave up hope on that really yesterday. And they have now taken about uh, 70 bodies out of the wreckage, and about 40 of those have been transferred to the U.S. Air Force Base in Dover, Delaware. Bill? Jamie, also a pretty strong statement from a high-ranking official there at the Pentagon that gave us a bit of an indication as of what they're considering in terms of retaliation. He made it clear that this would not be what many have termed a pinprick, but rather a sustained operation. How much clarification were we afforded today there, Jamie? Well, uh, they're being uh, at, at the same time vague but also very forceful. The statement that you refer to came from Deputy Defense Secretary Paul Wolfowitz who said that any military action would be a sustained campaign, uh, not a one-time thing. But uh, the message from all of the members of the administration has been that it may not, uh, the response is not just limited to military action, although that seems to be in the future, but also political, diplomatic, uh, uh, economic sanctions, uh, diplomatic pressure. Uh, it'll be a full frontal assault. And some interesting comments from Defense Secretary Donald Rumsfeld in an interview uh, that he uh, gave to uh, CNN's Larry King that'll air later tonight on CNN, where he talked about the, the, this theme that has been struck by the administration of going after not just terrorists, but those who support them, whether they are uh, host nations or whether they are, quote, non-state entities. But uh, if you can't get Osama bin Laden, the theory is here at the Pentagon, mm -hmm. then you can get the people who uh, support him. And uh, Secretary Rumsfeld said that if uh, nations or others harbor terrorists or if they support terrorists, he said, even tolerating terrorists in your country, uh, it makes you as responsible as the terrorists themselves. So a very uh, strong hint going out that the United States is considering uh, taking action, not just military, also economic, uh, uh, diplomatic, against those who support mm -hmm. uh, people like Osama bin Laden and other uh, suspected terrorists. Jamie, quickly here, what indications have you been given about U.S. military uh, preparations, uh, in a manner of speaking? Have aircraft carriers been moved? Have planes been on the ready? What are you hearing? Well. There, uh, there hasn't been a lot. The U.S. is already deployed around the world. They are, uh, the U.S. aircraft carrier Enterprise, which was supposed to return home from a, a stint in the Persian Gulf, has been told to stay in the Persian Gulf region. Uh, so that has one move. Uh, in the United States, fighter planes are on strip alert at 26 bases across the country, but that's basically for what they call homeland defense. That's uh, while they still want to make sure that there's no threat of some sort of an ad additional um, uh, terrorist commandeering of uh, passenger airliners and that sort of thing. That will last uh, for a while. But overall, the United States military is being brought up to a, its highest state of readiness. And uh, today, the Pentagon was told that it would get to 20, perhaps $40 billion more to help uh, uh, make sure that the U.S. military is at its uh, highest state of combat readiness uh, for the uh, eventuality of being called up. And some are suggesting that may just be the first initial payment. We shall see. Jamie McIntyre at the Pentagon. Thanks, Jamie. Here's Jamie. To our viewers, we've been telling you that most of the nation's airports have been opened back up, at least for limited service in the course of this day, the exceptions being in ground stops at the big New York airports because of some detentions of people at JFK International Airport this evening. Also, Reagan National uh, flights have not gotten underway yet. The FAA, though, reports no additional reasons for security, security issues at the Minneapolis-St. Paul Airport. However, Northwest Airlines this evening, which was to have resumed its flights, some of its flights around 6 o'clock tonight, has announced that they will not be doing that, that they will ground their planes at least for this evening because a uh, spokesman telling CNN that this was not a prudent night to fly. That is a quote from a Northwest spokesman. Again, Northwest Airlines deciding that they will not do any flights yet tonight. We will stay tuned and see if any other airlines follow suit. On other things that are not quite open yet, the New York Stock Exchange will not reopen tomorrow, but on Monday instead, trading to resume at the usual time, 9.30 on Monday morning. National Football League has made a decision to cancel week two of the NFL season. Games to resume there on Sunday, September 23rd. Also, Congress passed a resolution today urging the country to fly the star and stripes if you're not already. If you've been at all outside, you've noticed that most people, a lot of people anywhere, are doing that already. Several major retailers say they've run out 
of U.S. flags at individual outlets. Another note, a sign in the skies, combat aircraft patrolling above some major U.S. cities. You may notice them, including above Washington. In words and gestures today, U.S. officials are speaking unmistakably of their thoughts today. Bill. I'm going to take our viewers back to New York. Videotape just into us here at CNN. A familiar face back in Manhattan. The former president, Bill Clinton, went near the scene there in Manhattan. After just returning from Australia, the president was stranded there, given the, uh, the number of airports that were shut down. We shall listen to the tape and the hugging at this time. Former President Bill Clinton back in New York today. Again, the videotape coming in just a short time ago. We have heard from several former presidents today. Former President George Bush, number 41, and also Jimmy Carter checked in yesterday and on Tuesday as well with comments. Uh, Joey talked about the, uh, the swelling of patriotism that we are starting to see ripple in a bit of a strong wave across the country. So much of our focus is on New York and Washington, D.C. for obvious reasons. But in the New York Times today, this particular ad caught our attention. New York City and Washington, D.C., Oklahoma cares. You stood with us in our darkest hour. Now we stand with you, the people of Oklahoma and the Oklahoma City National Memorial. And they, too, have indeed had one heck of a year dating back to June. And for many people, closure with the execution of Timothy McVeigh. There's the ad that we see in the New York Times in its full page. And important to point out, too, here, I don't know if many people can take the pulse about what's happening uh, globally, but I've heard from so many friends in England and in Germany and in Italy just over the past couple of days calling to make sure that everyone's okay back here. And also, they want to make the express point that they are behind what is happening here in the U.S. too. And I think that's critical because we've seen European capitals, specifically Moscow today and also all over Germany today, taking time out in a five-minute pause of silence. And we saw the Star-Spangled Banner at Buckingham Palace, which has never been done before uh, for the changing the guard there. And I think it's important to point out that as we see the wave ripple across the country, it's not just here, but it's overseas as well. And uh, that's what we're sensing here uh, outside of New York and outside of Washington, D.C. Indeed, Bill. Uh, the darkest hour, indeed, the darkest hour for the city of New York, where so many people are still trying to find their loved ones, still hoping against hope that they, there will be some sort of good news, that they will be able to get some sort of positive information about those they love. CNN's Elizabeth Cohen has been outside the armory where so many people have gathered looking for additional information. Elizabeth rejoins us now there. Elizabeth. Joey, yes, I'm at the Armory. They have, for since the early morning hours, have been talking to families who are looking for their lost loved ones. The line goes around the block, and then when they come in, they give information about their loved ones, and the, um, they take it all down. They take down their phone number, and they tell them that basically what they can do is wait. Right now, we have here with us Sonia Rodriguez, who is going to tell us the story of a real hero. Let's talk about Fred Marone. He is your brother-in-law's father. Tell yeah. me how his morning started. Well, um, he was in Jersey uh, City in the office um, there when he no, you know, found out about the first explosion, went through the tunnel. Um, last thing they knew was that as everyone was coming out of one of the towers, they were not quite sure which tower, he was going up to get his men because they have an office there at the World Trade Center. Um, he was, uh, he spoke to his assistant director, he was in the stairwell, and told him very calmly that he was fine and that he was just going up to get his men, which I believe their office is in the 60th floor, I'm not quite sure, and, um, well, the phone went dead and that was it. There was no bang, there was nothing, it just went dead. 
So Fred Marone is the Director of Public Safety for the Port Authority of New York and New Jersey, which yeah. has offices in the World Trade Center, or had offices right. in the World Trade Center and in Jersey City. So he started the day in Jersey City right. when he heard about the explosion. Yeah. He didn't run away, he ran to the oh, explosion. Oh no, this man is amazing. He, if anybody's going to be a hero, he is. He is like a bear, you know? We're all rooting for him because we know if he's okay, he's going to be fine, he's going to be helping other people, he's going to be motivating other people, he's going to be telling other people that it's, they're going to be okay, you know? This man does not do anything, he, you know, he has no self-acts, uh, self he's, he's very selfless, you know? Um, now so. you went to the armory today to register information yeah. about him, mm -hmm. and you ended up staying. Tell me why you stayed. Well, I saw that there was a lot to be done, and I, um, you know, there were a lot of people who didn't know where to go and what to do, and um, I kind of just <laughs> threw myself in. Um, I was helping with the Salvation Army, um, feeding people, cleaning up, making sure that anyone who had any questions, if I was able to answer them, that, you know, I was there for them. So I ended up staying, and I just got out. It was amazing to me, you said earlier to me, that a very few people, you said only two in the whole time you were there, actually broke down. I mean, that's amazing. Two people. Everything at, in the Armory right now is very well organized. Um, everyone knows their post and they're speaking to people with a lot of sensitivity. And um, I can't tell you, I mean, for a day like this, everything inside is being well run. And so, you know, people are very uh, melancholy and they're distraught, but they're holding in because people working there are being great troopers. Now after they register upstairs and register all their information, they go downstairs to look at some lists. Right. Tell me about those lists. Right. This list is of everyone who has been identified, everyone who um, is in a hospital, whether you know it's any of the main hospitals. Um, and uh, once you go through that list, I don't know if you want to know about the second list. The second list is a little, uh, you know, it's a sad situation. If you can't find the name of your loved one in the first list, they'll give you the second list of all the people that they, they may know something about, but that, not all the information, but that they have found um, um, gone, that they, they've been gone, they're dead. And I ask you this not to be gory because I think it's important for people to realize how how specific this is. I mean, the the, the lists are, are are bodies that they found. Well, yeah, their bodies that they found. The second list, you know, um, they'll give as much information as I said as possible. They'll say, you know, white male, um, blue eyes, brown hair. Um. Closed through the weekend. Baseball games, Major League, possibly possibly resuming on Monday and this weekend's NASCAR race in New Hampshire also has been postponed until November. And all around the country, besides sporting events, a lot of, at least locally and regionally, events classified as, quote, major are in the process of being rethought. Some of them will go on as scheduled, some of them will be postponed, uh, some of them may simply be canceled. You want to keep that in mind uh, and perhaps check on all of those events. And remember, tomorrow has been designated by the President as a National Day of Prayer and Remembrance. We remind you again that uh, we have a lot of information on our website, CBS News, CBS.com. You are watching continuing CBS News coverage of the attack on America. You're watching CBS 2 News at 5, Attack on America. Shocked and stunned, but with anger and growing determination, the country begins to rally after the attack on America. Where the World Trade Center once stood, a new fright as another weakened building sends rescue teams running. And across the country, planes are flying again, two days after the attack on America. Good evening. It's 5 o'clock. I'm Ann Martin. I'm Harold Green. At the top of the hour, from New York and Washington to right here in L.A., a flurry of new developments tonight in the attack on America. Here's the very latest. Here's what we know. Late today, a bomb scare emptied the Capitol building in Washington, D.C. Also, Vice President Dick Cheney is now at Camp David and will remain there over the weekend as a safety precaution. In New York City, Mayor Giuliani reports nearly 5,000 people are missing in the devastation at the World Trade Center. And two firefighters who were trapped today in the rubble of the Trade Center have now been rescued. Meantime, all 18 hijackers on the four doomed planes have been identified. 
And the NFL and Major League Baseball have canceled all games through the weekend. Well, while thousands of rescue workers are... This evening is out. We could have photographs of them. Seven people are in custody at two New York airports tonight. Reportedly, they produced pilot licenses which appear to be counterfeit. There is now no service out of New York airports. Searchers have recovered the flight data recorder from the plane that went down in Pennsylvania and picked up a signal from the black box in the jet that slammed into the Pentagon. At least they hope it's a signal. Coming up tonight, we'll have the latest on the investigation, remarkable stories of courage, the heartbreaking stories of families still searching for their loved ones. I'll also have a conversation with Senator Hillary Clinton, who will be joining Tim Russert in Washington. New York Mayor Rudy Giuliani will be talking to us. We'll be talking with General Norman Schwarzkopf and with the Republican and Democratic leadership of the House of Representatives. We'll begin tonight, however, with NBC's Pete Williams and the very latest on this investigation. Pete. Tom, we're not probably going to see uh, now the uh, Justice Department is telling us pictures of the 18 hijackers. They had said earlier this afternoon that they would release the names of the hijackers and photographs of those that they could clearly document. Now they're pulling back on that, apparently concerned about the accuracy of some of the photographs. And that did seem somewhat over-optimistic earlier today on the Justice Department's part that they could get that information to us, given all the how careful they usually are about these things. So that's part of the investigation, identifying those 18 hijackers. They now say five hijackers each on the two aircraft that left Boston and flew into the World Trade Center, four each on the other two planes, the one that went from Washington Dulles into the Pentagon, the other that went from Newark and crash landed in Pennsylvania. The other part of this investigation, trying to identify the associates who may still be at large and could pose a potential danger. Now, here is an interesting statistic at this point. The FBI agents have opened this many cases, 4,000 active investigative leads. Now that's not telephone tips, that's not internet phone call or internet tips from people with just uh, reporting suspicious activity in the neighborhood. This is actual leads for FBI agents to follow up. Easy to understand how you get there, you take 18 uh, hijackers, you multiply that by the number of phone calls they made, internet at uh, times they used email, transactions, credit card purchases. It, it sends out a very large number of people and that's what the FBI is trying to figure out. Nonetheless, investigators say tonight, they have identified some of these people, some who are intimates. Apparently, they're very concerned about a person who was arrested tonight or uh, earlier today in Germany after a, a tip they gave to German officials. But here's the key question. Could there be, could there have been other terror attacks planned by these uh, people who were involved in this large conspiracy. What a senior uh, uh, administration official tells me tonight is that there is no indication that there was such an attack. They have no evidence to indicate there were other attacks planned on Tuesday that were somehow foiled or that were planned for subsequent days. But this official says, quote, it be, would be foolish to assume that that was it. Tom. All right. Thanks very much, NBC's Pete Williams tonight. The very latest on the investigation, Israel, of course, has long lived with the daily threat of terrorism. One of Israel's toughest hawks is former Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu. I spoke with him earlier today, and he issued this very blunt warning. And this, I think, has been a wake-up call from hell. It is telling us you have the power now to act, summon the will, because the terrorists have the will to destroy America, to destroy freedom, to destroy all of America's allies and all the democracies, Israel being simply on the front line. They have the will, but they don't have the power. That's former Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu. And joining me now from Washington is the House Democratic leader, Richard Gephardt of Missouri. Uh, Congressman, let me say, first of all, I've never seen such uh, bipartisan unanimity in Washington in many, many years. Well, Tom, there's uh, no air and there's no light between the president and the Congress and between the Republican and Democratic parties. We stand shoulder to shoulder. We're going to take up a resolution tonight for an appropriation of uh, probably $40 billion to give the resources the president needs uh, and that we all need to solve this problem. Uh, and, Congressman, there has been a movement in the Senate, at least, to get some kind of sense of Congress down on paper, if not an official declaration of war. Do you think that that's going to be appropriate? Well, I think in the next two days we'll be taking up in the House and Senate uh, a resolution to give the president the legal authority 
to go after the folks who perpetrated this violence and to try to prevent further acts of violence from happening to the United States. There is an economic reality to all of this as well. Just three days ago, there was great concern about what is happening to the surplus. Some talk about rolling back parts of the tax cut. Do you think that that will become necessary given the cost of this operation and the hit that the American economy understandably will take? Well, I don't know the answer to that. We'll get to those economic questions after we get done what we need to do right now, which is address this problem. But let me say something to you. After Pearl Harbor, this country went through a five-year war. We won that war. We spent lots of resources doing it, and we involved all of our population. I hope this isn't that kind of war and doesn't last that long, but we've got to anticipate that it might, and I do not think it'll hurt our economy. I think ultimately we'll prevail, and our economy will be back, and our freedom will be back as well. Uh, during World War II, as you know very well, there were some major sacrifices made by the American people on the home front, and they were more than happy to do that. Also, some suspension of civil liberties. Will that be necessary as well? Well, I hope we don't do it in exactly the way we did it in World War II. We imprisoned Japanese Americans wrongly. Uh, that took away people's civil, civil liberties in a wrong way. Uh, we need to find a new balance, clearly, between freedom and security, and we're going to all work together. I said to the president the other day, we've all got to lead all of us to a conclusion for balancing those conflicting goals in a better way. We live in a new world. It's never going to be the same as it was. We have to, though, fight terrorism and have the will to fight this so that we succeed. Thank you very much, Richard Gephardt, who is the Democratic leader of the House of Representatives, a longtime congressman from the state of Missouri. During the course of our coverage tonight, we'll also be speaking, we trust, with the House Speaker, Dennis Hastert of Illinois, the leading Republican in the House. And joining me now from very near the World Trade Center is NBC's David Bloom with the latest on the recovery and rescue efforts that are going on down there. David. Well, Tom, we just heard a pretty frightening sound here in lower Manhattan. That's the sound of the evacuation horns sounding. That happened just a few minutes ago. The workers, the rescue workers, running quickly, literally stampeding down the road toward us, away from that. This has become a fairly constant sound here in lower Manhattan throughout today. Essentially what's happening, of course, is that they're working amidst this fallen rubble. The great news today is that three firefighters were recovered. Now, I hasten to add, to the best of our knowledge and everything that we've learned, these were not people trapped inside after Tuesday's attack. Rather, they're firefighters trapped in the shifting debris, in the falling rubble, in the sometimes partially collapsing buildings that they're still coping with here in lower Manhattan. Again, these three firefighters trapped and then rescued all in the span of today. Again, Tom, it's a very perilous situation here because they're so worried about the structural integrity of the buildings surrounding the World Trade Center. The other significant development that several police officers leaving the scene told us about today, Tom, is that on the south side of the South Twin Tower, they were hearing tapping sounds late this afternoon. Tapping sounds that they told us, they understand, come from a woman tapping inside, perhaps someone still alive, from the rug, from the wreckage, from Tuesday. Those rescue workers are staying there, Tom, atop that shifting rubble, despite the concerns about what might happen if that rubble shifts any more than it already has. Tom? All right, thanks very much, NBC's David Bloom. Very likely we could be coming back to you before the end of this evening. Uh, that's a quick update on what has been going on tonight after about 5.30 Eastern time. It was a very busy day with fast-breaking developments. We want to put it all in context for you now and take you through it moment by moment. Here's Dateline's Stone Phillips. Morning, 48 hours after the world exploded. 48 hours that seem like forever. New York City struggles to get back on its feet. For many, today is the first day back on the job, the first attempt at returning to life as it was. But how is that even possible? Nothing could be quite normal, but this seems uh, much, much more normal than it was yesterday. There's no energy. People are just kind of like sleepwalking. For tens of thousands of workers here, there is simply no office to go to. Their buildings reduced to rubble or crumbling masonry. The Twin Towers, gone. 
The 47-story tower at Seven World Trade Center toppled. The 54-story tower at One Liberty Plaza, three blocks from the Trade Center, disintegrating, and numerous other buildings uninhabitable. 9 a.m., after a difficult morning commute, another transportation snarl as the investigation reaches across New York Harbor to Staten Island. Staten Island has essentially been shut down. The bridges have been closed going in and out of that borough of New York. Why? It is believed that the car that was used by one of the hijackers named Mohammed Atta may be there on Staten Island. They're trying to locate it. Uh, in the meantime, they're not letting anybody go in or out of Staten Island. In the tangled, still smoldering wreckage of the Trade Center towers, emergency teams continue their around-the-clock work. At about 10 a.m., the reason they are driving themselves to exhaustion. I believe that there's a good possibility that there's people in that building that are alive, and that's why we are treating this as a rescue effort still. This is not a recovery. We are trying to get in every possible void, every possible area that we can to try to see if there are people that we can save. But this morning's statistics threaten to overwhelm the flickering hopes of finding many alive amidst the tons of debris. New York Mayor Giuliani. We now have a count of 94 bodies that have been recovered, 46 of which have been identified. We have the gruesome and horrible situation that in many cases we recover only parts of bodies. And we have 70 in that category. Another number speaks graphically to the carnage. To hold all those pieces of the human wreckage, the mayor tells reporters that the city has waiting 30,000 body bags. And then there is the list of the missing. We have 4,763 uh, people on the missing persons list. That's a list that's uh, as inclusive as we can make it. It includes uh, the plane itself, the manifest. It includes uh, people that have been uh, identified to us by family members. And all over the city, pictures handed out by desperate families. This is Tim Stout, a father of three who was working on the 103rd floor of the North Tower, one of 680 missing from his company alone. Michael Lepore's office was on the 97th floor. Missing from his firm, another 700. Their families are hoping to find them, even if it's in a hospital bed. That's where Arthur Del Bianco's family found him, his leg broken, his respect unbounded for the courage of the rescuers. The firemen were phenomenal, phenomenal. They're true heroes. They were there, they went back in over and over again. Even after the first building started coming down, those guys went back inside, went back inside. Do you have the sense that there are still people underground? I want to believe that there's still people alive. At the Pentagon this morning, the talk is no longer of people missing. We're in what we call a recovery mode, which means that we're now trying to recover the remains of the body, make the situation as safe as we possibly can. The death toll now estimated at 126 on the ground, 64 on the plane, diverted by hijackers into the west wall of the Pentagon, causing a gaping hole as floors and ceilings collapsed. From the field in western Pennsylvania, where United Airlines Flight 93 went down, short of the hijackers' intended target, news of just how tough the recovery effort will be. It's very difficult to tell that the actual depth of the crater because of that, uh, the amount of dust there, and also what evidence is in the crater. So to the naked eye, there's not a whole lot there now. That's why we have archaeologists who are here on scene and will be working on that site so that we can properly recover that information. So far, no word that the black box flight recorder has been found, but there are other hints of the harrowing final moments from air traffic controllers in contact with the jet. They do have recordings uh, inside of the cockpit where they hear not only voices of the pilots, but once those voices diminish, they hear somebody else. They say they hear foreign voices, other voices, and more screaming aboard that plane. No word either on the black boxes from the other doomed flights that struck New York's Twin Towers. American Flight 11, which flew south, low over Manhattan, crashing into the first tower. United Flight 175, which 18 minutes later swooped in from the southwest, devastating oh the second building. Oh my God! Transportation oh, Secretary oh Norm Mineta, 10.30 this morning. The first official word that planes will soon be flying again. 
effective 11 a.m. Eastern Standard Time today, our national airspace system will reopen to commercial aviation. But Secretary Mineta says there will be new precautions. From this day forward, we are operating with tightened security. More extensive passenger screening, an end to curbside check-in, more parking restrictions, armed marshals on flights, less convenience, Mineta says, but more safety. Again, I strongly urge all passengers to allow plenty of time to deal with the heightened security procedures and also to exercise patience with airport and airline employees and security personnel. 11 a.m., President Bush calls New York, commending officials there and telling them he will visit the stricken city tomorrow. I'm weep and mourn with America. I'm going to a hospital right after this to comfort families. I wish I could comfort every single family whose lives have been affected. But make no mistake about it, my resolve is steady and strong about uh, winning this uh, war that has been declared on America. It's a new kind of war. And I understand it's a new kind of war. And this government will adjust. And this government will call others to join us to make sure this act, these acts, um, uh, the people who conducted these acts and those who harbor them are held accounted, accountable for their actions. After the call, the president turns to reporters with a message for America, its allies, and its enemies. The nation must understand this is now the focus of my administration. We will be very much engaged in domestic policy, of course. I look forward to working with Congress on a variety of issues. But now that war has been declared on us, we will lead the world to victory. From the Commander-in-Chief, determination and Could you emotion. Could sense as to what kind of prayers you are uh, thinking and where your heart is uh, for yourself as you well, work on that? Well, I think about myself right now. I think about the families, the children. Um, I'm, a, I'm a loving guy, and I'm also someone, however, who's got a job to do, and I intend to do it. And um, this is a terrible moment. But this country will not relent until we have saved ourselves and others from the terrible tragedy that came upon America. A short time later, the president visits survivors at a Washington hospital. A lot of really brave men and women. Midday, back in New York, the strain is showing. A rescue worker physically and emotionally spent. He lost his father um, as a firefighter. Um, this is the first news that his mother's getting that he's all right. He's also telling his mom that, he's also telling his mother that he helped rescue someone, that he pulled someone from the rubble. He just told me a few moments ago, Lester, that um, he, he held the hand of someone who was down beneath the rubble. We're also hearing reports that there could be as many as five firefighters who have just in the last hour and a half or so have been pulled alive. I had reached down and I felt a guy's hand. My heart goes out. My heart goes out. Early reports that five or six rescue workers buried since Tuesday were pulled from a car this morning drew cheers on the streets of lower Manhattan. Five firefighters found alive, two walked away. Sadly, it proves not to be true. But there is some good news at ground zero. Do you have any indication at all at this time how many people have been found alive today? Four. You have personally four. seen and heard of four stories. Yes, four. Two firemen. That's all they told us, four. I've seen two, but they, we heard four. Two civilians, two firefighters. A lucky escape. Two rescuers buried just this morning by an avalanche of debris pulled free hours later. The unstable remains of the towers are still a deadly peril. By early afternoon, new details on the massive investigation into the attacks, with word from the Attorney General that the public is pitching in. The website, which was opened virtually immediately after the crisis, 
has received more than 22,700 suggested tips. With leads pouring in, investigators say they are now able to reconstruct the terrorist operation with names and numbers. The total number of hijackers on the four planes that crashed was at least 18. Uh, two planes had five hijackers and two other planes had four hijackers each. The FBI says this flight training school in Florida is where two suspects on the first plane to hit the World Trade Center studied. Rudy Deckers runs the school. And they indicated to us that they wanted to fly uh, big airplanes back home. Deckers tells the Today Show the pair kept to themselves but never caused any trouble. Have you asked yourself a hundred times in the last day or so, did you miss a sign of some kind? They behaved normal. They were average people and um, that's it. Um, they left in November, December. Uh, we don't keep a track of all the students who come over here and they left out of our eyesight. Till yesterday, of course. And there's new information from Boston, where investigators say the hijackers boarded their planes with help from a local terrorist cell. NBC's Chris Hansen. That a ramp pass was found in a rental car here at Logan Airport that has been linked to two of the hijacked suspects. Now, a ramp pass, as its name suggests, is a pass that gives someone access to restricted areas of the airport. Now, this indicates two things. One, that the suspects were casing out the airport in the days before the hijacking, and two, that perhaps the hijacked suspects had inside help here at the airport. By mid-afternoon, disturbing news. U.S. officials tell NBC's Andrea Mitchell that other potential hijackers tied in with Tuesday's terrorist operation are still out there. So we know that there were 18 that, who went down with those four planes, but what I'm now being told is that they were more trained pilots. In fact, a report today about a strange incident at New York's Kennedy Airport raises questions about how many attacks may have been planned but not carried out. United Flight 23, scheduled to depart for Los Angeles, was boarding. There was some kind of an altercation involving three men described by a Port Authority of New York and New Jersey police source as Middle Eastern in appearance. Somehow, the source will not reveal the exact details. They attracted the suspicions of the gate staff boarding that flight. The staff had some kind of a verbal exchange and demanded that these three men leave the aircraft. Was this a fifth suicide team? Before the day is out, government sources tell NBC News they have concluded that Osama bin Laden is directly responsible for the attacks. Also late today, a major development. Recovered and on its way to Washington, the black box from the plane that went down in Pennsylvania. As evening approaches, the impact of the terrorist attacks is clear. It's been a day of bomb scares and evacuations at New York's Grand Central Station, at Penn Station, LaGuardia Airport, and Rockefeller Center. In Washington, the U.S. Capitol is evacuated, even as congressmen are being briefed on the terrorist attacks. And word that as a precautionary measure, Vice President Cheney is being moved out of Washington to Camp David. All that on just the third day of this war on terrorism from Dateline Stone Phillips. And joining us now from the Pentagon, where he has been contributing to the work of NBC News Terrorism Task Force, is Jim Mikloshevsky who's been on duty almost nonstop since Tuesday morning. What's the latest there, Jim? Well, Tom, U.S. government officials do tell NBC News tonight uh, that the Bush administration, based on overwhelming evidence, has concluded that Osama bin Laden, among others, is directly responsible uh, for those terrorist attacks uh, earlier this week. Uh, now, according to the officials, uh, there could be other groups involved, uh, believed to be longtime associates or associate groups with Osama bin Laden, uh, that uh, long ago the, the, the State Department has sort of lumped together, particularly the uh, Egyptian Jihad, uh, the Egyptian Islamic Jihad, uh, uh, which uh, the U.S. government now considers one and the same with uh, Osama bin Laden's Al-Qaeda uh, group. Now the question, of course, is uh, what does the U.S. do about that? Uh, I, I think it's quite clear if you listen to President uh, Bush, uh, Secretary of State Colin Powell, Deputy Secretary of Defense Paul Wolfowitz today, all three uh, were preparing the American people uh, for a long drawn out a war on terrorism and, and warning not only terrorist groups, but those who harbor them, uh, that the U.S. Uh, uh, will, will draw on all America's military might uh, to, uh, to rid 
the, uh, uh, the nation, the world actually, of this terrorist threat, not only for this specific attack on New York, uh, but any potential threat uh, to the United States uh, of America. All of these are considered prime targets now. According to the officials, uh, all military options are on the table. No decisions have been made, we stress that. But all military options are on the table. Uh, anything from airstrikes with cruise missiles, sustained airstrike campaigns with, with planes off aircraft carriers, and from NATO air bases throughout Europe and, and far West Asia. Uh, even some Persian Gulf nation, nations have weighed in, Kuwait uh, to be expected, but Oman and Qatar have informed the United States uh, that uh, the, the United States military has free and open access to their military airstrips to launch whatever possible military airstrikes uh, may be carried out. They, uh, and in regard to the options now being considered, Tom, uh, they go all the way up to a full-scale ground invasion with airborne troops. All right, thanks very much, NBC. Jim Mikloszewski, some late developments tonight from the State Department during a briefing earlier today. Secretary of State Colin Powell was telling reporters about his contact with Pakistan which does have a relationship with Afghanistan right next door. And he said that they're uh, pursuing those contacts with Pakistan because they believe that people and organizations that could be responsible for this reside in Afghanistan. He was asked then a moment later whether he was referring to Osama bin Laden, and he said yes. Then a number of news organizations began to report that uh, Colin Powell had identified Osama bin Laden as the prime suspect. Tonight, uh, his State Department spokesman is saying, no, he did not use that phrase, prime suspect. In fact, he did not, but he used everything but that phrase. And joining us now from Washington is NBC's Andrea Mitchell. Andrea? Well, exactly. Uh, Colin Powell did not say that uh, Osama bin Laden is the prime suspect, as you just pointed out, as his spokesman, Assistant Secretary of State Richard Boucher, has pointed out to the networks and is making multiple calls to the networks. He said that, uh, but he confirmed to a question that bin Laden was a candidate, the candidate that he was referring to living in that region. But it has been very clear from everything that not only Powell, but that other officials have said, that Osama bin Laden is the person that they are looking towards. Unofficially, people have said that they believe that it is bin Laden, but also in a briefing today at the White House, a senior official said that uh, they believe that there are other groups associated with bin Laden who have contributed to this or who may be related to this. And what we're talking about here is not something as tightly structured as a, an American oh corporation. Oh what we're God. talking about oh is a loose confederation of terror networks that bin Laden oh has God. been leading in many ways. Uh, some of his key deputies are former uh, top leaders of terror groups in Egypt. So it is a loose confederation, not anything that has a chief executive officer. But clearly, bin Laden is the chief suspect, if you will, of American, uh, American suspicion, at least tonight, Tom. And, Andrea, do we have any sense about how Secretary Powell's conversation went with the Pakistani Prime Minister today? We do. Uh, we're told that it went very well, that they got at least some assurances from General Musharraf, the Prime Minister of Pakistan, that they would be cooperative. Now we'll see whether they really deliver. All right, thanks very much, NBC's Andrea Mitchell. And I'm joined now by the Speaker of the House of Representatives, Congressman Dennis Hastert of Illinois. We heard just a few moments ago from your Democratic colleague, right. Richard Gephardt of Missouri, and he was talking about the bipartisan unity in the House of Representatives. Wouldn't it be a good idea to have, if not a formal declaration of war, something that represents the official uh, body, both in the House and the Senate, a reflection of the Senate of the Congress of the United States? We're going to uh, work on a, a resolution tomorrow that basically gives the president the ability to use force to go after uh, the terrorists, uh, wherever they may be, and uh, a direction to go ahead and do that, and, and uh, also uh, this evening, we passed, uh, plan to pass uh, an appropriations bill to allow them the funds to do that, as well as uh, to work with FEMA and the transportation to make sure we get our airlines back uh, in line, that uh, we can bring people's lives as much as possible back to, to normalcy in New York and Virginia. Mr. Secretary, the American people have gotten very used to what you can only describe as very efficient military operations. Desert Storm had a long buildup but then it was over in a matter of days with a limited amount of American loss. Kosovo, a war conducted from the air. 
But when the president says that this war will be the focus of his administration, aren't the American people going to have to be prepared for a long military operation? Well, I'm sure that this uh, operation, that uh, the horrific thing that happened to us uh, this week, uh, took a good deal of planning. Uh, we're going to ferret out the, the perpetrators. It may take time to do it. I think uh, that's the steely will of this nation uh, that we'll move forward and get those things done. And it may take, you know, more than overnight or may take the more than two weeks. But I think it's the American will and certainly the will of this Congress and I know the will of the president to finish this job. The immediate focus, uh, understandably and obviously, is on recovering as many people as we possibly can, dealing with this great loss, also finding these terrorists and punishing them. But there are economic consequences here as well. At some point in the not-too-distant future, are you going to have to re-examine the tax cut and a lot of the domestic programs, put them well, Tom, on hold? Tom, one of the things we need to do right away is to look at the uh, ability of our airlines to be able to fly. They've lost a great deal of revenue. They really kind of run on a cash basis, and we need to make sure that that part of our economy is in place and that we don't lose that. We also have to look at the markets and give the stimulus to our markets and do the things that it's impor important to be able to make sure that our markets and the people who are very vitally involved in our economic system have the wherewithal and have the incentive uh, to, to invest in this country and uh, make this economy grow. Okay, Mr. Speaker, Dennis Hastert of uh, Illinois, thank you very much for being with us tonight. My pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. New York City tonight is a city of empty streets, empty restaurants, and empty beds, the beds of those people who never came home from work on Tuesday. But this town, despite everything, is not empty of hope. And it is hope that is sustaining the loved ones of those missing victims in their desperate search for some answers in the streets of New York. More on that story now from Dateline's Edie Magnus. The city is beginning to dig itself out, and a terrible truth is emerging too. The chances that loved ones missing since the attacks will be found are getting slimmer. It is one of many cruel twists to this tragedy that the chaos of those first 24 hours offered more hope that relatives, neighbors, or co-workers might be found. But now, it is day three. What to do? Where to go? Jennifer Marvison finally left her home today. She's been too shocked and depressed until now, she tells us, to look for her fiancé, Keith Broomfeld. This is the first I was able to face the world. I haven't been out, so... This is the day that I'm going to find out, do or die, whatever it is I have to find out. Jennifer's come to Bellevue Hospital to post a homemade flyer with Keith's picture on it here on what's called a wall of prayers. It has sprung up and, like a plant watered with tears, is growing steadily, covered with the pictures of missing people. Against a backdrop of spectacular blue skies and balmy weather, scores of people, emotional refugees, are wandering the city, looking, hoping, wondering what to do next about the ones they love but cannot find. Sean Fagan, 34, a trader on the 93rd floor of Tower One, somewhere above where the first plane hit. His sister, Anne Marie, says there's been no word of him since that blast. She hit the streets this morning armed with 400 flyers and has been asking questions everywhere. So you've been to the armory? Mm -hmm. The morgue? No. You have not gone to the morgue yet? No. Why not? I'm hoping that my brother's not there. What keeps you going? Like the alternative isn't, um, it's not an option that my brother's not okay and until someone tells me he's not, then he, then he is. Countless others are feeling the same way, unable to let go of the possibility that their loved ones may be out there somewhere. So they're out too, posting pictures on phone booths, mailboxes, at the entrance of buildings. And after all, more survivors were rescued from the bloody rubble of the Twin Towers today. Maybe the answers are on this list. It's been pulled from the internet. Its accuracy is unknown. 
but it claims to contain information on the condition of many victims of the plane attacks. Please don't give up on This woman says she actually did find out her missing brother is alive by seeing his name on this list. He's injured, he's injured, but we found him. Lorraine Browse has also been given a grain of hope. She's learned from the company on the 95th floor where her stepmother worked that someone had sighted her. Lorraine doesn't know exactly what that means. Could her stepmother still be alive, unconscious in a hospital? Or is it false information? No, they don't have any specific information. All they had was her name on a list. It was very vague. It didn't really tell us much. But at least we know if she was alive, if she had survived, she has to be in the hospital someplace. Lorraine was told to go to a downtown university to check a list of hospitalized victims. I know it's going to take a miracle if she's alive. She was so high up in the building. We know she went in early that morning because she had gone to vote beforehand. As she waits, she takes her place on a line among many others. The crowd, a sobering reminder of how widespread the suffering is. Finally, she gets a look. Nothing. No information? They have partial hospital lists. She wasn't on any of the lists. Something else we can do now. Except wait and worry and pray that soon they will get an answer. Until then, they will have to keep looking here in this city of lost and found. Do you still have hope that you'll find him? Uh, yeah, I hope that I find him. I, I have to find my brother either way. Oh. Um, we will find my brother one way or the other. You are watching NBC News coverage of Attack on America. And now, Tom Brokaw. The investigation has led to Florida, and that's where NBC's Kerry Sanders tonight is in Coral Gables, Florida. He has been tracking at least two of these hijacking suspects as they move from pilot training site to pilot training site. Kerry? Well, Tom, I've been able to obtain the visa for one of these uh, suicide flight uh, pilots, uh, Muhammad Atta. Now, he came into the United States on a student or on a tourist visa, and he should not even have been allowed into the United States on that tourist visa under immigration regulations because he was suspected in uh, a terrorist bombing in Israel in 1986. 23-year-old Marwan al-Shahi, one of the suspected suicide pilots, hiding in plain view on Florida's Gulf Coast for more than seven months, living with 33-year-old Mohammed Atta, another suspected suicide pilot. After both earned their commercial flight ratings on this twin-engine plane, NBC News has learned they came to Miami, paying $1,500 in cash to sit at the controls of a Boeing 727 flight simulator, similar to this one. Henry George, the instructor, telling the FBI the duo spent about six hours at the controls. I feel violated, raped, whatever. Here I have a skill that I'm very proud of, that I think we're good at passing on to uh, other uh, pilots wanting to be Become competent pilots, and here we provided that kind of uh, expertise to the lowest of mankind. FBI agents also looking at a Microsoft Flight Simulator program. You can buy it for $70 at any computer store. For $30 more, you can add the simulated cockpit of an American Airlines 757, similar to the jet that hit Tower 1. Today's show travel editor Peter Greenberg says the programs are popular. A lot of pilots and non-pilots buy these simulators to either train or to actually just have fun, to see what they can do with it, like fly under the Golden Gate Bridge or even fly around or sometimes into like the John Hancock building in Chicago as a game. Nothing they would ever contemplate doing in real life. But the instruction manual gives you plenty of information you would need if you wanted to fly into any landmark around the world. Just look up the World Trade Center, for instance, and find its coordinates. 
we asked a licensed pilot in our office to take the controls and fly down the west side of Manhattan. He had little difficulty taking it right on into Tower 1. Only a simulation, but chilling. You might actually be able to, to do a practice run just like we did. Veteran commercial airline pilot Alex Garmendia using the program for the first time today. He says after hours on this software, a novice pilot without experience in a jet would still lack the skills to do much of the controls. But it surely shows you the cockpit layout. In FBI custody tonight, Anand Bukhari, a material witness reportedly cooperating with investigators. His Vero Beach home raided by agents. His brother dying in a mid-air collision in Florida while learning to fly here. That accident one year ago to the day of the hijackings. The FBI's leads in Florida growing exponentially. FBI agents visiting a strip club in Daytona Beach. Just hours before the hijackings, three Middle Eastern men there hinted at the violence well, to come. One of the gentleman actually making the statement, well, uh, America's going to see blood and wait till tomorrow. Now, the FBI has dispatched uh, FBI agents to Hamburg, Germany tonight. Uh, German authorities raided a uh, apartment complex there, uh, an apartment complex where Atta and Al Shahi once lived. And according to German authorities, that's a location that is a known safe house for members uh, and agents of Osama bin Laden. Tom? Thank you very much. Uh, NBC's Kerry Sanders doing his continuing his first rate detective work for us tonight in the state of Florida. And joining us now is Robert Hager, who is part of NBC's Terrorism Task Force. Bob has been keeping track of the aviation component of all of this. Bob? The airports in the New York area are still closed, uh, both to departing flights and incoming flights, after one person was arrested and five or six others have now been detained at, uh, at JFK Airport and at other New York area airports. The man that was arrested uh, was arrested for going, by the way, uh, before, before I go on with that, let's, let's look at that. That's the computer system that tracks flights in the air in this country right now. And you can see it looks pretty crowded, but if you saw what that looks like on a normal day, it's almost solid green. Uh, so, th so this really represents just a fraction of what normal traffic is, but it does show that there are planes back in the air at this point. Uh, going back to uh, those arrests and detainments in New York, uh, one man was arrested uh, for trying to go through uh, security with a forged uh, pilot's license and other forged documents. Uh, then five or six others detained at JFK and other New York area airports, uh, some of those Arab nationals for other reasons, but detained seriously enough to be questioned by FBI agents and the terrorism task force. So those airports are still closed. Meanwhile, it's been a rocky start at other places in the country to this uh, resumption of flying. A LaGuardia terminal, exclusive of uh, these arrests and tonight's development, had be been closed very briefly uh, earlier in the day uh, for what turned out to be a false uh, report of a bomb threat. And then the terminal at Orlando, Florida was closed briefly for the same reason, a, 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 an un untrue claim of a bomb threat there in Orlando. Uh, the airlines, United, Continental, not flying at all tonight. Delta, American, TWA uh, have limited service, but that's it. So it's starting up slowly, and the security at airports everywhere has been heavy. Uniform patrols beefed up. We have agents from the Marshal Service and Customs and Border Patrol all in uniform at airports, and there's still no mail uh, being allowed on passenger planes. And uh, I'm wondering if that's a, a general aviation plane maybe filed, but uh, I, I think not. I think that was a commuter flight. But uh, general aviation is still barred uh, from flights. Uh, we're expected to hear something about that, expecting to hear something about that uh, later on tonight, Tom. Thank you very much, Robert. For the uninitiated, general aviation means private airplanes, the charters and others that fly. And that's an increasingly large part, obviously, of American air traffic. And joining us now is the veteran journalist Mark Clayton of the Christian Science Monitor with new information from air traffic controllers who say that they have intimate knowledge about what happened during the hijacking. Uh, you're one of the very few people who has spoken with any of these air traffic controllers. What did they tell you about what they heard from these planes that were involved? Well, Tom, they told us several things. Uh, one thing is they told us uh, the first indications that the flight was in trouble. 
They told us some of the technical issues that apparently the hijackers were uh, adept at manipulating in the plane. And they also told us uh, a third item, uh, that is that the pilot apparently was flying the plane at least 10 minutes past the point at which it turned toward New York. And uh, what, what flight was that? Was that American Flight uh, 11? The, the, yes, this is American Flight 11 departed Boston about 8 o'clock in the morning. And over western Massachusetts at about 29,000 feet, controllers told me that uh, the uh, they gave a signal uh, they gave a they radioed the cockpit and said to f rise to 31,000 feet to avoid other air traffic, but nothing happened. That was the first indication something was wrong. Uh, they tried to. Uh, this is not that unusual. Sometimes radio uh, contact is lost, so they tried other freq they tried the frequency several times. Uh, American. Uh, are you there? Uh, do you copy? Uh, but there was no answer. They tried the emergency frequency also. Finally, uh, they realized that uh, right at that point, the transponder on the aircraft quit uh, sending a radar signal back and also quit sending an altitude signal back. But the significance of that, in retrospect, to these controllers was that the hijackers knew that the transponder also was able to send a four-digit code uh, that would alert authorities to the fact the flight had been hijacked. So they believe now that the hijackers were technically adept enough to know to turn that off. And did they see the flight make this sharp left-hand turn and head toward New York, and did they alert anyone in the New York area? Uh, what happened was uh, they did not know it was a hijacking. They still thought it was a technical, perhaps an electrical problem with the transponder until suddenly in their earphones they hear a heavily accented voice saying, uh, don't do anything foolish, uh, no one will get hurt. At that instant, the controllers told me they knew immediately they had a hijacked situation. Also at that instant, the plane began its turn south toward New York. And who do they alert in the New York area that there was a hijacking underway? Anyone? One of the controllers I talked to who was not fully aware of what uh, steps were taken in response, other than that supervisors and others were uh, responding, says that he believed that two F-15 jets from Otis Air Force Base were scrambled, but he was not sure if those jets got off the ground uh, in time. Uh, I called Otis Air Force Base today uh, following up on this detail, and they were unwilling to give any information about their operations out. They're under the command of NORAD. Uh, I have not yet contacted NORAD, but uh, I'm told that they wouldn't do anything unless NORAD contacted them. But they are responsible for... Uh, the FAA controller said that it's standard procedure in a hijack situation to alert uh, authorities and to scramble jets. What about the state of the mind of these air traffic controllers who were monitoring all of this now three days after the incident? Well, it was a pretty rough time for them, uh, but a pit, especially for the individual who was uh, doing the controlling, uh, doing the handling of the aircraft. Um, I have to tell you, I did not speak with that individual. The individuals I spoke with, however, were intimately familiar with uh, all that transpired in that room. And uh, they know that that controller lived, as I was told, he lived the situation. He was hearing the whole thing through his headphones. One of the most significant things he heard, and one of the reasons we know that uh, the pilot probably was the one flying the plane is that the pilot repeatedly pushed a push to talk button, a special feature that allows every sound in the cockpit to be heard. And he did this repeatedly throughout at least 10 minutes of the flight south. So there is a record of that at some point, uh, we hope. Well, that's exactly right. One of the things the controllers pointed out to me is that if the terrorists were adept enough technically to switch off the transponder, it is possible that they might have disabled 
the uh, air, uh, the cockpit voice recorder by pulling the fuse box out, or pulling, uh, pulling the fuse out of the fuse box. Apparently that can be done, they believed, and so they think that this taped record may be the only record if the box is even found. All right, thanks very much. Mark Clayton of the Christian Science Monitor, who has been interviewing air traffic controllers who had intimate knowledge of what was going on on American Airlines Flight 11 out of Boston. That was the first one to go into Tower 1 at uh, the World Trade Center. Um, a chilling scenario that played out in the skies over the Atlantic seaboard, and it was only the beginning. Joining us now is New York's Governor George Pataki, who has been at the side of New York Mayor Rudy Giuliani for uh, virtually every hour here during uh, the three days of this crisis in New York's largest city, the most vibrant city in the world for that matter. Uh, Governor Pataki, let me talk to you first of all about the death toll. Earlier today, the mayor told us that it would be that they now have some 4,700 people listed as missing. Is it possible that that number could go higher? Well, we're hopeful, Tom, that that lower might go number. Uh, my, that number might go lower. People that are missing will turn up. We'll find that they've been double counted. Uh, and we're still making the priority of the search and rescue operation in the hopes that perhaps someone can still be found alive down at the site. So uh, we don't want to talk about numbers. We just want to talk about people and do everything we can to try to help them as much as possible. Governor, give me a location on where you are right now just so we can orient our viewers to where you are. Uh, I'm in front of the state armory that's been utilized as a family assistance center uh, where families, relatives, friends of those who are missing uh, can come and get the best possible information. And Tom, you know, uh, there's incredible grief, but there's also people out there who have volunteered since the beginning. There's a tremendous outpouring of support. And I, I think the families understand that the people of New York and the people of America are standing shoulder to shoulder with them. Governor, these people also deserve some honest answers. Uh, there are hundreds of thousands of tons of rubble down there. Much of it is dangerous and unstable. The other part of it is deeply compacted. It's going to take a long time, isn't it, to get through all of that? Uh, it certainly is, Tom. And I, I don't. Uh, no one can minimize the, the magnitude of this disaster and catastrophe. Uh, we right now have brave uh, firefighters, Port Authority police who lost many of their colleagues and the, the leadership of the port down there trying to go through that wreckage as carefully as possible and, and the hope, however slim it might be, uh, that perhaps a miracle can occur. And, uh, we will not lose hope. We will stand with the families. We will stand with the people of America and we'll get through this. And Governor, let me just ask you how you arrived at that estimate of those who are missing. Did you reconcile the numbers the various companies had and the state agencies had in the building with the people who yes. have turned up? Yeah, Tom, it's very hard to, to be sure of the, the numbers or the names because uh, we have had to put together lists of people who were working there, uh, compare them with the lists of those who, the, whether the employer or, or uh, we have found uh, are out alive or perhaps in a hospital. So uh, we're continuing to try to compile the best possible information and certainly to get it to, to the families, to those who are, are waiting that, that work. As you know, New Yorkers take great pride in the freedom that they have in the city. Are some of those freedoms going to be suppressed now as there is greater Tom, security? Tom, we're not going to let the, the freedom of New York or the freedom of America be uh, subjected to this terrorist uh, uh, attack. Uh, I was out yesterday on the streets seeing thousands of people lined up to give blood. They're not frightened out of the streets. They're not frightened out of their homes. The people of New York, the people of America, uh, aren't, don't scare easy. This has been a horrible black day. But we will get through this. We will preserve our freedoms. And New York and America will be stronger as we go forward. All right. Thank you very much. Uh, New York Governor George Pataki, who had an extended conversation earlier today, as we saw with uh, President George W. Bush, who is expected to come to New York tomorrow after a national memorial a, a service, a day of remembrance at noon Eastern time. And of course, we'll have coverage of that as well. Let's go back now to NBC's David Bloom in lower Manhattan and check in on the rescue and recovery efforts that are underway. David. Well, Tom, as you and Governor Pataki alluded to, those rescue operations continuing tonight, now some 60 hours after the first explosion. Show you a live picture right now of the rescue workers, the firefighters, the police officers, the other emergency personnel still laboring, some running bucket brigades, try to get the debris out, 
others using blow torches to try to, that's mostly steel workers, to try to get at that debris, to get underneath the debris. But it's worth mentioning that, to the best of our knowledge, the only people pulled out of the wreckage today, three New York City firefighters, were actually individuals who became trapped today when debris shifted, when buildings partially collapsed, that the last person that we know of who was rescued actually having been involved in Tuesday's attacks was found yesterday. And as you alluded to again, Tom, it's easy to see why hope might begin to fade. You recall that in the Oklahoma City bombing, it was only in the first 24 hours where victims were found alive. After that, any individual found was dead. And again, in this situation, we had five victims, two coming out the first day, three the second day, none tonight. And yet, Tom, it's amazing the effort that these rescue workers are engaged in. As I said the last time we were on the air, it's now been a little over an hour ago when the horns blasted here and these rescue workers literally took off running literally for their lives because they don't know when the next collapse might come. And I might tell you, Tom, that some of these emergency workers are now writing on their arms and on their legs, their names, their social security numbers, so that if something awful should happen and they should become trapped, people might know who they were. Tom? That is a haunting thought. Thanks very much, NBC's David Bloom, who has been on duty uh, almost from the beginning in uh, lower Manhattan, uh, not too far from the World Trade Center. Well, put yourself in this picture. A mass of people fleeing from what must seem for a moment like the end of the world, and your job is to go the other way, to rush toward the site of all that destruction. Hundreds of New York's firefighters and police officers did just that on Tuesday. They did it bravely and well, and many of them lost their lives. Here's Dateline's Don Fratangelo. They are not blood relatives, but without a doubt, they are family. Firefighters in New York grappling with what has become of their band of brothers and sisters. There's Engine 54 on 48th Street in Manhattan, the pride of Midtown, it's known as. 14 members were on duty Tuesday. 14 have not yet returned. We haven't lost anybody yet. We're missing 14 members from this house. 14 brothers went, six from each company and two from the battalion. We have not found or heard from them. We're still hoping that they're alive and we're just waiting. It's you know, just a tragedy, just waiting. Waiting's the toughest. So too is resting. But that's what will give them energy to get back to the rubble to search. Lieutenant Bob Jackson is anxious to find his buddy, Captain Dave Woolley, a 30-year veteran. Dave was a good guy, good tease. He knew how to twist my, you know, push a button to get me going, and then he turned around and smiled at me. He took me under his wing, just, you know, teaching me stuff. This whiteboard is usually used by the firehouse to assign seating on a fire truck. This list of names, now a stark reminder of the truck that didn't return. And they don't even want to think about them not returning, hoping their missing friends will be rescued. And today there was good reason to think so. Several firefighters have been found alive among the rubble. Incredibly, three of them were able to walk out of the wreckage. But those kinds of discoveries have been the exception. We're very tight here. Everybody's very close. We know everybody in the firehouse. We know their wives. We know their kids. You lose a friend. Lieutenant Mark Munley, a 16-year veteran, grief-stricken about the 10 missing members of his firehouse on 51st Street in Midtown Manhattan. Everybody you think of all down there from this house is missing. Half the men from the firehouse responded to the World Trade Center. The other half could not. They were trying to be sent there, calling the dispatcher, asking us to send, send us there, and uh, they couldn't get through to the dispatcher. And, uh, and the, guys, uh, the guys feel strange. Lieutenant Munley and his fellow members of Engine 8 now wrestle with guilt. Why couldn't they get there? You want to be available. You, you want to go to where the action is. You want to help people. That's what we do. You don't shy away from that stuff. No one ever thinks that this is going to happen, that it's going to be a disaster. Even so, he knows what the outcome likely would have been. You know that you could, if you could have been there, you would have been there, and uh, something terrible could have happened. It's been two and a half days now, 
and it's not getting any easier at Lieutenant Munley's firehouse. They're all close. We're all close. I mean, Captain Hill's <laughs> Captain Latitude. Chief I mean, they're, we're, we're close to a wall. There's an empty space now in the row of hanging jackets where the missing firefighters' jackets would have been. An emptiness that's being experienced at firehouses throughout the city. A board with wishes of gratitude now lines this firehouse wall as residents try to thank these men with kindness and charity. Engine Company 6 is nicknamed the Tammany Hall Tigers, originally a volunteer squad founded by New York's Boss Tweed. It's housed in a 100-year-old building where the tradition continues that a firefighter never leaves behind one of their colleagues. The night shift was just going off duty when the call came in around 9 a.m. They did what other firefighters would do. They joined the day shift and went out on the job. Jumping on the back of the engine truck, 33-year-old Tommy Houlihan, a six-year veteran. I'm staying till there's four guys from six engine were missing and I'm not leaving till they, they find them. Tommy Houlihan was among the four firefighters from Engine Company 6 who disappeared in the smoke and rubble. Timothy Dowling was the commanding officer at Engine 6 until 1993 when he was injured in the first World Trade Center bombing and forced to retire. But he had to come back to Engine 6. After all the excitement of, of Tuesday, I couldn't stay at home. My uh, nephew is assigned to this firehouse and he's among the missing firefighters. So the only place I could be in reality was here with, with all my firefighters that I've, I've known for the last 12 years. Tommy Houlihan is the nephew of retired Captain Dowling. Like many firefighters, it's in the family blood. Tommy's grandfather was a battalion commander who died on the job. His mother is really, you know, it's devastating. She had lost her father and now she's losing her son. She's, we hope not. A list on this chalkboard shows the names of the men who went out on that job that morning, including Tommy Houlihan. Next to it, a map, a sketch of where Engine 6 had parked in front of the World Trade Center. The firehouse is not its usual ordered self now. Bunker gear is thrown around, some is missing, borrowed by visiting firemen. The kitchen isn't working, nor is there power. But last night, some women came by with hot food, and the men decided it was time to break bread together. The church of, of the Pompeii over in Greenwich Village came by. They dropped off food. Uh, the, the people of the city are just incredible. Meanwhile, the search for Tommy Houlihan and the other three men from Engine Company 6 goes on. A family, a band of brothers and sisters, now broken. Dateline's Don Fratangelo tonight on the firefighters of the city, and already there is an effort underway to raise a fund for the orphans and the widows of those firemen and policemen who have been lost in this rescue effort. It's a little after 9 Eastern time now, on the third day of this war on terrorism. We have an update on the latest developments tonight. New York police say that seven people have been detained at New York City airports for questioning about the hijacking at and as a result of that questioning, all three major airports in the New York City area now have been closed. Government sources say there is now overwhelming evidence that Osama bin Laden is the mastermind responsible for these terrorist attacks. Investigators have found the black box flight recorder from the plane that was uh, crashed into the ground in Pennsylvania. They've detected a signal from the recorder in the Pentagon crash, they believe. The Pentagon is saying tonight that the United States will launch what is being described as sustained military strikes against those behind these terrorist attacks. Officials say they are considering calling up the military reserves for the first time since the Gulf War. Former President Bill Clinton was in Australia when all of this happened. His wife, of course, is the junior senator from New York. The president was rushed back to the United States, and today NBC News cameras caught up with him for his reaction. We have to improve our defenses, and we have to let people know that, that uh, president Clinton. there will be a strong sanction for this. I, and I believe America, if we stay together, if the people will stay together and keep their spirits strong, I believe the president will find out what happened. I think it'll be the right thing. This the is president what... Clinton, if you were... 
Former President Bill Clinton tonight, who has just returned from a speaking tour in Australia. NBC's Robert Bazell is at Manhattan's Bellevue Hospital Center, where there have been people being treated, but so many families showing up, hoping that they'll find their loved ones there. Robert? Yes, Tom, when I came in here just now the, by the wall outside of, with people whose uh, photographs have been missing, some of the doctors and nurses from here at Bellevue, which is one of the most famous hospitals in the world, certainly has the biggest trauma center in New York City, some doctors and nurses were looking at those pictures and, and just weeping because uh, they feel the same thing that everybody here feels about all these people who are missing and the lack of survivors that we have here. With me is Dr. Eric Mannheim, who is the medical director here at Bellevue. Dr. Mannheim, today you had some people from the rescue site come in, correct? Yes, we had uh, about a half a dozen uh, firefighters uh, and sanitation workers uh, come in to, to the emergency. What kind, of, what kind of injuries are you seeing today? The kinds of things we're seeing now are predominantly uh, 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 exposure, um, temperature problems, uh, dehydration, and we're still seeing some crush injuries. Now, you had some, a team that went down right after the explosion mm -hmm. and, a, and did an amazing rescue job on a Port Authority police officer. Tell me that story. That's correct. There was this Port Authority uh, uh, police officer who was called uh, immediately after the event, who was at 42nd Street, and raced downtown with a bunch of colleagues. He was caught in the immediate collapse of the first tower. Um, he was uh, found uh, later on that day, very fortunately, however, he was pinned. And it took hours and hours to extricate him. We sent a trauma team down thinking that his legs might have to be amputated. Fortunately, they were able to extricate him. However, he had what's called compartment syndrome. We had such swelling in his lower extremities that there had to be emergency procedures to relieve the pressure. He's currently uh, here in critical condition. His kidneys have failed. However, there's a lot of hope that he'll get kidney function back as a result of that traumatic injury. Now, you have a lot of other stories like that, um, dozens and dozens of them in this hospital, right? Right. There are, there are many, many, many stories. There was a woman, for example, 32 years old, who was on the 13th floor, who was found and she also had multiple, multiple uh, trauma, particularly facial injuries and lower extremity injuries. She's going to do fine. She's going to walk out of here in, a, in a, probably a week or two. And how does that heartening story compare when you see the, all those pictures on the wall outside of people desperate for their loved ones? I think for all of us here, it's the one thing that, that keeps us going. We're, we're very hopeful that there'll be a f several more uh, people rescued from the site. We're still uh, in the business of taking care of all the workers, anybody that has any kind of injury whatsoever. Um, and I think it's keeping the spirits of the staff up somewhat, though we're, I think we're quite realistic about the enormous tragedy that's occurred downtown. So, Tom, that's the story here from Bellevue, which has amazing facilities that are standing by to take care of anybody who comes out of the rubble. But unfortunately, that's been very few so far. Tom? That has been the tragic irony of the medical situation here in New York. Almost from the beginning, people standing by, preparing to take care of the people that they thought would overwhelm their facilities. And there have been just too few of them because so many are still trapped in that rubble. New York City Mayor Rudolph Giuliani says that just over 4,700 people have been reported missing at this point at the site of the World Trade Center. Some 700 of those missing came from just one company housed in the World Trade Center. 700 out of about 1,000 employees at that one office. Dateline's Bob McEwen has more on that story tonight. Here and abroad, they were the ultimate symbols of America and American business, the Twin Towers, home to some of the giants of U.S. finance. You may well not know its name, but one of those companies is called Cantor Fitzgerald. Cantor Fitzgerald dominates the bond market. Last year, the firm did $50 trillion in business. But according to Chairman and CEO Howard Luckman, what's made him most proud isn't its bottom line but the kind of company it is. We are a family. We are the tightest group of people. We always have been a tight group of people. But you just don't know it. We did know it, but I mean, this last couple of days, I mean, it's, it's unbelievable. And how long these past few days must have been for Howard Lutnick. In a catastrophe that's crushed an entire country, no one can have been hit harder than he has. We have lost every single person who was in the office. We don't know of any, not a single one person getting down from the 101st to the 105th floors where our offices were, not a single person. Incredibly, it was just over 48 hours ago that Cantor Fitzgerald was on top of the financial world and of the World Trade Center. 
The firm occupied four floors high up in the North Tower, from the 101st to the 105th. A thousand employees, traders and executives, secretaries and support staff, went to work there every day. But this Tuesday, CEO Howard Lutnick was going to be late. He didn't want to miss his son's first day in kindergarten. I mean, I wasn't there because I dropped my baby off at school for my five-year-old's first day of school, but that means that I get there late. That means I get to be alive. And anybody who got there early doesn't get to. It's, it's unthinkable. Even without him, the day began as it often does, with a conference call between New York and the office in Los Angeles. At about quarter to nine, over the speakerphone, Cantor Fitzgerald employees on the West Coast heard someone in New York say, I think a plane just hit us. I got a call when, as I was leaving the, my son's school that, that there was, you know, a plane hit the Trade Center. So I just, we went right down at the top of the building and I saw, I saw a lot of smoke and I knew it was not good. And not good. And all I was saying on the way down is, it's not good. This is not good. The first jetliner had smashed into the North Tower at about the 90th story, not far below where Cantor Fitzgerald's offices began, on the 101st. An inferno of jet fuel now rampaged upwards, consuming floor after floor. It's unfathomable that everyone would die. It's not, it's not possible. Someone would get out. So I, I just, all I wanted was to hear one person say they were on 101. Just one person who was on 101. I got to, I, people were coming out of the building and I grab them and they're sort of like out of it. And I take them and say, what, what floor are you on? And I got all the police around that door to shake people and say, what floor are you on? And they'd say 50. And I'd scream out there, I got a 50 and a 60 and a 70. I got up to 91. Someone said they worked on the 91st floor and they came down and they got out. And then the, the building collapsed. And I don't have anybody. I don't have anybody. With people off on vacation or business trips and those who simply got to work late, Lutnick now believes everyone who was in the office that day perished. About 700 in all. There's 700, 700 of my families. I can't say it. 700 of my families. 700. I'm just one, but they were all 700. There's so many of them. They all lost their son or their daughter. People come up to me and say, I only have one daughter. <laughs> what do I do? Hey. This is too many. Too many. Too many. Is there any way to describe what these past few days have been like for you? They are a blur. They are a blur of crying and hugs, of trying to help people and give them information when, they, when there isn't really any positive news to give, um, to be strong enough to help them. But I'm just another one of them. And uh, it's, just, it's just the world moving like the, at a snail's pace. The day just lasts forever, and every minute is extended in the arm. And he says every minute of every day has been spent trying to find someone, anyone, who's missing. Cantor Fitzgerald has established a crisis center at New York's Hotel Pierre with grief counselors and a list of those employees who went to work on Tuesday but never went home. All of the families, they hunt down every lead, they run every place, they go to every hospital with this big, with this employee list. I make sure that we go with our list of 700 people and say, find someone on this list. Find me someone on this list. Because someone on this list means that I can call a family and I can tell them that, that they, they have a reason to not be sad anymore. But as of today, they've located only four hospitalized Cantor Fitzgerald employees each of whom was just arriving at the World Trade Center when the attack took place. And as if all the rest of it weren't too much for one person to bear, one of those 700 employees they haven't found is Howard Lutnick's own brother. My brother Gary. Yeah, he called my sister. Like, and we got lots, lots of people got phone calls. 
probably a hundred people got phone calls after the after the plane hit. You know, they called their family, they called their mother, they called their wife, and said, "You know, we've been hit by a plane, and we're we're evacuating." I mean, that was the common common thread. My, my brother called my sister a little later, and he said it was the smoke was pouring in. There was no way out, and he's not going to make it. That was just two days ago, this morning, after a moment of silence commemorating those who died. The U.S. financial markets started trading bonds again. Howard Lutnick says he asked his surviving employees what they wanted to do. They voted. Then they told him, let's go back to work. So they lost the person to their left and the person to their right, but they've decided that, that that's what they're going to do. And so this morning at 7 o'clock in the morning, 7 o'clock in the morning, my staff in Europe and here opened the U.S. government securities market, and I, I, it's a miracle, these people, I don't know, they're just, they, they, they didn't sleep. Since losing all their friends, they didn't sleep once, they decided they wanted to go to work. Why would they want to go to work? But that's what they wanted to do, certainly not what I asked them to do. And that, that they're just, these people are just, these are spectacular people spectacular people. And in return, Cantor Fitzgerald's CEO made a promise to the families of the colleagues and friends who may be gone, but never forgot. Within the company that when we, you know, everything is different. It is everything different. But what it's going to be is we are going to, as a company, we are going to take care of and do everything we can mm -hmm. as a different business model to take care of the people, the families that we lost. Because it's not about us. I get to kiss my kid. I get to kiss my kid, but now I got people's wives calling me. They don't know what to do. I mean, I had a very young staff. Their probably average age was the young 30s. That means they all have babies. They had babies. So we got a lot of people to take care of. We have a lot of people to take care of. A lot of people to take care of. And that's what we're going to do. That's what I'm going to do. And that's what my staff is going to do, because that's what we're committed to. Dateline's Bob McEwen tonight on one company that lost 700 of its 1,000 employees at the World Trade Center. We want to talk now in the next few moments about presidential leadership, senatorial leadership, private leadership in this country, the leadership of this culture during this time of grave crisis. And joining us from Washington now is our Washington Bureau Chief, Tim Russert. Uh, the president can look out across the land and see America lined up solidly behind him, Tim. Tom, it's unbelievable. Ninety percent of the American people saying they want a military strike. Eighty percent giving George Bush positive job ratings. The leaders of the House and the Senate, Democrat and Republican, united behind him. Tom, listen to this. The administration had asked for $20 billion in aid to help New York City and to begin to prepare a military operation to root out terrorism. The Senate tonight is going to vote for $40 billion, $20 billion for New York and 20 billion on the war effort. Remember the Persian Gulf War back in 1991? The entire cost of that operation was 60 billion. This Congress, this president, is determined to send the message tonight that this is a dead serious business and whoever did this is going to pay a price with a massive and, in, in the words of one official, disproportionate retaliation. Tim, I think we're still trying to come to grips with what the future may look like. The president said today that this war will be the focus of his administration and then added almost as an afterthought, I'll still deal with the domestic business. But House Speaker Dennis Thaster told me tonight when he was talking about the new shape of the American economy, it sounded like he was saying that Congress may have to provide some financial assistance to America's commercial airlines and other entities as well. Absolutely, Tom. The president had always said that he wouldn't use the Social Security Trust Fund except in war or recession. It appears we have both. It's going to be a very expensive enterprise. It was a huge economic shock, the result of what happened in, at New York City at the World Trade Center. Insurance companies are going to have liability of 15 to $20 billion. And as you, the huge economic loss, and as you mentioned, the airline revenues. But Tom, it's fascinating to me. There is no one complaining. No one suggesting it shouldn't be done. And there's no one in the Congress right now saying, what about our intelligence failure? People are saying, let's get people out of the ground. Let's heal ourselves. Let's deal with our dead and our wounded and, and try to help families cope before we start pointing fingers. And let's rally around and identify a common enemy. The other thing, Tom, that's most striking to me is we keep talking about return to normalcy, but it's going to have to be redefined and, re and changed, and we all know it. 
it seems this fine line between security and freedom is going to be redefined as well. And the more security we see, the more insecure we're going to feel starting at airports. All right, thanks very much, NBC's Tim Russell tonight. This, after all, is not a pauper nation. We were just emerging from a Great Depression when World War II broke out. And in fact, this president, this administration may have to go back to some kind of form of war bonds that were so popular during that time because every citizen who bought a war bond felt that they were making an extra contribution. It is safe to say that President George W. Bush is facing the greatest test of his character and leadership ability in his young presidency. How well is he doing at this point? Here's Dateline's Josh Mankiewicz. And I am confident there will be universal approval of the actions this government takes. And right now, at least, Mr. Bush is correct. Public opinion polling shows widespread support for a president heading into the biggest test of leadership any chief executive has faced since World War II. It would be a titanic task for any president at once comfort a stunned nation, rally international support, pursue and find the terrorists, correct an astonishing failure of U.S. intelligence, and on an almost daily basis, send unmistakable signals to more than 270 million Americans that he has both hands firmly on the wheel. Crisis brings out either the best or the worst in a leader. Dr. Michael Genovese of Loyola Marymount University has written extensively about presidential power and leadership. Jimmy Carter faced the crisis of the Iran hostage situation and seemed to get smaller and smaller as the months went by. Other presidents, Lincoln for example, face a crisis and seem to get bigger and bigger. Presidents Reagan and Clinton also seem to rise to the occasion in difficult times. Mr. Reagan after the space shuttle Challenger exploded and Bill Clinton after the terrorist attack in Oklahoma City. We cannot let terrorists and rogue nations hold this nation hostile or hold... But even his strongest supporters would admit that George W. Bush is not in the same league as Presidents Reagan or Clinton when it comes to public speaking. And in a culture of television, talking to a country that's ready for some inspiration, it's a handicap Mr. Bush and the team around him will have to overcome. He's seen the way other presidents, like Reagan and Clinton, handle the great rhetorical moment, and he knows he doesn't have that skill. And what he tries to project instead is a kind of steadiness. Lawrence O'Donnell is the senior political analyst for MSNBC. He says Mr. Bush is going to have to change his style from CEO to front man especially if the president's war against terrorism turns bloody. So he has to sort of be the official spokesman for this war. He can't leave that to others. He can't delegate it. He has to be out there explaining. In order to, in order to preserve the support, in order to keep the, the country behind him, he needs to have a more inclusive conversation with the American public on an ongoing basis than he ever anticipated having as a president on any subject. But the horror in New York makes one part of the president's job easier. Until now, our response to terrorism has been primarily technological because of the belief that Americans wouldn't support a war that produced U.S. casualties. But all that changed Tuesday morning. This is a country that does not so much need to be led, but simply told what the marching orders are. What would make you the best candidate in office during the Middle East crisis? I've been a leader. I've been a person who has to set a clear vision and convince people to follow. During the 2000 presidential yeah. campaign, Mr. Bush sold himself as a proven leader. But his foreign policy experience has been limited mostly to some on-the-job training. Right. Uh, good evening, everyone. However, Americans do have plenty of confidence in the team around Mr. Bush. And as a country, we're clearly ready to let a new president lead us on a crusade against an enemy with no fixed borders and no home address. If history is a guide, how long is this tremendous support for President Bush likely to last? Historically, presidents in a crisis get a rally around the flag effect where they get a boost in their popularity and increased support. It doesn't last a real long time. It can last several months at the outset. Uh, and the next step is, what does the president do with this blip in support, with this increased support? The national pressure to take swift, decisive action may be overwhelming, but it's taking the right action that's a true test of leadership. And so the next few months will be a test not only for the president, but for the people he governs as well. That's uh, Dateline's Josh Mankiewicz on President Clinton. Uh, pardon me, on uh, President Bush. I'm 
have Clinton on my mind because it's been almost 40 years uh, since we heard from, well, we're going to talk first of all about Robert McNamara and the role that he played in another presidency, John F. Kennedy facing his own test of character. It was October 1962, the Cuban Missile Crisis. Then the fate of the world hung in the balance. The former Defense Secretary Robert McNamara joins us tonight from Washington. Uh, we do have Mrs. Clinton coming up in just a few moments, uh, Secretary uh, McNamara, so that's why I was throwing all those names into the mix. Thank you very much for joining us tonight. During I'm delighted the, to be with you, Tom. During the Cuban Missile Crisis, I know one of the considerations was in the table that you were trying to make those decisions. There was a lot of rage, understandably. There was a lot of passion about doing something massively, militarily, almost from the beginning. Is there a lesson to be drawn from the Bush administration from all of that? Well, I think there is. Uh, and the first lesson is to take time to decide what the problem is you're facing and what the alternative ways of dealing with it are, and then to mobilize the nation and its allies to follow the best course. I think our president is doing that today. We have to do three things simultaneously. One, initiate reconstruction. The Congress tonight is going to be dealing with part of that. Number two, develop a plan to destroy the attackers, the terrorists, and those who harbored them. Identify them first and then destroy them. We're well on the way to that. And it's important that it be done in association with our allies. NATO obviously is among those. Yesterday, for the first time in the history of NATO, since it was started after World War II, uh, essentially 55 years ago, under Article 5, agreed that an attack on one is an attack on all, and they will support us against the, uh, the terrorists. And then thirdly, and we haven't talked much about this, we must begin to identify the fundamental issues that stimulate terrorists to do what they're doing, and in particular, stimulate nations to support them. The, uh, the Afghans, but several other nations I won't name tonight. We must address those issues as well. Mr. McNamara, you have written extensively and painfully about the mistakes that you made as a principal architect of America's tragic Vietnam policies. What are the lessons for this administration during this time from your experience? Well, one of the things we didn't do and the Vietnam North Vietnamese didn't do was try to understand their enemy. And we didn't understand them and they didn't understand us and that prolonged the war. In this case, we must try to understand what lay behind the terrorist actions. Don't misunderstand me. I'm not suggesting uh, we should sympathize with them. My God, no. But we must understand them. And in particular, we must understand why nations are supporting them and begin to lay the foundation for changing the attitudes of those nations in the years that lie ahead so we don't have a continuing foundation for terrorism such as this. What about the role of hubris in decision making? We have a large, powerful technologically efficient nation going against what a lot of people believe is just a small band of willful people, but that too can get us in danger, can it? It can indeed. We are the most powerful nation in the world economically, politically, and militarily. We're going to have great difficulty finding how to use our military power effectively here. But I'm very confident that the leaders we have, uh, the Cheneys, Rumsfelds, and Powells, along with the President, will do that. All right. Former Defense Secretary Robert McNamara, who joins us tonight, he was at the table during the Cuban Missile Crisis, and of course he has written extensively about his experience in Vietnam. And joining us now is NBC's Robert Hager, who has the latest on the chaos and the air traffic system in this country. And it's Bob. off to a really rough start today, Tom, on this first day of what was supposed to be open skies. Northwest Airlines has now said, after trying to operate, that it's going to shut down for the rest of the night because uh, it had some phone call and said it was not prudent to operate. Doesn't tell more than that. Let's take a look. That, that was the tracker that was up there on the screen briefly. There you see uh, traffic in the northeast and believe me, although that probably looks like a lot of planes, it's nothing compared to what traffic normally is. There it pans down the east coast and across uh, into the nation's heartland and down south uh, with a lot of activity. Well, not really a lot of activity, but planes going in and out of Atlanta and panning across, there's the view uh, with Texas, and you see them uh, centered around Dallas-Fort Worth there and continuing across uh, to California now uh, over the, uh, the Rocky Mountains, so scattered traffic up around Denver. And there's...
is the West Coast view, a uh, little, little opera, uh, traffic around San Francisco in the Bay Area, and th there's the whole nation. Believe me, that's, that's solid green on a uh, normal night this time of evening with three to 4,000 planes in the air at any one given time, and there's just a, a tiny fraction of that in the air right now. Well then, besides Northwest's decision, uh, after starting up briefly, to close down completely, and again it was because they had some phone call and, and simply said that it was not prudent to operate. Uh, Boston's Logan Airport is going to remain closed indefinitely because the FAA won't let it open. Uh, the FAA is saying that Logan still needs to show that it has uh, a lot more uh, stricter security in effect. Uh, Logan, of course, the uh, origination for two of those hijacked flights. And then the New York airports, which have been closed down by police activity, arrests in New York of, well, arrest of one and uh, five or six others detained, the one arrested uh, with false pilot's documents. And so now the FAA says they're going to leave the New York airports closed for the rest of tonight and reassess in the morning, Tom. All right, thanks very much, NBC's Robert Hager tonight on the continuing chaos and America's skies. New Yorkers, of course, are known for their ability to cope in a crisis. After all, just getting through a normal day here can be tough enough. But New Yorkers caught in a real catastrophe can call on reserves and strength and stamina that are nothing short of astonishing and inspiring. Tonight, Hoda Kotb has the story of a woman whose compassion and courage are above and beyond what has become the norm in these exceptional days. I've always known that I have had a knack for being able to connect with people and a desire to kind of um, help humanity in some way. I had to use my talent and my knowledge to try and make a difference in this horrible tragedy. On Tuesday morning, like thousands of other doctors, nurses, and medics who heeded the call to help the victims of the terrorist attack on the World Trade Center, nurse Teresa Thomas put on her scrubs and got to work. I knew there may be limited time to get the supplies we needed if that someone should come through the door. We were ready. But unlike the other people at this triage center, for Teresa, the work was personal. I can imagine, though, that every time a victim walked in, or every time a stretcher came by. Your mind had to be on just one person. It was, I was searching for him. Searching for Brian Novotny, her fiance, a credit broker unlucky enough to have an office on the 104th floor of the World Trade Center. You'll see a, a, maybe a, a haircut or a sh a shirt, sorry. I'm sorry. So, yeah, you know, you're hoping that that really might be him. For Teresa, it would be a day of waiting, searching, and hoping that Brian would emerge from the rubble. In effect, she would have to become two separate people that day. The devoted fiancé keeping hope alive that he would be okay, and the ultimate professional, a medic at the top of her game and ready for anything. For Teresa, that day started like so many before. The morning paper, a cup of coffee, but this time, a goodbye she would not forget. He gave me a, I'm sorry, a kiss on the cheek. And he always waved at the door. And he waved, you know, I'll see you later. As usual, Brian headed to the World Trade Center. Teresa was off to the hospital. But then, just after nine in the morning, she heard the news. A plane had hit the World Trade Center, Brian's Tower, just 14 floors below his office. So I immediately ran back to my phone and attempted to dial. But no one answered. She had no idea where Brian was. Then suddenly she got word that his sister did get through to him on his cell phone. The news was bittersweet. Brian was alive, but trapped. There was a, a kind of a, a sense of relief that she had actually spoken with him, and I was hopeful. If anyone was going to be okay, it was going to be him. Even after the towers collapsed, she held out hope. And then I started to think about what I could do, you know, to try and get some control. So, and the way to get control for you was to do what? Was to um, try and help people. 
she made her way to a triage center across town and waited for the wounded to arrive. But minutes passed, then hours, and few survivors appeared. It must have been frustrating, I would imagine. You're waiting to help. You have everything there. Just bring us somebody. We wanted somebody. You as a nurse, you had to stay focused. I had to stay focused. You had to keep your mind exactly on the task at hand. That's right. What were you afraid would happen if, if, if you didn't? Um, I, th I think I'm afraid that I won't find that, that my hope will go away. Before long, victims began to trickle in, and incredibly, despite her own fears about what might have happened to her fiancé, Teresa continued to work. Finally, after 14 hours, she went home. But after a sleepless night, she was back on the job, helping whomever she could. You put those scrubs back on, grabbed your stethoscope, and went back to work. Not a lot of people could have done that. I think that that's, I'm a, a fighter that way. I think that all of us are stronger than we realize. And when I put my scrubs back on, it empowers me. Again, she went to the triage center. Again, she waited. Again, no sign of Brian. Are you going on fumes? I think so. But yet you keep going back to help. I'll just keep going back until, you know, I don't know. I really don't. I really don't know when, but I'll, I'll keep going back. Today, Teresa's taking time to tend to her own wounds, combing hospitals and rescue centers for news, even setting up an email address, briancomehome at yahoo.com, for anyone who might have seen him in the days since the terrorist attack. We're going to try and get his picture anywhere we can show it. Um, we're going to try and get more information. She's also reflecting on the life they've been hoping to build. A new home, a dog, a wedding in June. Finally, she's finding strength in the memory of an evening they shared the night before the terrorist attack. And he was going to go to sleep and I said, um, for some reason, you know, Brian, can you just stay up and can we just talk for a while before you go to sleep? And he said, sure. That's when we started talking about our future and how much we loved each other and um, we, you know, we're so happy. Just really hang on to that moment now. I hang on to it. And I remember that when we were laying there, he was talking and I was looking at him and I, just, I touched his face and he was hugging me. He's the love of my life. Buildings will go back up again and the economy will recover, but there are some losses that are simply irreplaceable. Let's go back now to NBC's David Bloom, who's in lower Manhattan, and he's monitoring the rescue and recovery operations at the World Trade Center. David? Well, Tom, I missed the third night of this rescue and recovery operation. We're getting used to some of the rhythms and patterns. This is the time of night where we see a lot of the emergency workers coming and going. Some of the firefighters and police officers are working 24 hour on, 24 off shifts. But most of the other emergency workers are volunteers. They come in early in the day, they leave late at night. One of them is joining me now, Dr. Emil Chin, he's an ophthalmologist. You've seen, especially in the last couple days, a lot of eye injuries, a lot of other injuries to the rescue workers. Describe what you're seeing in there. Uh, today we had a couple of rescue workers with crush injuries that we pulled out. Um, the two days beforehand there were more uh, survivors, but right now, um, even though we're hopeful and we have um, false alarms probably every uh, five or ten minutes where somebody blows a whistle and the whole site's got to be quiet, and they follow in with the dogs, we, I haven't seen anybody uh, pulled out alive from the original uh, wreckage. Well, in fact, there were two people pulled out on Tuesday, three on Wednesday, none to the best of our knowledge today. And yet, as you just said, there are moments where all of you, and there are thousands of you inside there, perhaps we could take a live picture right now showing what that scene looks like even at this hour. But, but there are moments when you're asked to stop and be as quiet as you can under the circumstances. Explain that. 
Well, obviously it's hard because uh, you can hear the machinery behind us. There's a lot of earth moving equipment and they're doing some uh, high powered cutting with the settling torches. But every so often they'll blow a whistle and that'll be the command for everybody to be quiet. They're listening for people tapping or, or speaking. And uh, then typically afterwards, they'll ask for a particular piece of equipment. Um, and by the uh, request, we could tell if it's a hopeful sign or not so hopeful. Sometimes they ask for oxygen, which is a very hopeful sign, or maybe a stretcher, and then the medical staff is ecstatic. Other times, unfortunately, too frequently, they'll ask for a body bag or something like that. I know there's some supplies that you're running short of, others that you simply don't have. Tell us what you need, keeping in mind that you're speaking to a national audience here. Um, I would say right now we need some uh, more oxygen tanks that are full. That would be for the uh, local people. And uh, for the national people, I know a lot of volunteers want to help. We don't have the right kind of masks on site. Most of the uh, rescue workers and uh, physicians and nurses, um, we're kind of making do with uh, these type of masks for uh, uh, particulate matter, but uh, there's supposed to be asbestos in the air. The EPA said that, and um, we would need uh, probably a thousand or two thousand uh, asbestos masks, and they could deliver them to medical triage at One Liberty Plaza. Dr. Neil Chin, thank you so much for joining us this evening. Get some rest, and I'm sure we'll see you back here tomorrow. Tom, I want to show you two pieces of tape before we go here. One of which we talked about earlier happened a couple hours ago now. And you can see what happens when the emergency evacuation horn blows and these rescue workers literally take off running for their lives. We've been talking for the last couple days about how there's still a great deal of danger from falling structures, shifting debris. In fact, the three firefighters who were rescued today were rescued because they were trapped inside the shifting debris, the partially collapsing buildings, even today. The second piece of videotape that I want to show you is, is really chilling, really haunting. I alluded to it earlier, and that is that some of these rescue workers are now writing on their arms, writing on their legs, their names, their social security numbers, because they know just how dangerous the work they're doing inside there is, and that they too could become the latest victims of these terrorist attacks. Tom, that's the situation here in Lower Manhattan. All right, thanks Back very much. NBC's David Bloom. In fact, uh, some of those uh, firemen who were rescued today were rescuers who then had to be rescued because they got caught in the collapse of a building. For families of those still missing in the World Trade Center rubble, a terrible reality is slowly sinking in a reality that is so wrong and so hard to accept. Their loved ones may, in fact, never come home, but they can't give up hope. Here's Dateline's Edie Magnus. Secretaries, restaurant workers, brokers, mothers, sons. Loved ones who've not been heard from since the World Trade Center towers collapsed. So far, fewer than 100 bodies have been recovered. We have 94 where we have bodies for identification. 46 of those 94 have actually been identified. But more than 4,700 people have been reported missing. This man, who worked on the 97th floor of Tower One, has five-month-old twin girls at home. He's ready to move on, to buy a house. Give my sister everything that she wanted. James Cartier worked in Tower Two on the 105th floor. This is all we got right now is pictures and memories. I have a picture here. Of Michelle Enrique, Michelle Enrique 27, worked at Fiduciary Trust on the 92nd floor. Janine Gonzalez worked on the 102nd floor with Aon as a secretary. She was chatting online when the second plane struck. This Sunday would have been her 28th birthday. She's an aggressive person. She would have, she would have called. She would have took somebody and said, call my aunt, my mother, my sister. Sean Lugano, 28, worked as a trader at KPW on the 89th floor. The second of five kids, this born and raised New Yorker, played and coached rugby. David Meyer, 57, survived the 93 World Trade Center bombing, carrying a woman down 105 flights of stairs. Bond trader, father, and grandfather. He's always been good. He's always helped anybody who asks him. He's always helped my family through hard times. Please. The spouses us. of these women, four men who worked at Cantor Fitzgerald on the 105th floor, husbands and fathers. Tom Burke, father of four. Thomas Palazzo, 43, father of three. George Morell, 47, father of four. 
William Minardi, 46, father of three. Billy loves life. He can't keep still. He is constantly on the go. He's got more friends than he, he's able to make contact with all his friends. He's, he's loyal to each and every single one. Stephanie Fisher's husband, Andrew, a software designer, was attending a conference on the 106th floor. If he is at peace and it happened to him and he's gone, I hope the smoke got to him first before he felt any pain of anything falling. Peter Gancy, chief of the New York Fire Department, served for 33 years. A father of two, repeatedly decorated for bravery. Anthony Luperetto, 62, a maintenance worker, father of four, grandfather of six, married for 40 years. He was a good father-in-law. He showed me, he showed me how to do his tomato plants in the garden. Scott Saber, 37, was an executive director at UBS Warburg. He was my baby brother. I have hours and hours of stories of, of fighting with each other and then being best friends. Swarna Chalasani, an analyst with Fiduciary Trust. She also volunteered for an organization that helps battered Asian women. She is a most incredible person. You know, and we just want to find her because people like her make friends right away and they deserve to be healthy and happy. Faces of the Missing, a haunting gallery of memories, love, and hope. Now to the daunting uh, diplomatic and political equation that uh, Secretary of State Powell is working on under the direction of President George Bush. A key player in all of that is Pakistan, probably the Taliban government's closest ally. The Taliban government, of course, that controls Afghanistan, where it is widely believed that Osama bin Laden has now been harbored. There, the word is that the United States is putting on pressure on Pakistan to cooperate with a possible strike against Osama bin Laden and certainly to send a warning to the Taliban in Kabul. NBC's Ron Allen is in Pakistan's capital of Islamabad with the latest for us. Ron? Tom, we get the sense that the United States has been applying enormous pressure to the Pakistani government during the past couple of days, going so far as handing the government here a long list of exactly what the U.S. wants Pakistan to do. Uh, at the top of that list, we understand that the United States has told Pakistan that they expect the government here to use its influence with the Taliban to bring about the arrest and, and the handover of Osama bin Laden. They've been that blunt about it. The United States also wants Pakistan to close off its border with Afghanistan. They want, to make, uh, they want Pakistan to make its airspace available. And this morning here, Friday morning, we are hearing reports that, in fact, the airport here in the capital Islamabad has been closed and a number of flights have been canceled uh, this morning that were heading in this direction. We're not sure exactly why the decision was made or what it could mean. But there seems to be a sense here that uh, there, there's a lot of tension building. Pakistan has a very stark choice to make. It's a nation that has not had a very good relationship with the United States, especially in recent years since it began nuclear testing, which the United States strongly opposes. It is under sanctions already. However, Pakistan has a very close cultural, political, and religious relationship with Afghanistan. In fact, the Taliban movement in Afghanistan has deep roots in this country. So the choice that the leaders of Pakistan have to make is a very stark one. To, to go along entirely with what the United States is demanding that it do, or perhaps face a backlash at home here from militant groups and others who oppose Pakistan being too close to the West. Across the border in Afghanistan, we're hearing reports of people fleeing the capital, Kabul. We're hearing of reports of foreign aid workers, diplomats fleeing the country as well. We, we understand that there are now very few foreigners in Afghanistan. There are unsubstantiated reports of of residents of the capital going so far as even digging trenches, uh, worried about an imminent possible attack. Tom? Uh, Ron Allen, uh, what about in the streets of Islamabad and throughout Pakistan? What has been the reaction to this terrorist attack on the United States? Uh, a mixed, mixed feelings. A lot of people are expressing concern, disbelief that one man, Osama bin Laden, could be behind this. Um, a lot of concern, though, that Pakistan could be blamed, that could get caught up in the fallout if, in fact, Afghanistan is, is blamed. Tom? All right, thanks very much. NBC's Ron Allen tonight in Islamabad in Pakistan. Keep your eye on that country 
It is going to be a critical component in whatever happens. Joining us now from the White House is NBC's Campbell Brown. Campbell, tomorrow is a national day of remembrance. What else is on the president's schedule tomorrow? Well, Tom, he will be going to church services in the morning here in Washington, and then he will be traveling to New York tomorrow afternoon to see firsthand the damage and devastation there to meet with many of the families and recovery workers. Uh, he announced that today he was having a conference call uh, with Mayor uh, Rudy Giuliani and New York's Governor George Pataki. Um, I do want to give you a little bit of information we learned this evening. This is from a senior administration official who confirms uh, much of what we just heard from Ron Allen saying tonight, uh, and this illuminates a lot of what has been coming out of these national security meetings that the president has been having throughout the day, saying that they are in fact, putting a lot of pressure on Pakistan and being very specific with them in terms of what kind of help they need with regard to intelligence and with military operations. This official saying that they know Pakistan is eager to avoid isolation, Where wants to next? be more of a, a, a part of the world community, and that they are essentially telling them you cannot be on both sides of this struggle. This is It is time for you as a country to step up. Their message to uh, any known con or country to, uh, who is known to who have harbored terrorists in the past is essentially they are going to view these countries with a great deal of suspicion that they will have to prove their innocence. This official did make one point uh, with regard to Osama bin Laden that yes, of course, he is the main suspect, but at the same time, they cannot rule out the possibility that other groups may have been involved uh, it, only because it may, if they do, close off avenues and investigators should be exploring or allow evidence uh, uh, to, to go cold because they haven't been considering that. And one final point uh, this official making tonight, Tom, is that one thing you'll see the president doing over the next several days is trying to send the message to the American people that this is not going to be a quick operation. This is not something they are going to take care of in a matter of weeks. This official talked about multiple years before they are able to resolve this. Tom. All right. Thanks very much. NBC's Campbell Brown at the White House tonight. Figuring out exactly who did this and how may end up being the easy part, how to keep it from happening again. The U.S. intelligence community faces a much tougher task, looking deep inside to figure out what went wrong this time. Here's Dateline's Victoria Corderi. Behind the now devastatingly familiar images loom some disturbing questions that will not go away. How could this happen here. The United States, the intelligence powerhouse, blindsided by a precision attack from four simultaneously hijacked airliners. And perhaps more frightening still, could it happen again? It's a wake-up call for our country, basically. Our lives have changed. Uh, I think it's as close to war as I ever want to be. The intelligence community is facing some tough questions about how it may have allowed followers of a notorious terrorist, Osama bin Laden, allegedly to breach security at three airports and to attack two cities. It is a new uh, page in American history, uh, and we've got to recognize that and be able to respond to it. Senator Bob Graham is the head of the Senate Intelligence Committee. Along the way, weren't there big shreds or small shreds of evidence that could have been pieced together? And wasn't that a monumental failure? Before we re reach that conclusion, uh, let's complete the analysis of what in fact occurred on Tuesday. There certainly, Can there be any other conclusion? There, there uh, certainly are significant gaps in our in current intelligence capability that have not been filled. The spies, staying up with technology, being able to analyze what we collect, what role each of those may have played in this particular incident occurring, uh, we don't know yet. We will know soon. Senator Bob Graham readily admits the U.S. has gone soft when it comes to rooting out terrorism, especially since the Soviet Union is no longer the enemy. Frankly, we let our intelligence capability slip. What we found out now is that we replaced the bear with a hundred rattlesnakes, and what we, we need to have even more more diverse and more sophisticated intelligence in order to understand those rattles. And this is the most tragic, but certainly not the first time Americans have witnessed terrorism against their own. The first World Trade Center bombing and the USS Cole terrorist attack evidenced our vulnerability long before Tuesday's bombing. 
So where has intelligence in the United States failed? Many point to the aftermath of the Cold War. Technology changed and the enemy changed. And the U.S. simply failed to keep up. Cold War technology revolved around satellites and reconnaissance and communications interceptions. But experts say that has not helped in a world where terrorist cells communicate on the Internet. And there's another aspect to intelligence no one really wanted to talk about until now. Spies. Once they came in from the cold, they sort of disappeared. It's called human intelligence, and some experts say it is lacking. This is not something you just push a button and get instant human intelligence. This is something we need to, to be working toward for decades, generations. We need Frank Salufo is a terrorism expert at the Center for Strategic and International Studies. You don't just knock on, for example, Osama bin Laden's cave and say, here, I'm, I'm, I, I want to join. That's why Senator Graham wanted to put more money into recruiting and training people. We not only want the spies to be able to get inside the cell, but we want them to understand how the computer that the cell uses to communicate with operates and how we can put a tap on that computer so that we can listen uh, to what they are communicating. And that means working closely with those close to the enemy. If we're going to get the kind of information that we need, which will help us avoid uh, another Tuesday, uh, we're going to have to recruit people who have got some dirt under their armpits. So terrorists on the payroll? Uh, they will be terrorists who will be people that we have reason to believe are now prepared to work on our side of the street. The Terrorism uh, expert Salufo uh, agrees. Guys, uh, terrorists don't frequent the cocktail circuit. Very few terrorists, uh, and obviously none, are Boy Scouts. We need to be willing to recruit people within the decision-making chain of, of these organizations with blood on their hand to prevent the loss of American blood and other innocent blood in the future. And that's not the only compromise Americans are being asked to make. Senator Graham says the ban on assassinations effectively has been lifted. And that signals a big change in Washington. The new attitude towards intelligence seems to be whatever it takes. And we should make sure that these agencies responsible for protecting American citizens against terror are not forced to fight this critical battle with one arm tied behind them. Former President George Bush, also the former head of the CIA, Chancellor came out to Cole, plead support for the Bureau. Bureau. And Senator Graham, who is pushing for a five-year, $6 billion intelligence budget, no longer expects the resistance he anticipated from Congress. This is a turning of the page in American history. We are moving from the stage of innocence to the stage of appreciation of our vulnerability. And we need to use this new chapter of American history to try to see that we do not become another Northern Ireland or Israel where our children grow up in constant terror and fear. Can this happen again? And can the intelligence community protect us? Can the American intelligence community uh, give us uh, an insurance policy of absolute protection? No. Uh, can it give the American people the assurance that they are the most secure people in the world? Yes. Dateline's Vicki Corderi tonight, and joining me now from the Pentagon with some late developments is NBC's Jim McLeshevsky. Jim, what's going on down there? Well, Tom, you know, about 24 hours ago, uh, you and I talked, and, and uh, we marveled at the fact that uh, they finally got the fires out here at the Pentagon, but here you're seeing a live picture from our camera just across the street from uh, uh, the most devastated part of uh, the Pentagon, and uh, uh, the fires have erupted once more. Uh, the problem has been... Uh, uh, over the last couple of days, hot spots uh, and uh, uh, pools of jet fuel uh, that were uh, still located in part of the debris. Uh, but this appears to be on one of the collapse sections, uh, one of the where the floors pancaked on each other. Uh, you can tell that by the fact that uh, it's at an angle there. Yes, as the camera pulls back, you can see clearly that's uh, right in the middle of that area uh, that was thought to uh, uh, have been safe. In fact. Construction workers were trying to shore it up uh, so that recovery teams could go in and uh, uh, try to cover, recover those remains in, uh, that, that were still buried beneath the rubble. And also so that National Transportation Safety Board investigators could finally get into that area to search for the black boxes on that American Airlines Flight 77 uh, that slammed into the side of the building. Now, there was some, you know, construction workers, uh, rescue or, or recovery teams were working in that area. Uh, I, I don't know if they were using any 
kind of torches, uh, settling torches or anything of the like to, uh, to burn through some of the debris, uh, but it's quite possible, uh, given the location of that fire, because uh, that's not where the most stubborn fires had been located earlier. Uh, the fire had been traveling through the wood structures that uh, comprised much of uh, the roof of this uh, uh, facility, which is uh, uh, 60 years old. All right, Jim, uh, what's the latest, by the way, on the uh, count of the people who are still missing in there and how many bodies, if any, have been recovered? Well, we're told that approximately 70 bodies have been recovered and removed from the Pentagon. Uh, a total of 126 people uh, are now believed to have been killed in the Pentagon, uh, 64 on that American Airlines flight, uh, including the passengers and the terrorists. So for a total of 190 dead, that's the latest and firmest estimate out of the Pentagon. Uh, all thing at our sometimes inadvertently uh, we're told turning over uh, a piece of debris and then letting air get to uh, burning ashes down below and they uh, then catch fire. There's and, the and first uh, first water being poured on it from uh, from the fire trucks that have just arrived. As we said, this is a flare up. Uh, they had thought, as Gretchen said, they had it out, but we're experiencing the same thing in Manhattan as we are now in Washington with these flare-ups. In this case, uh, they are continuing to search for up to as many as three to four hundred people who may have died in this uh, tragedy on Tuesday. The damage, I mean, the uh, f fatality rates had gone up as high as 800, but they've since downgraded that. However, this is one small part of this massive complex and the rescue effort as well as the grim task of going through there has been going on around the clock but now this is has been altered as well there is much to report in the next two hours we will take you through the day and the night where things are now the events that have taken place all day long and we will look ahead at how the government may strike back and whether that strike whatever it turns out to be will have the desired end, an end not just to the people who committed this atrocity, but to terrorism itself. Here are the latest developments tonight. The Justice Department has identified 18 alleged hijackers. Secretary of State Colin Powell points the finger of blame directly at Osama bin Laden. A flight data recorder has been recovered from United Airlines Flight 93, which crashed in Pennsylvania. The FAA cleared some airports to open and one person was arrested at New York's JFK airport for having a false identification indicating that he was a pilot. There. But we begin first at the Pentagon. Another fire is burning there. We suspect this is a residual fire of what uh, had been going on before. You can see the firefighters at the scene pouring water on the building that was damaged when the plane hit it Tuesday morning and so many people perished. Again, this fire going on now at the Pentagon, we are not precisely sure of the source. Uh, they have been fighting fires, the fire at the Pentagon, really for, uh, for 60 hours, and they continue to fight it still. This going on now in Washington, D.C. As we go along on the streets of Lower Manhattan tonight, as surely you know, the search goes on. It is a search that's being hampered by unstable buildings and by a fast-moving thunderstorm that is heading towards New York City. The faces of evil. Investigators believe they have identified the people who carried out the terror, but the search for those who helped them goes on tonight. And in Washington, the State Department all but says it was Osama bin Laden who backed the attack. So what do you do next? How do you catch? How do you punish a terrorist? And we will spend some time tonight looking at the country itself, its slow struggle to return to normal or to find some sort of new normal. There is a lot of ground for us to cover together. We are inside this evening, off the roof that has been our home for these long days because of the bad weather that is heading to New York. Heavy rains, high winds expected to hit, adding one more miserable element to the problems rescue teams face as they desperately try to find survivors. CNN's Gary Tuckman begins our coverage tonight from the streets near what just 60 hours ago were the magnificent towers of the World Trade Center. Gary. Good evening to you, Aaron. Small fires continue to burn. Smelly, smoky clouds continue to drift over lower Manhattan. And more than 1,000 rescue workers continue to try to look for survivors. But the rains are coming. They're expected to be heavy tonight. 
and that will present major problems. I can't tell you enough how widespread the damage is at the site. The rubble of the World Trade Center complex looks like a mountain range. At some points, it's 75 feet tall. The streets in the surrounding area look like the Blitz from World War II. There are three buildings surrounding the World Trade Center complex, which are said to be structurally unsound. There are fears of the possibility of collapse, and that's making the search much more difficult. 150 to 200 other stores and businesses that aren't part of the World Trade Center complex are also destroyed or damaged. Now, there is also debris everywhere. One of New York City's oldest churches, St. Paul's Chapel, it's a chapel and also an old cemetery. There is debris, refuse, rubble all over the church. Now, no survivors have been found today. There we are looking right now inside the World Trade Center complex towers. This was video shot by a passerby with a video camera today. And you are looking at the deep hole right there, what workers have to contend with on the scene. It's very emotional for many of these people who've been there. For the four or 5,000 people total, there's about 1,500 at a time, but four or 5,000 people total who've been there say they've never seen anything like it and hope they never see anything like this again. There was some celebrating earlier today. Five firefighters, according to police and hospital officials, were rescued from the rubble. But as it turned out, these were not firefighters who were there since the collapse of these buildings. These were firefighters who fell in the rubble earlier today. When they came out, it was assumed by many of the people on the scene that they were in there since Tuesday. As it turned out, they were just recovered from slipping through earlier today. That in itself is good news, but the fact is no survivors from this terrorist incident have been found today, and that's the bad news. But there are rescue workers on the scene who we've been talking to who are still convinced that there are people buried alive. It's really frustrating because you just want to go in there and start tearing things out, ripping them sheet metal. The sheet metal workers are doing it, the steel workers are in there, the pipe fitters, everybody, engineers, Con Ed, I mean just everybody. And it's frustrating because you have to stop. You hear whistles, signals for you to stop because they think they hear a sound, a movement. They'll stop. I mean, total silence. And, you know, and then it might be false alarm or if it is, uh, you, you have to... It, people are so buried down there, you have no idea. That rescue worker, Joseph Lopez, told us that he found parts from the United and American Airlines planes that crashed into the World Trade Center. He says he turned over to those parts to the FBI. He also says he found a Raggedy Ann doll. And he says that find broke his heart. Aaron, back to you. Well, I just uh, let these pictures go a bit for as long as they do. That is uh, certainly the first best look we have had at uh, at what that all looks like, and that is just, uh, that is remarkable, stunning stuff, isn't it? I mean, these office buildings, and then you get to those outside shots. I mean, you gotta remember, there were 50,000 people coming to work, and their buildings blew up under them, and then collapsed, and look at that shot, down to that. My goodness, my goodness. At the other end of that search, uh, there are tonight hundreds of scared and desperate people hoping that a missing loved one somewhere in that wreckage is still alive. It's hard when you look at to imagine it. 4,500 people listed as missing more than that. Many of their family members have come to an armory in New York City looking for help. That's where Elizabeth Cohen spent a very difficult and emotional day and joins us again tonight. Elizabeth. Aaron, we are still here. They are staying open all night, 24 hours here at the Armory on 26 in Lexington in New York, where families are coming to register information to find out about their loved ones, to find out if they are on a list of people who are in hospitals or a list of people who are dead. If you look, you also can see there's an impromptu prayer group going on. That is what that circle of people is. Like everything here, it is completely spontaneous. Someone said we are a band of brothers and sisters here today today, all hoping for the same thing, hoping that our loved ones are among the ones who are still alive. They have been hearing reports that, li that people have been pulled out alive, and they are hoping that theirs will be one of them, or perhaps they're one of the John or Jane Doe's who are in the hospital. One woman said, I can just hope that she's in a coma, so that's why she hasn't 
called me. Those are the hopes that people are feeling today as they register information, as they bring in dental records um, about their loved ones. We are here with a woman who is looking for her best friend. Um, the woman who we're here with is Becky Lothan. She's looking for her best friend, Julie Geis. Now, tell me about the last time you heard from Julie. Julie and I flew into uh, New York on Monday. Tuesday morning, she went to work in the World Trade Center. About uh, 10 minutes to 9, she called me to let me know that she wasn't in the building that was the first building that was hit by an airplane, but she saw that, that airplane fly into the building. She wanted to reassure me that she was okay. And at that time, I didn't have the television on, so I turned the television on and said goodbye, and about 10 minutes later, her building was hit. So tell me again what she said. You talked to her between the two explosions. Right. Tell me again what she said to you. She said, I want you to know that I'm okay. I saw the plane hit the building. She thought it was an accident. And she said, I just called to let you know I'm all right. And that was the end of that. That was the end of the conversation. And I turned the television on, and, and then about 10 minutes later, her building was hit. Can you hold up the picture of Julie sure. for us? Sure. This is a picture of Julie. Julie's an Aon employee, and we're from Kansas City, and I came up with her, and we were going to go to a Yankee game and a Broadway show. Uh, Julie's originally from Nebraska. She has seven brothers and sisters and a mother and father. If you see or know anything about Julie, please call this number. So you were, you were both from Kansas City. Yes. She was here on business. Yes. Um, can you tell me, when you went into the armory, was it organized? Were people sympathetic? It was very wonderful. It was more than I ever expected. It was uh, a lot of people, but it was very organized, and people were very helpful. They had food and water, uh, Cokes, anything you would want. They were very, very nice. You said it changed your opinion of New Yorkers. Yes, it did. The last time I was in New York, it wasn't really like that. It called up the picture of Julie still because we want to make sure that, that she's yeah. seen. Um, tell me about the trip that the two that the two of you... In January, uh, Julie and I are going to uh, uh, Hawaii for a couple weeks. So that would be a nice thing for her to tell people when she gets out of this mess that, you know, that she, that she was here. It would be something to talk about. I've... Uh, Aon Online, uh, the company she works for, has been very helpful. Um, they keep me updated. Everybody in New York, I've talked to the police department several times, and uh, people couldn't be nicer. Tell me about Julie. We can see from the picture how beautiful she is. Yeah. Tell me what, what she was like inside. Julie um, was president of a, of a nonprofit uh, charity organization in Kansas City called Voice. It was Women with One Voice. Um, she gave a lot to charity. She was on a, a lot of different boards. Um, that's the kind of person she was. Unfortunately, Julie would have probably been the last person to leave her floor. She would have made sure everybody else was out before she was out. She's a very strong and tough woman, and if anybody could come through this, it would be Julie. So I have a lot of hope that she's going to be okay. Um, okay, thank you very, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Continue your search and for this Julie. Is, this is the number. If you, if you see Julie, please call this number. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Let's talk now. There are two young women here who are looking for fireman Bob Cordis. Um, you are his girlfriend. Uh, tell me about what you've been through today. Um, well, for the past two days, um, it's been really hectic. I've been. I work in Jersey, so on Tuesday I was stuck there. I had no no phone service. I couldn't get out to anybody. Um, I was trying everywhere, hotlines, hospitals. I couldn't get through. And yesterday, I made it home at around 12 o'clock. And we've just been waiting for someone to call. Um, I've been speaking with his mother, and we've just been waiting for somebody to call for us. And tell me about he was a fireman. Yes. He was he he took risks all the time, didn't yes. he? He just got uh, transferred to Squad One in Brooklyn, and from my recollection, he was one of the first firefighters there. So um, I didn't hear from him Tuesday morning. I know I spoke to him Monday night, and he had told me that he was going in Tuesday morning. So I'm just waiting, waiting for him to come home. 
Thank you. Thank you. Tell me what he was like. He was a very, very strong man. He loved, he loves what he does, and he also worked in a bar. Um, and he just, in, he, he was very outgoing, and he, he had a lot of friends, and we're just waiting for him to come home. Thank you. Thank you. Aaron, these are the stories that we have been hearing all day here outside the armory. These are people who are hoping. I haven't spoken to anyone who has said, I, I've lost hope. Everyone says that they know deep inside that their loved one is, is still alive. And some of the posters, for example, say a mole on this side of the face, so the exact color of hair, because they're hoping that if someone sees them, that, that hopefully they'll report that to authorities. And ordinary citizens have been so helpful here. I just talked to a gentleman who came down here just to look at all the pictures that are posted on the walls, because he said, maybe I would know someone. Other people have walked this line. People are waiting for hours, and ordinary citizens are coming and saying, let me stand in line for you. I'll hold your place. I'm sure you have many things to do. Perhaps you need to sit down and take a break. And they held their place in line. These are people who just did this of their own accord. I spoke earlier today with um, a man named Vinnie Carmage who was looking for his father, Rocco. And I have here with me Vinnie Carmage, whose father, Rocco, was in the World Trade Center. And can you tell me where he worked and when your family last heard from him. My father was a window washer on Tower 2, the observation deck. He worked the rig outside. He last called us at uh, 9.15 a.m. from the 105th floor where he said there was two to 300 people just on that floor waiting for them to be told to head down. And did he say that he was heading down or did he feel safe? He said, don't, don't panic to my mom. He said, don't get upset. Tell my kids I'm going to be okay, not to worry about it. I'm in God's hands. We're all going to be okay, don't worry. And tell me why today you're distributing these, these flyers. This morning, my mom woke me up early telling me that he's, they, his name was on one of the survivor lists on an internet web page and that uh, our best information, we can get the best information from the building behind us, the armor. And what happened when you went into the armory here? I have a, a case number. I looked it up on to see if my dad was in any of these hospitals and no luck. No luck yet. What's in your head now about what, what you think happened? I don't know. I know that my father, he wouldn't have just left, every, he wouldn't have just left everyone behind. He, he would have looked for his workers, he would have helped people people out. He did it on the 90th, when it, they bombed it in 93, he, he helped a, a, pregnant lady, a pregnant woman down the stairs. So he was in the building in 93? Yes, he was. He's been working there since 1973. Was he scared to go back and work in that building after the 93 bombing? My father went back the next day. They asked him, because they needed to inspect the outside of the building. And uh, my father knew how to operate the rig, so he brought down all the workers to inspect the building. If you think your father might be out there somewhere, what would you want to say to him? I want to tell him that we all miss him. His little nephew, Luke, misses him. And that uh, we're strong. We got hope. Thank you. Thank you. Aaron, I've been talking to these families for two days now, and all of these stories are very much like this. People are just hoping that their relatives are out there somewhere, and they're begging us to talk about them, to show their pictures, hoping that if someone's seen them, that they might be able to identify them and give some information. Aaron, I've met so many people here like Vinnie Carmage today and in other places yesterday where families were registering information. And all I can say is that these people have superhuman strength, that they are able to get it all together, come down here, fill out 10-page forms about their loved ones, and they are walking, they are traipsing the streets of Manhattan looking for anyone who has information about the person that they love. Aaron? Elizabeth? We are trained to be dispassionate, but we are not expected to be inhuman. You did terrific work today. I, I, I can only imagine how difficult it has been. Thank you for your efforts. Thank you. CNN's Elizabeth Cohen. The toughest 
absolutely the toughest conversations, the interviews we've had to do are with people who are waiting and they continue to wait and to spend two days doing that is um, it's tough work guys. I was asked by a reporter the other day how this was affecting me and I told them that every time I close my eyes I kept seeing the image of that plane hitting the second tower. It is an image burned in my brain and I suspect uh, many of yours as well. None of the thousands of words that we've spoken are as powerful as that image. The images of this story are the pain and oddly enough they are also the promise that the pain will pass. Here's CNN's Beth Nissen. A single image can have such power. This one photograph helped a stunned nation grasp what had happened after the Oklahoma City bombing. There is not yet a single iconic image to help a stunned world comprehend the human cost of Tuesday's attack. Most of the images are at remove, heavy machinery clawing at rubble, closed trucks carrying bodies to the morgue. Headlines and news reports are starting to number the dead, but most of those lost are still shrouded without a name or face. You can say hundreds of people died and if you see one image of one man holding one dead person, it's a different kind of information because it's more personal. For so many, this one image personalized the human loss in New York this week. They looked at this picture and knew that there were thousands of souls like this one dark-haired man, thousands who went to work Tuesday morning and were dead just hours later. Many family members of those lost in other terrorist attacks say such graphic images are vitally important psychologically. One of those lost in the bombing of Pan Am 103 over Lockerbie, Scotland, was J.P. Flynn, the brother of Brian Flynn. It does start to make it sink in uh, when all of a sudden it becomes less um, this thing on TV and more about, oh my God, there's J.P. He is gone. Many psychologists say vivid images of tragedies such as the Oklahoma City bombing can help people move past disbelief and toward grief, a grief that will slowly give way to acceptance, however painful it is, that allows them to go on with life, however altered it is. Yet researchers on traumatic stress caution that graphic images of death, especially those televised without warning, are not therapeutic for everyone. They may be re-traumatized by an image. Information is a double-edged sword. How much information is too much information? And as traumatic as the sight of a human corpse is, the sight of a dismembered one is immeasurably worse. One of the reasons there are so few pictures of individual victims at Ground Zero is that so few individual bodies are intact. Those working in the debris say the scene is a horror. You actually, you bend down and you pull up a shoe, there's a foot inside. Uh, there might be an arm laying next to it. You know, it's, 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 I've never seen nothing like it. Never in my life. You know, only in the movies. And this is real life what I'm talking about. Day three, the full picture of all that happened is still developing and may always be in thousands of pieces. Beth Nissen, CNN, New York. A first look at the New York story today. The uh, investigation into all of this moves forward, and it moves forward at a fairly rapid pace, and we've learned uh, just in the last few minutes of a development we want to get to you right now. Uh, CNN's Kelly Arena, who covers the Justice Department, joins us now. Uh, there was an incident at JFK, I guess it was late this afternoon, wasn't it, Kelly, where some people were detained. Fill in some blanks on this, because this is getting more fulsome almost by the minute. Very disturbing, Aaron. Very disturbing developments, actually, at both JFK and LaGuardia airports. Uh, law enforcement sources tell CNN that at least eight people have been arrested uh, for various issues, including fake documentation, um, some INS violations. One was even caught uh, carrying a fake pilot's license. Uh, Four of the individuals, and this is where it gets interesting, four of the individuals were actually seen at a New York City airport on the day of the terrorist attacks. They went to, they were, they were passengers uh, with tickets, they went to the ticket counter. They were challenged, we are told, at the ticket counter and bolted from the airport, ran away. They have resurfaced, they came back today again to JFK. Uh, they are now in custody. As to whether or not this was another hijacking attempt, one U.S. official tells CNN, certainly this is being looked at, that a hijacking was thwarted. 
There is concern in our office that this may have been another attempt. So, Aaron, the bottom line here, eight people, at least eight people, in custody uh, being questioned by uh, FBI members of the Joint Terrorism Task Force. Back to you. Uh, that, that, that is remarkable because you have to think of the brazenness of that. If these people were involved in that and on the day the airports reopen, try and get on an airplane and get out of, get out of Dodge, that's incredible if that's Absolutely. what it turns out to be. Absolutely. Kelly, thanks. Nice, nice piece of reporting. Thank you. This investigation, as we say, moves forward. The Justice Department says it now believes 18 people in total were responsible for the four hijackings on Tuesday. CNN's national correspondent Mike Betcher joins us now from Atlanta with the latest on the investigation, and there is a lot happening. Well, indeed, Aaron. Uh, as we just heard, a total of eight arrested at New York airports. That one uh, person carrying that fake pilot's identification. We know four or five other people uh, who were trying to check in for flights were arrested at Kennedy. And uh, investigators around the country are trying to make sense uh, of what exactly is going on. Are these people uh, part of a continued uh, conspiracy, part of a uh, ongoing conspiracy, part of the past conspiracy that brought down those four jetliners. It's a, a very difficult situation as 4,000 agents are spread across the country knocking on hundreds of doors. And before it's all over, Aaron, they're going to have to knock on tens of thousands of more doors trying to get to the bottom of the conspiracy. We're we're told that uh, the investigation uh, being conducted overseas by intelligence officials is bearing some fruit as they are looking uh, across uh, the Atlantic uh, in search of the identity of the group that these people perhaps belong to. So, so it's a very difficult investigation, but as we said, the main thing tonight are those people arrested uh, at Kennedy Airport. At New York's LaGuardia Airport, police detained at least two other men for questioning. After the spate of arrests and detentions, all New York area airports were closed again. A few other airports in the U.S. have also shut down once more because of security concerns. Attorney General John Ashcroft said FBI agents are making progress in their investigation, adding that they have identified the hijackers aboard all four ill-fated jets. The total number of hijackers to our best uh, estimate and our best knowledge given the information at this time on the four planes that crashed was at least 18 and less contradicted by uh, evidence which uh, we wouldn't anticipate uh, two planes had five hijackers and two other planes had four hijackers each Mohammed Atta, shown in this photograph, and Marwan al Sheri are two of the men on that list of 18, according to federal investigative sources. Both held United Arab Emirate passports, but it's not clear if they are actually citizens of that country. The lives the two men led are the objects of an intensive international investigation, stretching from Florida to Germany. In Hamburg, Germany, federal police launched an extensive search of an apartment shared by Mohammed Atta and Marwan al Shari last February. During an additional search of another Hamburg apartment, a woman was taken away for questioning. She clutched a baby in her arms as German police tried to hide her with a sheet. During the night, a total of eight apartments were searched in the Hamburg area. Back in the U.S. in Pompano Beach, Florida, FBI agents converged on a small rental car company called Warwick. Across the country, several, uh, several people have been detained by federal investigators as they, uh, as they search for leads in this case, but uh, many of those people have been arrested, and, and right now we're trying to get a fix for you how many people are still in detention and where the fruits of those leads are taking federal agents. Aaron? Uh, Mike, just a couple of quick things, I think. Um, we, we use the term arrested and then we say they're being detained. And I get perfectly honest, I'm a bit confused which it okay. is. Let are me, they, in fact, have been arrested? Are they charged with anything? Because uh, they're not charged with anything. But uh, because we try to give you the most updated information, that information from Kelly Arena uh, mm -hmm. came just as she got it and she presented it to you. Uh, when this spot was put together just shortly before that, all we knew is they were detained. 
Now they're using the word arrested uh, for fake documentation, uh, I am told. And of course, we have that one pilot uh, or the, uh, the person with the fake pilot ID, Aaron. And, and over the last several days, there have been a number of people who have been detained, held as material witnesses and the like. Um, in some cases, these were immigration violations. I think they were being held on. Um, is it your sense that these, this is sort of a charge of convenience? It allows the government to hang on to these people until they can figure out if, in fact, they have any relationship to this? Well, in some cases it is, but they are obligated under the law to uh, uh, place those people uh, in uh, detention under those INS laws uh, if they're found to, uh, to be in the country illegally, but in cases where they think they have someone who is a good lead, uh, they, they will use that, and it's been done before, Aaron. Mike, thanks. Mike Betcher at Atlanta is working the investigative side of this. We have more on that, uh, but we need to quickly go to our senior White House correspondent, John King, because there is yet another breaking development there. John? Well, Aaron, I wish we could tell you exactly what we have before us, but this has been a very confusing day here. We have had the security perimeter stretched out beyond the White House yet again. And just a few moments ago, out of the old executive office building, and we can show you a picture of it, came some Secret Service personnel. That is a robotic vehicle that is part of the Secret Service bomb squad. Now, it has sat inside the gate since it came out a few moments ago, so we're not trying to alarm anybody here. But this on a day in which the White House reestablished a much wider security perimeter around the White House for the past several hours, a helicopter with a searchlight has been flying over the premises, shining down a searchlight on the streets around the White House. That vehicle just, oh, 45, 50 yards from me through a fence between the White House and the old executive office building. And again, we don't want to get anyone out of control here. It came out. The officers are still sitting there. But uh, yet again, another sign of the extraordinary stepped up security around the White House tonight. This on a day in which we saw the president out in public trying to reassure the American people. Tomorrow he will attend a national prayer service, ask the nation to pause for a moment of silence. That part of the president's effort to get the country to look forward in a more reassuring mode. But the developments around here today, a signal that this crisis will go on for some time to come. Yourself. The president choked up as he discussed the enormity of the challenge ahead. I think about the families, the children. Um, I'm, a, I'm a loving guy. And I'm also someone, however, who's got a job to do. And I intend to do it. Two days after the attacks, discussions with top security advisors include talk of retaliatory strikes, followed by a sustained international diplomatic and financial crackdown against suspected terrorists and their supporters. Now's an opportunity to do uh, generations a favor by coming together and whipping terrorism, hunting it down, finding it, and holding them accountable. Solved. Uh, the nation must understand this is now the focus of my administration. Sources say military planners are discussing options for retaliating against the lead suspect, Saudi terrorist Osama bin Laden. But one senior official said the administration was waiting to act because, quote, there might be not one but multiple organizations involved in this. Another served notice that when the administration does act, it will not be a one-time affair. You don't do it with just a single military strike, no matter how dramatic. You don't do it with just military forces alone. You do it with the full resources of the U.S. government. It will be a campaign, not a single action. The President and First Lady took time to visit some of those injured in the attack on the Pentagon. And Mr. Bush called Governor George Pataki and Mayor Rudy Giuliani to announce he will travel to New York on Friday to get a first-hand look at the worst of the devastation. But this interfered with the White House effort to project a reassuring image. The security perimeter around the White House suddenly expanded because of new concerns of a terrorist attack. Vice President Cheney left the White House and was rushed to the Camp David presidential retreat so that he and the president would not be at the same location. Now these new and constantly changing security precautions here at the White House, part of what one of the president's closest advisors called, quote, a transforming event for us and for the country. And Aaron, what the president himself labeled earlier today, the first war of the 21st century. Well, you have this, whatever this is going on on the White House grounds now with the uh, 
the suspicions. You have the capital evacuated late this afternoon, early this evening. You have a city that is absolutely on edge where everything is taken seriously. There's very similar scenes in New York going on. Uh, how does the president, how does the White House, how does anyone in Washington suggest to the American people that things are getting back to normal? That is an enormous challenge, Aaron, and they recognize that here at the White House. The president himself has personally tried to script the prayer service that will be held when he is in New York tomorrow, trying to offer reassuring signals to the public. But every time the White House tries to cast a more reassuring image, we have a recurrence of events like this. I want to emphasize we see the robot from the bomb squad out here on the facilities, but still people, reporters, anyone with a White House pass, free to come and go. So obviously not a crisis atmosphere, but you're right. The president, on the one hand, offering reassuring words today, Hours later, they say National Airport will be closed indefinitely because of its proximity to the White House and the Pentagon. A very tough challenge for this president, not only in the days ahead, but they know it here at the White House in the weeks and months ahead as well. I expect they do. John, thanks. Senior White House correspondent John King. Secretary of State today, by the way, was not mincing any words at all. He was pointing fingers and demanding cooperation. There was none of the nuance that one usually sees in the business of diplomacy. Andrea Koppel covers the State Department. She joins us now. It was quite a remarkable briefing, wasn't it, in that way? It certainly was, Aaron, as you say, uh, quite unusual for folks in this building. But that wasn't the only thing unusual that happened today on the diplomatic front. Certainly when you consider the very delicate way, the very careful way the U.S. has been dealing with getting information from the Yemeni government. That was uh, the last attack against Americans last year, uh, the USS Cole in Yemen. Now fast forward 48 hours to the very public way that the folks in this building have been dealing with the government government of Pakistan. Tightening the diplomatic screws on Pakistan's president, the Bush administration presented a list of specific steps it says Pakistan must take. Among them, to share information on what it knows about Tuesday's attacks and Osama bin Laden's terrorist network, to close the border between Pakistan and Afghanistan and cut off fuel shipments, and eventually to provide the United States with use of Pakistani airspace if needed. We haven't yet publicly identified the organization we believe was responsible. But when you look at the list of candidates, uh, one resides in that region. Later, when pressed by reporters... When you spoke of the candidate who resides in that region, were you speaking of Osama bin Laden? Yes. For the first time, Powell saying publicly what many have said privately, that bin Laden's network, based in Afghanistan, is a prime suspect. And as Afghanistan's neighbor and longtime supporter, Pakistan could play a critical role in finding bin Laden and shutting down his terrorist training camps for good. Following another full day of intense meetings and conversations between U.S. and Pakistani officials, President Musharraf assured the Bush administration of Pakistan's unstinted cooperation in the fight against terrorism. He said Pakistan is ready to commit all of its resources to locate and punish those responsible for the attacks in New York and Washington. President Musharraf is in a difficult position. He has aided the Taliban. Uh, for, for a number of years. Uh, but also he needs the United States very badly right now. Uh, uh, we are improving our relations with India. Uh, he can't afford, I think, to antagonize the United States. State Department officials say early indications from Pakistan are, quote, very positive. Still, Secretary of State Powell acknowledged that with economic sanctions in place, the U.S. has very little leverage to turn up the heat. But Powell also said that the U.S. could make life a lot easier for Pakistan, Aaron, if that government cooperates. Andrea, help me with this a little bit, because after these incidents, and I don't care where they happen, governments always condemn them and they say they're terrible and they're not going to allow it to go on and then it goes on and on again and it's the same players so why does what pakistan says now well how should why should it be seen in any different way if in fact it should be well certainly the you're absolutely right to say that you it's one thing to say something rhetorically it's another thing to back that with action and and the u.s is by no means saying that they 
are writing the end of this chapter right now. What they are saying is that they're hearing things publicly and, and privately from General Musharraf and other Pakistani officials that are encouraging. Now they'll see whether or not they're backed with action. So it's private things we'd like to hear, I guess. Thank you, Andrew. Thank you for your work today. Um, from the State Department, we move on to the Pentagon. Thousands, think about this, thousands of reserves could be called to action in the wake of the incidents on Tuesday, that tragedy to relieve the National Guard troops who are now on air patrol over the United States. The president has to make that decision. Our military affairs correspondent, Jamie McIntyre, has more. He joins us tonight from the Pentagon. Jamie, good evening. Well, Pentagon officials are trying to make two things perfectly clear. One is it is the president's decision. It's not a Pentagon decision. And two, that decision has not yet been made. Nevertheless, Pentagon sources are telling us that the Bush administration is considering calling up thousands of reservists to uh, bolster the U.S. military strength. Some of those would be used to fly and, uh, and service the combat air patrols and some of the planes that are on strip alert around the country. Now, Secretary Rumsfeld canceled the combat, uh, uh, the fighter jet flights over most metropolitan areas, but he's left the planes flying in the New York to Washington corridor for now. In addition, at 26 bases across the United States, planes, fighter planes are on 15-minute strip alert. That means the pilots have to be nearby and ready to take off within 15 minutes in case there was a threat to the United States. Now, those planes are flown by Air National Guard and uh, National Guard troops, and uh, they've been at it for a, a, a day or so now, two days now, and the uh, Pentagon is looking at how they might give them some relief by calling up some of the reserves. They also might use some of these troops to just uh, to bolster the efforts at uh, disaster relief as well. Uh, have, the, have, we, have you heard anything from uh, the other side of town, from over at the White House, that gives you any reason one way or another to know what the president will do or when the president might do it? Well, I think a lot depends on, uh, A, if they decide to continue to keep these fighter jets on, on alert, uh, keeping ships at sea. I mean, that is designed to make sure the United States is protected and also to reassure the American public, but um, frankly, it's somewhat symbolic, so they might want to stand that down. If they do carry out this ca uh, campaign, this broader campaign that the United States keeps talking about against terrorism, then that will require reservists. The way the U.S. military is organized these days, no major military action can be done without reservists who have specialties in particular areas. That's basically the way the war plan works. And, uh, just, uh, and I assume that's because as the military has gotten smaller, right? I mean, the military is just smaller Absolutely than it right. once was. Yeah, as, as they did that, they, the plants now rely on reservists for all kinds of things, doctors, uh, air traffic controllers, uh, logisticians. Um, and of course, reservists are people who have uh, regular jobs, they're, they're civilians the rest of the time. And, but under uh, law, the president can call them into service for up to two years, and he has the authority to call up to one million reservists. The last time this was done was in the Persian Gulf War. 265,000 troops were called up for the Persian Gulf War in 1991, those reservists uh, serving uh, in the Persian Gulf War. And just quickly, do you have any idea how many, uh, how many people we're talking about here that might be called up or where those people are? Well, there, it, there could be, uh, there's th it would be thousands of troops. I'm not sure okay. if it would be several thousand or up to tens of thousands, and there'd be all over the country. So there's no particular units that ultimately there would be particular units, but at least that what we're that we're hearing now that might be involved right. in this. It could okay. be spread all over the country. Okay, Jamie, thanks, Jamie McIntyre at the Pentagon this evening, updating uh, that. That would be a very expensive proposition, and would it just add to the price tag of what is already an extraordinarily expensive tragedy. Um, and I don't honestly believe that we hear numbers, uh, 20 billion, 30 billion, anyone really knows. We're about 43 minutes past 10 o'clock Eastern time. For those of you who might just be joining us, we'd like to update you briefly on where we have been tonight. As Jamie McIntyre just reported, President Bush is considering activating some military reserve units for the first time since the Persian Gulf War. They would be used to assist in emergency response efforts. Congress has already agreed to double the $20 billion uh, the White House has requested to pay for the recovery and the disaster relief area. So that's moving through the Congress now. Three New York City, uh, the three major New York City airports were closed again tonight after several security related incidents, including the arrest of a person reportedly carrying a fake pilot's ID in Kelly Arena at the Justice Department 
reports that it may be that these people tried to board planes on Tuesday, may have been a part of the broader conspiracy. In any case, they're in custody and they are being aggressively investigated tonight. And also, Northwest Airlines abruptly canceled a few flights it had scheduled tonight, saying it had information indicating it was not safe to fly. President Bush has declared Friday a national day of prayer and remembrance. Mr. Bush is scheduled to attend a prayer service here in New York City tomorrow. And a brief update of where we have been in the first 44 minutes tonight. We'll, we've got an hour and uh, 15 minutes to go. We want to go back to uh, the airlines. There's a, uh, the country, I, th I think all of us are struggling to get back to normal. And at the nation's airports, finding normal was not easy, not for the airlines themselves, not for the people who run the airports, and not for the passengers, as the new rules that have rapidly been put in effect have slowed things down. Here's CNN's Patty Davis. Security tight as most of the nation's airports reopened. But not Reagan National Airport, where continuing concerns about flights near the Pentagon and White House kept it closed. Massive snowblowers parked to protect the control tower from a terrorist attack. At Washington Dulles Airport, passengers forced to dump razor blades, even knitting needles, anything like the knives terrorists used in Tuesday's hijackings. The terrorist attacks in New York and Washington not stopping some from returning to the skies. I kind of, yeah, afraid of the airplane, but more than that, I just, yeah, want to go home. I'm confident that security precautions are in place and uh, despite what's happened, uh, life has to go on. The Federal Aviation Administration ordered airlines and airports to beef up security, including a complete search of planes and terminals before they could open for business. No curbside check-in, no off-airport check-in, no more knives and carry-on luggage, boarding areas restricted to passengers. And in times such as these, we will use all available resources to ensure the safety of our travelers. The Transportation Secretary even talking about using the military's elite Delta Force commandos on planes to help armed federal air marshals stop hijackers. Airlines were warning passengers to arrive as much as two hours in advance. The old days where you could get to the airport at the last minute and, you know, run through to the counter and the gate and get on the airplane, uh, those, those days are gone. 1,200 flights had flown by mid-afternoon all across the country, from Los Angeles to Atlanta. The FAA giving the go-ahead to commercial and charter flights, but not to private planes or any overseas carriers for now. Analysts estimate airlines lost billions of dollars while grounded at a time when airlines are struggling financially. Our highest priority is to restore the confidence of our passengers in this system. That is going to require patience on the part of our customers, but we also need to restore commerce in America. The question now, will passengers return? Patty Davis, CNN, Washington. Almost immediately after the attacks, Arab Americans across the country, this is disturbing and it's not surprising, began feeling the backlash from it all. In North Texas, a mosque was damaged, an apparent firebombing attack, no one inside at the time. It was the third mosque attack since Tuesday. In San Francisco, blood was poured on the sidewalk of an Islamic community center, San Francisco. In Chicago, hundreds of people, many waving American flags, were held back by police as they try to uh, march to a mosque. And all over the United States, Arab Americans say they are tonight living in fear. I'm blown away because I, I'd expect that people realize that this is, this is not, uh, this is not American. This is completely un-American. Right. Not left untouched, Arab American children who uh, as you can imagine, like all children, they're in a somewhat different situation trying to understand why people are so angry at them. Jane. I am afraid that um, they might start being mean to Muslims like they did 200 years ago to black people. I'm just going to try to show that I'm kind and I'm innocent and I'm just a good person. 
up in situations like that in New York City as well. Dr. James Zogby is in Washington. He's the founder and president of the Arab American Institute, a Washington-based organization that uh, serves as a political and policy research arm of the Arab American community. And he joins us now. Dr. Zogby, good evening. Thanks for joining us. Thanks, Aaron. I, I, um, it's hard, in a sense, to know what to ask. I mean, I, I said at the beginning, it is very disturbing. It is not surprising. We saw similar things, didn't we, after Oklahoma City? Yeah, we did, and we expected it. And like you, we weren't surprised, but we were afraid. And there's a double tragedy in all of this for my community because we were mourning and grieving like the rest of America. I have Arab Americans in the World Trade Center building and Arab Americans in the Pentagon, and they're Arab American uh, policemen and firefighters uh, in New York right now uh, uh, working uh, at that site. And yet, we were taken from our mourning and had to be afraid. I got horrific death threats at my office, uh, as did others in this town, and there were actual acts of violence, as you've reported. And so it became a very difficult situation as we got pulled away from the, the body politic that we're a part of as American citizens and had to somehow be looking over our shoulder. But I want to tell you that there's a good story here, a good news uh, item from today. 24 hours after the threats came, Today we had an incredible outpouring of support from the President and the Attorney General and the Secretary of State to Senators who called me, uh, Senator Kennedy and I talked to Joe Lieberman and Senator Harkin passed a resolution, a unanimous resolution in the Senate. Senator Edwards and Senator Stabenow all called to say we want to support you as did um, a dozen or so ethnic American organizations from Portuguese and Italian and Irish and Hispanic and, and then just our neighbors and friends, the local police department came by and has offered us protection. And even the, the office next door to us, Street Law, is making uh, lunches for people on my staff uh, because they know they're afraid to go out. And so it's almost like we got torn away from our grief, but now um, um, America has come to embrace us to say, you can go back, you're a part of us, and, and you can grieve with the rest of us. And it's been a very, very heartwarming day. We know that there's gonna be tough days ahead, but there's been some good in all of this as well, as difficult as it is to imagine. Well, and it's, it, that's nice to hear. It, it does, it, as you were talking about, it struck me that uh, uh, I, we've talked before, you're a well-known person in Washington. You've moved in the circles of the Capitol for some time. People know you there. There's a difference between what official Washington says and does and, and sometimes what goes on in other parts of the right. country. Um, how many Arab Americans are there? There's about three and a half million Arab Americans in there. Yeah. They are all over the country and they're well established. Most of them are. They're the most vulnerable, uh, of course, are the more recent immigrants. But I want to tell you the Justice Department set up today a special project. Uh, we met with the Assistant Attorney General, uh, Ralph Boyd. They've set up a special project on hate crimes. That they're going to be actively pursuing those who threaten Arab Americans because just as the terrorists can't win and we as a people will be unified and, and will defeat them, we will not allow bigotry to win either because then America won't be America anymore. And that's one thing that, that cannot come from this is that we become divided um, as a people. And so I'm, I'm proud of the way my, my country's responded. I'm proud of the way my community has responded with blood, blood drives and vigils and, and expressions of support for their fellow Americans uh, everywhere. It, it has been a very difficult, a very painful time. It's not over. The scenes you showed tonight of people looking for closure that may never find it, that will be with us for a long time. And yet, in all of this, uh, America finds a, a way to be the unique and, and, and embracing country that it, that it is. And I think that that's important for all of us to remember. Dr. Zagby, let me ask you one of those um, annoying questions. Take off your official's hat, your representative of an institution hat, mm -hmm. and just tell me if when you heard of what happened in New York and Washington if you didn't close your eyes and say, oh my God, I hope that was not an Arab who did it. You know, I didn't. I, I know people who did and I've heard stories of people in my community and my own family who felt that and, and prayed that it wouldn't because they knew what it would be. But I must tell you from my perspective, uh, I was just riveted as everyone else was with the horror of that scene. I've been to that building. We almost opened an office in that building because a friend of, of mine has an office there and was going to open a, a, a New York office for our institute there. I know that there are dozens of Arab American office 
is in that in that World Trade Center. And so I thought of the horror. Actually, what, what, what occurred to me was the people on that plane and the, the terror that they must have gone through as they knew that they were going to die. And, and only then afterwards, when the, the calls and the threats came, did I almost get jolted back to the, the unfortunate and ugly reality that that some would accuse and point a finger and realize then we had to issue statements and begin to talk about yeah. it in a different way. Um, but I want to tell you, I want a message to my community as well. You're right, in, in small and isolated towns, there will be people who will do ugly and awful things. But there will be many more who will reach out and embrace Arab Americans. And I think that that's the important message of, of today. We can mourn with the rest of America because we are a part of America and the fact is is that we will work together as one country to defeat this scourge. Dr. Tagby, it's good to talk to you again. It's been a while. Thank you. W wish you well, sir. Thank you. Let's talk on better times. Uh, it, all, in my business, it rarely seems to work that way, though, does it? Okay, thanks. We'll try. Thank you, sir. Bye -bye. Thank you. Goodbye. James Zogby from Washington tonight. In London today, this was quite extraordinary. An emotional, unprecedented ceremony taking place at Buckingham Palace. A military band played the Star Spangled Banner at a special changing of the guard. Of course, this was in honor of the victims of the terrorist attacks. Palace today. Um, in New York today, a New Yorker, former President Bill Clinton, lent his support to the relatives and friends of the missing, and this too, in its own way, was a rather extraordinary scene outside the armory. <laughs> Two children in the military. He's their dad. He was in, in on the first week of four, first thing at the other Your morning. Yes. 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 They're still fighting people. Don't lose hope. Thank you very much. This lady came up to me and she said, this is my husband. He's missing. He was in the Marine Corps and two of his sons, two of our sons, are in the military. You commanded them and I want my husband back.
Maybe. Former President Clinton in uh, New York late this afternoon. Our senior analyst, Jeff Greenfield, is here, and you got a couple of things you want to talk about. Let me ask you something just quickly. Please. Because when I saw the former president uh, in that scene today, I wondered if that wasn't going to spark some resentment by the people, by some people who don't like him very much, that he was trying to steal the stage, steal the spotlight, and he's not the president anymore. It's possible. I mean, the, 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 the political sensitivities in a story that this overwhelming, uh, the, the only one that I know that we've seen are, was, was the determination of the White House to shoot, uh, to, to, to knock down any notion that he didn't get back to Washington quickly. Yes. When Bill Sapphire or the Times wrote about it, they, they gave him extraordinary information. So I, I assume that may play. All right, I want to get you quickly to where you want to go here. Um, the, the messages coming out of the White House, are, are we getting back to normal or are we not? Well, I think it's beyond the White House. I think all of us are desperately searching for some signs of reassurance. I mean, the, the fact that there was such joy at the news, which turned out, unfortunately, to be false, that they found five firefighters. When you look at what that news would have been had it been true, five lives saved 5,000? Yeah. Um, I, I was thinking that maybe, maybe reassurance isn't really what we need now. I was thinking of Winston Churchill, who we all no, is the man who rallied Great Britain in its worst hour, and he once went on the radio and said to his people, the news from France is very bad. And I think what he was saying was, I'm going to level with you and tell you the, the seriousness of the situation so that you will know when I, when I ask of you to be brave and to do this, you will know that I'm telling you the truth. I think this is, this, if you look at what happened, not just Tuesday, more than 60 hours ago? Yeah, a little bit. But the fact that the you know, the, the stock markets have been closed since longer than the, in the Depression. We have, you know, that, that we've vacated, evacuated the House and Senate. We need to face head on how rough this is. The, the problem in part is, I mean, I don't want to suggest this is the problem, is that every time we say something, do something that says this is really big, really bad, really awful, we are in a sense saying they won. Well, when the Japanese bombed Pearl Harbor and took out the Pacific Fleet, they won a battle. They knocked the United States flat on its back for a while. The important message then and now is to know that eventually w this will not be permitted to stand. But they have, I, I said earlier tonight that, that I think it's really way past time we stop talking about this as a senseless act. From the perspective of the folks who did this, evil, yeah, monstrous, yeah, senseless, no. It was exactly what they wanted to do. And part of, I think, what, what a great nation has to do is to assess the fact that we have been hit in a way we have never been hit in our history. Because that's when you re begin to measure what has to be done. So we accept this horrible reality, which is not, in fact, it seems to me something in modern political times we do very comfortably. We don't, political leaders, at least not in the last 20 years or so, have not been much willing to say it's really bad. Yeah, they haven't had to. I mean, except for Oklahoma City, which was, which was a 100, they, part of what's gone on here is that a lot of, I think, the crises, when we talk about crises, they have been, they have been Moments. not real. Yeah. Even the Gulf War, which could have put many, many American uh, service people at risk, turned out to be a, a walkover. And so we've had it very easy. I, I said to you two days ago on the roof, this may have been the day that America's luck ran out. That's something that we haven't had much experience facing. And we, we're telling each other everything is going to be different now. But I think it begins with a really honest assessment of what has happened. And what has happened, uh, the, you know, it's not something you can say, well, yes, we took a blow. This, this was something that's going to require something we have not asked of this country literally in six decades. It's a very sobering way to look at this. And I, it's, yeah. But, but if... I'm not suggesting for a moment it's not the right way to look at it. It is just a kind of reality that I think we resist. Well, of course we do, and that's why we look for reassurance in the, the possible story of people being saved and the good works that people are doing. But, if we're, seri but if, if, if we're serious as a country about what has to be done, it begins by measuring what has happened. And, and uh, you know, a friend of mine who I saw yesterday said, I was looking for you for reassurance. And I said, well, I'll be, I'll, I'll be glad to provide some. Uh, you know, eventually this country's gonna, gonna prevail, but. No, but not tomorrow. Thanks, Jeff. Senior okay. analyst Jeff Greenfield joins us for a bit.
We're uh, about four minutes past 11 o'clock Eastern time. Uh, some of you may be tuning in and we want to update you on where we have been and where we're headed now. Here are some of the latest developments this evening. Sources say at least eight people uh, are arrested at New York's Kennedy and LaGuardia airports. Four of them were challenged at the gates or at the counters of one of the airports on the day of the hijackings. The suspects are in custody for, among other things, casing, uh, carrying rather false documents, including one man who was posing as a pilot. Officials trying to see if or how they might be connected to the tragedies of Tuesday. The president says the Pentagon, uh, rather the Pentagon says the president is considering activating reserve troops to relieve National Guard troops that have been patrolling U.S. airspace since Tuesday's terrorist attack. And in Manhattan, a city armory near Gramercy Park is converted into a center for those who have been waiting for word on their loved ones. It is one of those places that will break your heart. Mayor Giuliani urges residents to have patience with hundreds of New Yorkers pitching in as volunteers to help find the missing. And in a rare show of unity in Congress, the Congress has moved towards passing a $40 billion bill for recovery efforts and to combat terrorism in the country, and that is just a down payment, just a beginning. Search and rescue crews uh, continue their search for survivors. Grieving relatives are pleading for information about their loved ones, and CNN's Maria Hinojosa has their story now. Just seven weeks ago, Anne McGovern posed with her new grandson minutes after he was born. I've never seen her look so happy as when he was born, she was there, um, she was so excited. But now her daughter Terry wants that smiling picture on television. Her mother worked on one of the top floors of the World Trade Center. Her daughter wonders if anyone has seen her alive. We were interviewed by police detectives and uh, they, we had filled out a questionnaire and it was really like, um, what jewelry would she have been wearing? Do you know what she had on? Did she have any b identifying body marks? Her sister Liz worked in the World Financial Center across the street, but managed to escape. She was supposed to meet her mother that day for lunch. I was just about to call her, and I just, I, I just, I can't believe it. I don't think it's, it's, it's set in yet. I just, I, I, I just feel so like powerless, and I wish I could have done something. That same awful feeling consumed an emergency center on Lexington Avenue, where authorities are compiling a list of the missing. It's become a place of public grieving and a place to hope for miracles. He was on uh, 104th floor, Canfitch. We've gone to hospitals. We've called every hotline. I don't know where he. We can't find him. He's not on any list. So hope is the word, the emotion that keeps these people going. But that hope hits hard against the reality that thousands of body bags have already arrived into New York City. The triage centers remain relatively quiet. The one at the At a center for Mexican immigrants, 15 friends are confirmed dead so far. Radios are kept on in hopes there'll be word of hundreds of others, immigrants from Mexico who labored in the Twin Towers, hoping to make a better life. In my heart. In my heart, I, I feel that uh, I'm crying. But there is not much concrete news for these people today, just fears for the worst. My mother was so excited that my son was born. She was there at the birth seven weeks ago, and he's not going to know her. And so there's resignation. Maria Hinojosa, CNN, New York. When we began this program an hour or so ago, we began with a report from correspondent Gary Tuckman down, on, uh, down at Ground Zero, and he had... Uh, some extraordinary pictures of the uh, of the of, of Ground Zero. Really, the, some of the most dramatic pictures of the area we've seen. Gary is now uh, back with us and has the engineer who shot those pictures, which will allow us to find out more about what the engineer saw and allow you to see those pictures again. Gary. Well, that's right. The engineer's name is Rob Matthews. He's actually an urban planner. That's his day job. But for the first couple of days of this rescue and recovery operation, he went out to help volunteer. And he had a camera with him. And today he took his camera and he took pictures that offer a perspective that you haven't seen before tonight. Rob, what we're going to do is we're going to start rolling the pictures right now. We're going to give you a look at the pictures. You can tell us about what you shot. But you were actually in a building next to the World Trade Center, which is called the World Financial Center Complex. And tell us what we're looking at right now. 
Inside now we're looking at the 22nd floor on the uh, east facade of uh, number two World Financial Center. Now this is right and across the street from the World Trade Center. This was a building that the plane did not crash into, but this is the damage you see. Exactly. This was the, uh, the shock wave that burst through the windows, blew the debris inside, and uh, this is a view down on directly into the hole, directly into ground zero from the 22nd floor of the World Financial Center. Now we've had some pictures from the ground, but the news media is not given the access that a guy like you who volunteered has gotten. And that's why it's the first time we've seen that shot from the top. And it really shows you just how huge that, that hole is. But I'm very surprised uh, at all the damage inside this building across the street from the World Trade Center. Well, the whole eastern facade of this building was blown off the glass at least uh, and from the shockwave. And uh, there's a piece of uh, World Financial Center number one, the American Express building, as tower number one toppled over, it took out a little piece of the southeast And corner. that's the only thing we want to say, that American Express building is one of the buildings they're fearful could possibly come down. Thank you very Perhaps. much for joining us, Rob. We appreciate it. You're welcome. The search continues tonight, but they expect rain to come down, and that could be a major problem as they continue to look for victims. Back to you, Eric. Gary, thank you. Uh, no matter how many times we see those pictures, they remain extraordinary. We want to try something here. We'll see if this works. Uh, so many events, virtually all events, uh, public gatherings, large group gatherings have been canceled since Tuesday. Uh, football games uh, won't go on. In Los Angeles, Hollywood Bowl tonight, the uh, Wynton Marsalis concert is going on. And if our timing is right, we will listen in at just the right moment. with us for a moment. We're going to get there. Again, this is a Wynton Marsalis concert at the Hollywood Bowl outside in Los Angeles. We don't know how many people. We use something we used to know. We don't know how many people are at the Hollywood Bowl tonight. We imagine that it was quite an emotional gathering when people arrived there. People have been glued to their TVs, haven't gotten out much. moment and a moment for the people who are there a portion of the proceeds of the concert tonight will go to the, the American Red Cross that was nice wasn't it I want to tell you how appropriate it was for us to play that anthem wouldn't argue with that one bit back to the uh, other side of all of this there have been so many lives lost there are an estimated oh, I think 4700 some still missing here in New York uh, so many stories CNN's Peter Viles has the story of one New York company's devastating loss it is the saddest vigil you can imagine Scott Hazelcorn's parents it's not even revenge I mean I don't I just want to hear my son's voice 
the members of Jun Ku Kang's church. We all pray every night. John Perconti's wife expecting their child in December. He, he called me at 10 to 9 and said, our building has just been hit by a plane, turn on the news. And I changed the channel and I saw what happened and I said, oh God, John, please get out of there safely. And he said, I love you, I have to go. What links these stories is that all the missing worked at Cantor Fitzgerald, all above the hundredth floor of the North Tower, the first one hit. Cantor is not a glamorous firm, but it is crucial, one of the world's largest bond trading firms. A thousand people worked up there, fewer than 300 are accounted for, but it is not clear any of those now safe were on the top floors Tuesday morning. I don't think anybody got out at this point, but uh, we pray for miracles. Scott Hazelcorn's parents he, uh, suspect that their son did not run for his life. He didn't care about himself. He only cared about <laughs> said his if, friends. If, if Scott was there and he was getting out, he'd probably help everybody he out in front of him. That's the kind of kid he was. They gather at a city-designated center for relatives of the missing on 26th Street, where trees have become pleas for help. And further uptown at the Pierre Hotel, a gathering site for Cantor Fitzgerald families. I don't think the company has the information that we need. I think they're sharing everything they know, but we have not heard of, of one survivor. We've not been able to validate any, any stories that we've heard. There are official clearinghouses for information on the missing, and Cantor Fitzgerald is using them, but these friends and family members are convinced that any extra effort they can make on behalf of their loved ones is worth making. Peter Vile, CNN Financial News, New York. The risk of giving you emotional whiplash here. There, there are also gestures going on also in all parts of the country that will melt your heart. In this case, a show of sympathy from some who clearly are too young to even know what the word means. CNN's Kathy Slobogan with that. Last night they said um, they ain't gonna move the buildings because they scared that uh, they gonna break some body bones. Miss Connolly's fifth grade class is trying to make sense of a national tragedy. A police officer had to get his leg amputated to get from under the work rubble. Like many schools across the country, Brown Street Academy in Milwaukee is letting its children ask questions and addressing their fears. 800 people did not die at the Pentagon. Not even close. But while the teachers encouraged their children to talk, these fifth graders had something else in mind, something bigger. I had two fifth graders to come to my office and they knocked on my door and said, you Mrs. Robinson, we would like to come in and talk with you. Well, at the time I was holding a meeting, so I said, sure, come in. And they looked over at me and they said, Mrs. Robinson, you know, we're hearing about this, but we're sitting here, we're doing nothing. What are we going to do? There is something that we can do. Principal right. Linda Robinson was surprised by what she heard. Looks good. I like that. Let's work together. Ninety percent of the children here come from low-income families. But these children felt there were people who needed money more than they did. People who needed their help. This old man came home. They said to me, Mrs. Robinson, every person uh, at least has pennies. We can at least give pennies. And we want to make it uh, a drive where we can at least donate something to them. Led by the fifth graders, the children of Brown Street Academy are holding a penny and clothing drive to help the victims of the plane crashes. They also came up with the idea of asking the Salvation Army to help them distribute what they collect. Linda Robinson says the drive has galvanized the school. Students were coming off the bus. Ms. Robinson, I have my pennies. Do you have yours? They were so energetic. I saw students getting off and they had their hands up and they were saying, we make a difference. The children's idea has turned grief into pride. It's changed conversations on the playground. Uh, even in the hallways, conversations have changed. Uh, students are now talking about what's happening in the news. They are reacting positively. Uh, to this tragedy. Brown Street Academy, one small ray of light in a dark time. Kathy Slobogan, CNN. Sweet. We saw firsthand late last night uh, how people are reacting to the people here in New York who are trying to find the victims of the tragedy. Uh, some firefighters walked into a restaurant we were in and people um, 
well, let me put it this way. I guarantee you that they bought no drinks for themselves. People were very generous. They cheered them. It's the kind of thing that's happening all over this city is people uh, see better than ever th uh, than they ever have before, I guess. Uh, those people who risk their lives to keep the city safe. Here's CNN's Richard Blystone. These are the guys who run up the fire escape when everybody else is running down. The men who will get you out of an inferno 50 stories in the air or die trying. 30 men from this midtown Manhattan firehouse may have died trying. They were among the first to reach the trade towers Tuesday and they haven't come back. So as you can see, the neighborhoods had an outpouring of love for us. Night and day they come to leave a flower, light a candle. I felt I did something, yes. I felt like I did something. Hard-boiled New Yorkers. When I was sitting out on somebody's car over there in, in disbelief, I had my head in my hands, and I felt somebody just kind of give a little squeeze on my arm. I look up, and it was just somebody walking past. Total strangers, like this woman from Argentina, who says she had to come and touch the fireman. They're heroes, she says. They gave their lives, poor things, to save other people. These students from Montreal were here on a night on the town early Tuesday. We happened to walk by, they're smiling. We said, hey, how's it going? Nice to meet you. We got on the truck, we, had, we took pictures, everybody was happy. And now we hear that, that some of the people who we met might be missing. They were the first ones to go. It's just devastating. It's like, I can't believe we were here like six hours before this with those, with those people. You don't think much about firemen until you need them. But people are making up for that today, not waiting for a memorial to be built. They've created one outside the firehouse. More vibrant, and more moving than anything a sculptor could carve out of stone. Their courage and fearlessness just sets an example for the world. Very powerful. And I'm honored. I'm honored to know they're just down the street from me. If your friends are missing, it's a hard wait. A small distraction in the words of support, the presence of food and flowers, and this present from Parsippany, New Jersey, to replace one of the station's five lost trucks. Whatever you need it for, you got it. You guys just bought a new one. This is up for sale. If you guys want it, you're more than welcome to it. We're still in business. The guys are going out. Have to do protect the people in the city. And so those lucky enough to have done more than wait go home for a rest. Because it's not over. And it would be nice to think that in times to come when the memories come flooding back, they will remember these as well. Richard Blystone, CNN, New York. Well, I, Frank Donahue of the Red Cross is with us. I don't think he's surprised by the generosity that he's seen in, the, in your own way in the generosity business, I think. Just uh, quickly, just show... Uh, I'm showing Aaron's is, sandwich. It's it's a, a, tell the story here. First please. graders from Long Island uh, made hundreds of these for the people at the armory today, for the workers. They had little notes on it and a Hershey kiss. I have to admit I ate the Hershey kiss on the way over, but it's a sign, I think, of what so many people and the generosity people restaurants uh, everywhere every shelter every facility that and we made, have going they made thousands of them and being first graders what kind of sandwich is it peanut butter and jelly yeah pbb pb and j um let's talk about what people are going through um you didn't have to be in the ground zero area to be horribly affected by what happened there. You didn't need to lose a loved one. You just had to see the pictures. Absolutely. Uh, the pictures are staggering. When I came over Tuesday over the Holland Tunnel, came into Holland Tunnel and saw New York, I'm reminded of two years ago when I was in Izmit, Turkey, and 20,000 people lost their life in that earthquake. The black cloud that hung over Turkey was the same cloud that was hanging over New York, and it's still there, the smoke. And everywhere I've turned, the, the emotion of people, the signs on trees and on... Uh, uh, telephone poles of loved ones missing. It's, it's everywhere, this whole city. Uh, one of the things that uh, occurred to me um, this afternoon, I was talking to someone who had survived it, and I'd been in Oklahoma City a year after uh, the bombing there, and people who survived these things, people, in this case, people got out of the World Trade Center before they collapsed, uh, go through a kind of post-traumatic stress where they, in fact, feel guilty for having lived. Right. We have about 500 volunteer mental health workers, many of them at the armory, 
um, in a variety of locations in the city that are helping people deal just with that, the guilt that I got out and my best friend didn't. Um, and, and also, of course, the pain of family members that are looking to find people and are hearing nothing. There's not much to tell yeah. people at this point. And, and just to, to stay with the survivors for a second, these things manifest itself in horrible ways, in divorce, in depression. In Oklahoma City, at least, there were a number of suicides and suicide attempts. So it's hugely important for these people to get the kind of counseling and more because you do, you guys do triage counseling, really, right? Right, yeah. correct. Yeah. I mean, yeah. get them early before something. And then we try to push them into going to something more long-term, dealing with their clergymen or whoever, so that people don't uh, continue to deal with this. As I was talking to some mental health people today, we have a city that's stunned. Many of the people that you saw around the armory, around the whole city block and lines, are stunned. But um, after that stage comes a stage of anger. Yeah, and that will be and another I, stage. I'm glad Mayor Pataki has asked all of us to be patient, because I think that's something we all need to be keep in the, mind. I, I, Mayor. Uh, on that, that subject of anger, I gotta tell you that I thought today that at least where I, the places I was, the city started to shift from shock to anger. I heard more people say angry things. We ought to get these guys. We ought to do this. But I mean, I think people are, have had it. They've had it with the, the threats. They've had it with the disaster. They have had it. And I think it's it's such an important opportunity for all of us to to send a different message to young people and to kids like this, that it's an opportunity for us as a country to come together. Uh, to, I, one of the things I've been saying a number of people is, why a, a city like New York or in the East Coast do we ever have a blood shortage? The gift of life, why is that? That's, that should be rare in this country. This is the most populated part of the nation, and it's the one with the greatest blood shortage in the nation. This should be a testimony of these people that lost their life, that will never let a blood shortage ever happen in this country again. That we will always try, at least, to, to give and to go the extra mile. And I think, um, hopefully, out of this tragedy, some good can come, and I hope that that's the kind of thing we can learn. This is uh, a couple of other areas here, quickly. Um, that whole question of how we talk about this to our kids is, I suspect, troubling to every one of us who has a child, in my case, a 12-year-old, who, uh, who's, who yet again sees a shattering moment in, in her life and tries to make sense of it. And how do you do that? Mm -hmm. The Red Cross, we have a lot of disaster preparation programs. We're actually in schools every day teaching little kids how to deal with disasters. And you'd be surprised sometimes little children are a lot easier, a lot more able to deal with it because of the training and the things that we're already teaching them how to deal with. We have a number of programs now for children. Um, we have coloring books and materials available. People should contact their local Red Cross because you don't have to be in New York to talk to your child about what they saw or seeing every day on the television. It's an opportunity to sit down with your children, tell them some of these things, and there's tools available to you to do that. I mean, it's a terribly difficult and complicated thing, and I, I don't want to wax on here, but you know, these kids have seen the horror of Columbine on television, and they've seen now this on television, and they see these things repeated over and over again, and they, they begin to think that they live in a truly evil world. It's, um, it's certainly expanding. The evil that we've seen in many faraway places has expanded. I was so touched yesterday, my cell phone rang. Two kids that I know, I do a lot of work in Bosnia with the Red Cross. Two kids from Bosnia called me to see if I was all right. I thought it's um, There's an, amazing, a reversal, isn't it? an amazing thing that two college students were calling here to see if friends in America were okay. How long do you think that you'll have this sort of major operation in play? Months. This, this, month. uh, months, months, months. This operation is um, just, just beginning. And all the folks that even live in the whole Wall Street area, Battery Park area, finding housing for those folks, all of these things. We'll be at this for a long time. And uh, when we, uh, on Tuesday, we were talking about a critical shortage of blood. You mentioned there's almost an ongoing shortage of blood in an area like this. Some of that has to do with people's fears about giving blood, uh, which they needn't fear, by the way. Uh, do you still need it? Uh, blood is always needed. Um, as fewer survivors are pulled from the, the building, um, you know, the blood need that was thought immediately isn't as great. But the Red Cross has blood on standby, ready to go. We continue to want people to always give the gift of life, and they should dial that 1-800-GIVE-LIFE and be ready when we do need it, that you're, on, you're ready to do it. But, tell me if I heard this right, okay, what I think you just said is that maybe in terms of dealing with this moment, this crisis, the blood issue, the blood shortage issue isn't what we thought it might be on Tuesday. I'm not suggesting people don't go out and do something. Correct. Yeah. I think that people are saying, you know, as the blood lines are endless, and all over the country the phones are ringing off the hook, people want to give blood. Um, because 
there's so many people have not been pulled from the wreckage that need blood. The demand hasn't been great, as great as initially thought, as we see on the television with all the doctors being released from hospitals that weren't needed. Mm -hmm. That's the unfortunate news. Yeah. Um, and you think you'll be going for months. Does the, do the demands change uh, day to day or week to week? Do you start to deal with different sets of problems? Absolutely. I mean, we'll be looking at long-term recovery for people that have been displaced from the whole Wall Street neighborhood for sheltering operations, uh, emotional support for families, um, and you know all the complications that, that are involved in missing people. Missing people is something the Red Cross deals with in more torn countries and now in America, and it's um, it's quite a, a long process. We. Um we're not embarrassed at all or uncomfortable saying we appreciate your efforts, your good work. We know how, uh, how tired you must be, how hard all of the volunteers uh, must be for the work they've done. We appreciate it very I'm much. very proud of what they're doing. They're great people. Uh, well, you should be. Thanks for coming in tonight. That's probably Thank the last you. thing you need to do is come in and um, talk to us. Happy to be here. Thanks. Thank you. Mr. Donahue, Frank Donahue with American Red Cross. Um, Thank you. We, as a country, we, we are in the midst of finding what psychologists call a new normal. And one of the ways to do that, one of the signs of that at least, was that airports did open. It, it was kind of sporadic. But CNN correspondent James Satori did get on a flight tonight, uh, today. And here is his report of that first time in the sky. The fifth busiest airport in the U.S. didn't look so busy Thursday morning as the nation's airlines struggled to regain their wings. One reason, no more curbside check-in. Bags must go to the counter. So now the crowds are inside. That's where I was, trying to get on a flight to Salt Lake City, Utah. And it's about two hours before our plane takes off, and the line of passengers here is about as long as a football field. We're not even sure the plane's going to be taking off. I did see a crew uh, starting to go through the gate. That's encouraging. I'm not going to believe we're going until I'm on the flight and we take off the runway. The FAA now requires airlines to scrutinize passengers more carefully. Some changes are apparent. One new question, do you have any sharp objects like knives or scissors? They took my scissors away. At the uh, check-in? I, I guess my scissors were too uh, pointy at the top. In addition to ID checks, some bags apparently picked at random are hand-searched and only ticketed passengers allowed into the gate area. Less obvious changes, all aircraft must now be thoroughly checked for explosives before they're put into service for the day. The airlines are no longer permitted to carry cargo or mail within the continental U.S. except for the U.S. military. But with the tragedy in New York City still unfolding, no one seems to mind the delays and a little hassle. You keep remembering, so many people have it so much worse. I mean, this is nothing. You know, if you don't get out today, I don't get out today. At least I'm here and not there. So. Some say Americans haven't paid enough attention to airline security. We want things very convenient. We're, we're a convenience-oriented people, and, and you can't have secure convenience. Finally, after three hours to check in, we're off. Delta Flight 2027, a short 80-minute hop, which surprisingly is nearly empty, just 25 passengers. I wonder how many were left at the airport still in line. All in all, our short trip was uneventful, a little longer, a few more questions than normal, but for a while at least, nothing about U.S. air travel will be normal. James Hattori, CNN, Salt Lake City, Utah. Obviously, just one quick point to make on that. Uh, things move when they move today a little more quickly than they're going to move when you get thousands of people and air traffic gets back to its normal levels. That's when things are really going to get a little sticky and so, or a lot sticky. Uh, one airline official uh, uh, told us the other day that two hours is not an unreasonable time to give yourself to get to the airport and don't even think you can make the flight by running through the airport 15, 20 minutes beforehand. About half past the hour, 11.32 now, quick look at where we've been and where we are headed here on this special report tonight. CNN has learned at least eight people were arrested at New York's LaGuardia and John F. Kennedy airports amid concerns over a threat of yet another hijacking. Four of them had been challenged at one of the airports on Tuesday morning, came back to JFK tonight and were taken into custody. They are being held for carrying fake documents. At the Pentagon, new flames late tonight coming from the, the wreckage of the plane crash there on Tuesday as crews continued to search for 126 people still believed missing in the rubble at the Pentagon. 
that fire still burns. It had been quiet there. And in New York, hundreds of family and friends of those missing from the World Trade Center are lined up at the city armory in a scene that will break your heart. They are waiting to register their loved ones on a missings list, clinging to pictures, desperately hoping someone will have some information, some word on the whereabouts of their missing friend or husband or boyfriend, girlfriend, what have you. The armory staying open 24 hours a day. Quick update of where we've been. Search efforts have uncovered the flight data recorder now for the hijacked airliner that crashed in western Pennsylvania about 80 miles outside of Pittsburgh on Tuesday. CNN's David Mattingly is standing by Somerset County, Pennsylvania with more on that. David, what can you tell us? Aaron, this slow and meticulous crash investigation took a big step forward today with the discovery of the, the flight data recorder. According to the FBI, the device was discovered inside the impact crater. That's the large blackened pit that was created when Flight 93 crashed here Tuesday morning. The device now destined for Washington, D.C. for further examination. The flight data recorder is important because it will allow investigators to retrace the functions of the aircraft prior to the crash. Word of its discovery came after it was learned today that small charred pieces of wreckage are now turning up in towns here as far as eight miles away from the crash site. More indications of just how powerful the force behind this crash and explosion truly was. The recovery of the flight data recorder raises hopes here at the crash site of a quick recovery of the next important piece of evidence, the cockpit voice recorder. That device could tell us what was happening with the people on the aircraft, what was happening after those heart-wrenching phone calls, phone calls from passengers aware of what the terrorists were planning to do, saying that they were uh, planning to fight back, to challenge the four hijackers who had taken their airplane. A heroic scenario that could explain why the plane crashed here instead of continuing on to Washington, D.C. and to targets like the White House, the Capitol Building, or maybe even Air Force One. For now, the search continues and will begin anew in the morning, as well as the painful process of recovering and identifying the remains of the 45 people who were on board. Aaron. Um, any idea, well, I have a couple of things actually. Any idea when, uh, when we will hear what is on that flight data recorder? Uh, I, I know they, it, they have it. it. I suspect it's not going to be tomorrow. Uh, do you have any feel for that? The FBI is running this investigation here as a crime scene, and they are strictly by the book. They are not speculating about anything. So, no, no word on how long it might be before we get any kind of information back. The, the NTSB will be here tomorrow, and they might be able to answer those questions for us. And, and um, you know, one of, one of the great mysteries here is where that plane was, in fact, headed. Anything new on that? Have you picked up anything there on, on what the target might have been? And Absolutely no not. The, okay. The focus has been entirely on what's going on here, and uh, there has been a great deal of determination and resolve to stay concentrated on the task at hand. And it is Got a it. daunting task because it is a very large area and there are very, very small pieces of wreckage that they have to try and locate. David, thank you. I apologize there for blindsiding you. I didn't mean to do that. Thank no, you. It's just, it's just one of those days where there, I haven't had a chance to talk to everybody tonight and uh, sometimes those things happen. Um, we want to turn a corner here and take a look at how the United States uh, might respond to what has happened and perhaps how the United States should respond. Uh, Peter Bergen is a CNN terrorism analyst and he joins us. Also, uh, William Lures is with us as well to join in this conversation. Good evening to you. You have been patiently waiting in this hot room tonight. And Peter, I know you're there. Uh, and, and Mr. Lures, wait another minute for me. Let me start with Peter. Peter, if you had to bet here. What do you think the response, how massive the response are we going to see? Well, let me say that uh, I, I met with bin Laden in uh, 1997 in Afghanistan, and uh, if a military operation is being contemplated to take him out or snatch him in some way, that would be an operation that would encounter considerable resistance for the following reasons. Bin Laden, uh, when I met with him, was surrounded by a group of uh, at least a couple of dozen heavily armed men who were armed with RPGs and uh, 
Russian submachine guns are highly motivated, they're prepared to die. Uh, and that was just uh, in the course of just doing an interview. Uh, obviously, bin Laden is, would be, uh, must be very concerned about his secu security right now, and he has hundreds of followers uh, uh, who might be uh, surrounding him. Um, also, any American military operation in Afghanistan would be conducted in some of the most inhospitable uh, terrain in the world. Uh, it's a rocky, mountainous desert uh, region. Uh, it's an area with which bin Laden is very familiar and with which uh, Americans aren't very familiar. The last time America had a presence in Afghanistan was in 1989. Since then, the embassy there is being closed. So the information the United States has about the country is uh, secondhand and old. Aaron. And, and so that kind of surgical mission, go in there and get him, if that's what we're talking about, would be very difficult to do. And in fact, the United States hadn't had a whole lot of success with that sort of operation. Well, let's think about Somalia, where uh, 18 American servicemen died in a very intense two-day firefight. We were trying to snatch or kill uh, Mohammed ID, the, uh, the clan leader there, if you remember, in 1993. That was an unmitigated disaster. This would be much tougher, I think, because, uh, A, there's no element of surprise. Bin Laden knows uh, that we're coming after him. Uh, and, B, uh, it's, uh, it's a country with, in which, uh, in, in, in Somalia, there were 28,000 American soldiers who had been there for several months. and. Uh, uh, this is not going to be the situation in Afghanistan. We're going to go in. We're going to not know much about this. If we do go in, we're not going to know much about the terrain. And uh, we're going to be faced with people whose uh, main mission in life is to die. I mean, these people want to die. They think they're instantly going to paradise, and they're very prepared to die for their leader. Turn to Mr. Lourdes here. What's your fear? What's your worst fear in all this? My fear is that we will come off to the world as trigger-happy, rather than intelligent, resolved, and determined to get this done. When the first, when the, when the Second World War began, after Pearl Harbor, we first had to figure out how we're going to defend our country at home, mm -hmm. get our security in place. Then we had to build a capacity to do that, uh, to, to take on the Japanese and the Germans. And we didn't have the capacity for either one. And it took time. That war took four years. And I, I would argue that this is so serious and this is so long term that we need to develop the capacity, which is really anti-American, to deal with this type of challenge to our society. Um, the airplane thing is only one small element of dealing with the threat of terrorism in our society. And then secondly, we have to begin to develop the type of intelligence capacity um, that will enable us to deal with the broad issue. It's not just Osama bin Laden. Of, it's, of course. it's a huge problem. But, but Look, tell me if you think this yeah. is fair, that there are really two issues on the table tonight. There is the issue of who committed this atrocity. That's issue number one. And what are we going to do about that? And that plays to, it is connected to issue number two, which is the broader question of how do, how does our nation, how do all nations, all civilized, responsible right. nations, however you want to put it, how do they deal with this broader problem of terrorism? But why do we have, to, why do you think it's necessary to link them? Why not deal with one at a time? Let's... Because this network, is not just Osama bin Laden. It's a network that has penetrated our society, um, the Middle East, but Europe, and they're everywhere. And I don't believe for a minute that the thousands of people out there will be affected if we kill, if we're able to kill, and, and as you just heard, it's going to be very difficult to do that, Osama bin Laden. I mean, this isn't about revenge. This is about winning. And I think it's going to take a long time. It's not simply who did that? Many of the people who did it are now dead. They died in those aircraft. Uh, who planned it? It's probably much more difficult to find that out. Uh, and, and I'm merely suggesting that as angry as this city is and this country is, and as ready as we are to be awakened to the fact that there's a world out there that we've got to understand better and deal with better, and that there's a world in here that we have to protect better, um, that we've got to take our time at doing that. This isn't about um, a trigger-happy trigger America. This is about a determined, powerful, intelligent America. It's we have pretty to angry think, America. We have, to think about, we have to think better than this guy does and these people do, 
and we have to shoot better. And I think it's going to take us a while. And I, for one, am not anxious to drop bombs and uh, shoot at people. I think we should root out these problems wherever they are in our society, build up our forces, and develop our intelligence capacity so that over the next, I think it'll take a couple of years mm -hmm. to get this thing resolved. And we've got to be ready for that. This is a long struggle. Just, uh, Peter, uh, quickly before you get away, um, I wonder, it, just in 20 seconds or so, if you agree with that, that what we're looking at, if, we're, if the country, if the world is looking at eliminating terrorism, and I, I must admit, um, that sounds like a pretty tall task to me, if A, you think it's possible at all. Well, if we're talking about, let's say, just eliminating Osama bin Laden, obviously that would have some effect on his network, which is clearly the main terrorist threat the United States faces, because he has a certain charismatic presence and he's regarded as a leader. But the inherent problems wouldn't go away. There's a set of people who are opposed to United States policies in the Middle East, and those, uh, those people aren't going to magically change their views overnight if their leader is assassinated or magically dies of some mysterious illness. So um, I, th I would l agree largely this is a long-term thing. E eliminating him tomorrow would certainly solve some short-term problems, but it wouldn't be the end of the uh, whole story. Uh, Peter, thanks. Good to talk to you again. Mr. Lewis, nice to meet you. It's the UN Association, the chairman thereof. Appreciate your coming in and your patience Thank today. You. Thank it's you. a very provocative way to look at this. Uh, it's probably healthy to get it on the table as well. Um, it is particularly healthy, I think, given how many times in the last couple of days we have heard the word war thrown around. We are at war. This is a new war. This is the first war of the 21st century. This is World War III. We have heard all of that. But what is war? Here's CNN National Correspondent Bruce Morton. World War II brought Americans together. Most believed that Nazi Germany and Imperial Japan were evil and aggressive. Americans demanded victory. The phrase of the day was unconditional surrender. Korea and Vietnam, in contrast, divided the country. Vietnam, in particular, left Americans suspicious, leery of wars, and in the conflict since, the motto seems to have been, bomb all you want, but we can't stand American casualties. That seems different now. No yellow ribbons, bring the hostages home, please. Flags this time, half-staff, but proud. People are lining up to give blood. The Red Cross 800 number logged 700,000 calls in the first six hours after an appeal went out. Some military recruitment officers see an increased interest. And the country seems prepared to send its young people into harm's way. I think the United States is in a long twilight struggle against the, these forces of evil that have t chosen to destroy us because we are good. And I believe that it may take a lot of time, a lot of American treasure, and perhaps some American blood. Make no mistake about it, my resolve is steady and strong about uh, winning this uh, war that has been declared on America. A goal of victory, not compromise. And later, Wars change countries. World War II made the United States a world power committed to an international role isolationism left behind. Vietnam left the United States more cynical. Americans had learned their government could lie to them. This time, unity so far, agreement on a goal so far. Will that change if the struggle is long? We can't know. The fight is just beginning. Bruce Morton, CNN, Washington. Former General Wesley Clark knows a thing or two about war, and uh, you more than likely know a thing or two about him. You've seen him a lot, former NATO commander. He joins us from Atlanta tonight to talk a little more about all of this. General Clark, good evening. Try to Try it again. One more time, and then we'll figure out where we are. General Clark, are you able to hear me? Okay, we'll, we'll try and put the plugs together and uh, figure that out and get back to uh, General Clark if we can. Jonathan Aiken uh, now has more on the comfort Americans are finding in their own flag. They're sprouting like flowers, flying from houses, waving from cars, hung over highways, draped over walls. Anywhere you could put a flag, you're likely to find one. How can you not? How can you not? Just to so show support for our country, for the people, for the families that have lost people. And it's only by the grace of God we're not one of them. You may be seeing a lot more. Congress wants flags flying coast to coast for the next 30 days. 
it's right here. <laughs> People are wasting little time. At this flag shop in suburban Washington, business has been so brisk they can't take the money fast enough. Can't keep the waiting in line short enough. Probably about a half an hour, but it's well worth the wait. Which beats finding no flags at all. This Virginia Walmart is sold out and waiting for more. We're hoping they have had to step up production of American flags. No flag shortage in Los Angeles. You'll find one in every daily news. The strikes and stars. Children across the country have been busy too, marching in Minnesota or just drawing flags in San Francisco. Grown ups are busy wearing flags on their heads, their chest, and figuratively, at least, on their sleeves. I feel very helpless because we're all the way in California and all these poor people in New York and Washington are hurting. And so I thought this would be a way to show that I'm a true American, I believe in the flag, I believe in freedom. The Pledge of Allegiance is making a big comeback, too. I said the Pledge of Allegiance for the first time in a long time. You know, because I've kind of had the belief sometimes that there's not liberty and justice for all. And I said it today, and I was proud to do it. Some people may think it's corny to fly the flag all the time. After all, there's Flag Day and Memorial Day and the 4th of July, and isn't that enough? Well, not today. Not anytime soon. Jonathan Aiken for CNN, Washington. Well, we've seen a lot of flags in uh, New York today, and, or maybe it is that we notice them more. Um, let's roll the dice one more time. General Wesley Clark is in Atlanta now. There you are. General Clark all joins right. us. Uh, it's nice to talk to you again, sir. Um, help me with a couple of things. Uh, we were talking about how the United States might respond to this, and this always comes down, it, uh, well, there I guess it comes down two ways, intelligence one, but military another. Is the military really set up to deal with this kind of enemy, or is the military designed to deal with countries, in a, in a sense? Well, we've got a lot of different capabilities in the military. <clears throat> Certainly we can deal with, with an enemy that's like this. But it won't be the kind of military operation that Americans envision. It won't be another, in all probability, it won't be another Gulf War. You're not going to see a massive deployment of troops. You're not going to have a big buildup that way. You're going to see a lot of diplomatic meetings. There'll be a lot of things going on underneath the surface. Occasionally people will be arrested. And uh, if the work is done right, you may never see it until it's over and those who are responsible, that international terrorist network is taken down and uh, either uh, brought in for justice or uh, eliminated in some other way. So you, you don't necessarily see the response. I, I suspect a lot of us have uh, seen the response as some sort of somebody's going to get bombed, okay? I mean, that's the first thing we're going to see. And what I hear you saying is maybe that not only isn't what's going to happen, but maybe that isn't what ought to happen. You, you can't tell right now, Aaron. It's too early because if there are appropriate targets and the cruise missiles or the bombing is the right weapons, then, then that's what we'll use. But uh, it's only partly a matter of training facilities and headquarters. It's really a matter of people. And before we attack facilities, we've got to make sure that that's really productive. Uh, it may not be productive in this case, uh, but it may. If it disrupts terrorist organizations, if it puts them on the run, if it makes it more difficult for them to plan a, another action against us, then, then that's what we should do. But the main work here is not against places. It's not against fixed facilities. It's against the network, the people, the leaders, supporters, those who are out in countries all around the world who are <clears throat> couriers and providing funds and information and casing out uh, operations and planning things and reporting back in. There are cells and various uh, headquarters probably in dozens of countries and they all need to be taken down and it mostly won't be done by bombing. In dozens of countries? That, that would be my, that would be my uh, appreciation of this, yes. It's a very broadly based network. And you may remember, if you go back over the incidents in the last decade, <clears throat> there were uh, incidents that in the Philippines where um, people were apprehended before they could board an airliner. Probably there was support in the Philippines. Um, there have been uh, incidents elsewhere, and there are um, quiet support cells in countries where there have probably never been incidents. Um, this is a, a very carefully prepared network. And One of the it's going to be tough I, I to take it down. 
I, I, we may have talked about this the other afternoon, but one of the problems here, it seems to me, is, is there's kind of a pernicious cycle here that you go in and you, you respond to these things and then, and in doing so, you, you are successful to whatever degree you are successful. But one of the things that seems to inevitably happen is uh, people get angry for the response. People, the sympathizers, and they end up getting, they become martyrs, they get more sympathizers, they're more training camps, more terrorists, and more trouble. Well, that's why operating inside an international coalition is so important. Now, yesterday and today, all kinds of leaders from around the world, including uh, Mr. Arafat and, and many Arab leaders, have expressed their full support. They want to join this coalition. Good. The place to start is their work at home. In their own countries, there are those who probably applauded this. There are some who sympathized with it, even though they didn't express it. There may